Chapter Fourteen of The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Angelique G. Campbell. The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale, by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter Fourteen. The wanderer looked from Unorna to Kafka with profound surprise. He had never seen the man and had no means of knowing who he was, still less of guessing what had brought him to the lonely place, or why he had broken into a laugh of which the harsh, wild tones still echoed through the wide cemetery. Totally unconscious of all that had happened to himself during the preceding quarter of an hour, the wanderer was deprived of the key to the situation. He only understood that the stranger was, for some reason or other, deeply incensed against Unorna, and he realized that the intruder had, on the moment of appearance, no control over himself. Israel Kafka remained where he stood, between the two tall stones, one hand resting on each, his body inclined a little forward, his dark, sunken eyes, bloodshot and full of a turbid, angry brightness, bent intently upon Unorna's face. He looked as though he were about to move suddenly forwards, but it was impossible to foresee that he might not as suddenly retreat as a lean and hungry tiger crouches for a moment in uncertainty whether to fight or fly, when after tracking down his man he finds him not alone and defenseless as he had anticipated, but well armed and in company. The wanderer's indolence was only mental and was moreover transitory and artificial. When he saw Unorna advance, he quickly placed himself between her and Israel Kafka and looked from one to the other. Who is this man? What does he want of you? Unorna made as though to pass him, but he laid his hand upon her arm with a gesture that betrayed his anxiety for her safety. At his touch, her face changed for a moment and a faint blush dyed her cheek. "'You may well ask who I am,' said the Moravian, speaking in a voice half-choked with passion and anger. "'She will tell you she does not know me. She will deny my existence to my face. But she knows me very well. I am Israel Kafka.' The wanderer looked at him more curiously. He remembered what he had heard but a few hours earlier from Keyork concerning the young fellow's madness. The situation now partially explained itself. I understand, he said, looking at Unorna. He seems to be dangerous. What shall I do with him? He asked the question as calmly as though it had referred to the disposal of an inanimate object instead of to the taking under custody of a madman. Do with me! cried Kafka, advancing suddenly a step forwards from between the slabs. Do with me. Do you speak of me as though I were a dog, a dumb animal, but I will. He choked and coughed and could not finish the sentence. There was a hectic flush in his cheek and his thin, graceful frame shook violently from head to foot. Unable to speak for a moment, he waved his hand in a menacing gesture. The wanderer shook his head rather sadly. He seems very ill, he said, in a tone of compassion. But Unorna was pitiless. She knew what her companion could not know, namely that Kafka must have followed them through the streets to the cemetery, and must have overheard Unorna's passionate appeal, and must have seen and understood the means she was using to win the wanderer's love. Her anger was terrible. She had suffered enough secret shame already in stooping to the use of her arts in such a course. It had cost her one of the greatest struggles of her life, and her disappointment at the result had been proportionately bitter. In that alone she had endured almost as much pain as she could bear. But to find suddenly that her humiliation, her hot speech, her failure, the look which she knew had been on her face until the moment when the wanderer awoke, that all this had been seen and heard by Israel Kafka was intolerable. Even Keyork's unexpected appearance could not have so fired her wrath. Keyork might laugh at her afterwards, but her failure would have been no triumph to him. Was not Keyork enlisted on her side, ready to help her at all times, by word or deed, 
in accordance with the terms of their agreement. But of all men, Kafka, whom she had so wronged, was the one man who should have been ignorant of her defeat and miserable shame. Go! she cried with a gesture of command. Her eyes flashed and her extended hand trembled. There was such concentrated fury in a single word that the wanderer started in surprise, ignorant as he was of the true state of things. You are uselessly unkind, he said gravely. The poor man is mad. Let me take him away. Leave him to me, she answered imperiously. He will obey me. But Israel Kafka did not turn. He rested one hand upon the slab and faced her. As when many different forces act together at one point, producing after the first shock a resultant little expected, so the many passions that were at work in his face finally twisted his lips into a smile. Yes, he said in a low tone which did not express submission. Leave me to her. Leave me to the witch and to her mercy. It will be the end of this time. She is drunk with her love of you and mad with her hatred of me. Unorna grew suddenly pale and would have again sprung forward, but the wanderer stopped her and held her arm. At the same time he looked into Kafka's eyes and raised one hand as though in warning. Be silent, he exclaimed. And if I speak, what then? asked the Moravian with his evil smile. I will silence you, answered the wanderer coldly. Your madness excuses you, perhaps, but it does not justify me in allowing you to insult a woman. Kafka's anger took a new direction. Even madmen are often calmed by the quiet opposition of a strong and self-possessed man. And Kafka was not mad. He was no coward, either, but the subtlety of his race was in him. As oil dropped by the board in a wild tempest does not calm the waves, but momentarily prevents their angry crest from breaking, so the Israelite's quick tact veiled the rough face of his dangerous humor. I insult no one, he said almost differentially, least of all her whom I have worshipped long and lost at last. You accuse me unjustly of that, and though my speech may have been somewhat rude, yet may I be forgiven for the sake of what I have suffered, for I have suffered much. Seeing that he was taking a more courteous tone, the wanderer folded his arms and left Unorna free to move, awaiting her commands or the further development of events. He saw in her face that her anger was not subsiding, and he wondered less at it after hearing Kafka's insulting speech. It was a pity, he thought, that anyone should take so seriously a maniac's words, but he was nevertheless resolved that they should not be repeated. After all, it would be an easy matter, if the man again overstepped the bounds of gentle speech, to take him bodily away from Unorna's presence. Are you going to charm our ears with a story of your sufferings? Unorna asked, in a tone so cruel that the wanderer expected a quick outburst of anger from Kafka in reply. But he was disappointed in this. The smile still lingered on the Moravian's face when he answered, and his expressive voice, no longer choking with passion, grew very soft and musical. It is not mine to charm, he said. It is not given to me to make slaves of all living things with hand and eye and word. Such power nature does not give to all. She has given none to me. I have no spell to win Anorna's love, and if I had, I cannot say that I would take a love thus earned. He paused a moment, and Unorna grew paler. She started, but then did not move again. His words had power to wound her, but she trembled, lest the wanderer should understand their hidden meaning, and she was silent, biding her time and curbing her passion. No, continued Kafka, I was not thus favored in my nativity. The star of love was not in the ascendant, the lord of magic charms was not trembling upon my horizon. The sun of earthly happiness was not enthroned in my mid-heaven. How could it be? She had it all, this Unorna here, and nature, generous in her one mad moment, 
lavished upon her all here was to give for she has all and we have nothing as i have learned and you will learn before you die he looked at the wanderer as he spoke his hollow eyes seemed calm enough and in this dejected attitude and subdued tone there was nothing that gave warning of a coming storm the wanderer listened half interested and yet half annoyed by his persistence unorna herself was silent still the nightingale was singing on that night continued kafka it was a dewy night in early spring and the air was very soft when unorna first breathed it the world was not asleep but dreaming when her eyes first opened to look upon it heaven had put on all its glories across its silent breast was bound the milk-white riband its crest was crowned with god's crown jewels great northern stars its mighty form was robed in the mantle of majesty set with the diamonds of suns and worlds great and small far and near not one tiny spark of all the myriad million gems was darkened by a breath of wind-blown mist the earth was very still all wrapped in peace and lulled in love the great trees pointed their dark spires upwards from the temple of the forest to the firmament of the greater temple on high in the starlight the year's first roses breathed out the perfume gathered from the departed sun and every dewdrop in the short sweet grass caught in its little self the reflection of heaven's vast glory only in the universal stillness the nightingale sang the song of songs and bound the angel of love with the chains of her linked melody and made him captive in bonds stronger than his own israel kafka spoke dreamily resting against the stone beside him seemingly little conscious of the words that fell in oriental imagery from his lips in other days unorna had heard him speak like this to her and she had loved the speech though not the man and sometimes for its sake she had wished her heart could find its fellow in his and even now the tone and the words had a momentary effect upon her what would have sounded as folly overwrought sentimental almost laughable perhaps to other women found an echo in her own childish memories and a sympathy in her belief in her own mysterious nature the wonder had heard men talk as israel kafka talked and other lands where speech is prized by men and women not for its tough strength but for its wealth of flowers and love was her first captive said the moravian and her first slave yes i will tell you the story of unorna's life she is angry with me now well let it be it is my fault or hers what matter she cannot quite forget me out of mind and i has lucifer forgotten god he sighed and a momentary light flashed in his eyes something in the blasphemous strength of the words attracted the wanderer's attention utterly indifferent himself he saw that there was something more than madness in the man before him he found himself wondering what encouragement unorna had given the seed of passion that it should have grown to such strength and he traced the madness back to the love instead of referring the love to the madness but he said nothing so she was born continued kafka dreaming on she was born amid the perfume of the roses under the starlight when the nightingale was singing and all things that lived loved her and submitted to her voice and hand and to her eyes and to her unspoken will as running water follows the course men give it winding and gliding falling and rushing full often of a roar of resistance that covers the deep quick moving stream flowing in spite of itself the channel that is dug for it to the determined end and nothing resisted her neither man nor woman nor child had any strength to oppose against her magic the wolf hounds licked her feet the wolves themselves crouched fawning in her path for she is without fear as she is without mercy is that strange 
what fear can there be for her who has the magic charm who holds sleep in the one hand and death in the other and between whose brows is set the knowledge of what shall be hereafter can any one harm her has any one the strength to harm her is there anything on earth which she covets and which shall not be hers though his voice was almost as soft as before the evil smile flickered again about his drawn lips as he looked into unorna's face he wondered why she did not face him and crush him and force him to sleep with her eyes as he knew she could do but he himself was past fear he had suffered too much, and cared not what chanced to him now. But she should know that he knew all, if he should tell her so with his latest breath. Despair had given him a strange control of his anger and of his words, and jealousy had taught him the art of wounding swiftly, surely, and with a light touch. Sooner or later she would turn upon him and annihilate him in a dream of unconsciousness. He knew that, and he knew that such faint power of resisting her as he had ever possessed was gone. But so long as she was willing to listen to him, so long would he torture her with the sting of her own shame. And when her patience ended, or her caprice changed, he would find some bitter word to cast at her in the moment before losing his consciousness of thought and his power to speak this one chance of wounding was given to him and he would use it to the utmost with all subtlety with all cruelty with all determination to torture whatsoever she covets is hers to take no one escapes the spell in the end no one resists the charm and yet it is written in the book of her fate that she shall one day taste the fruit of ashes and drink of the bitter water it is written that whoever slays with the sword shall die by the sword also. She has killed with love, and by love she shall perish. I loved her once. I know what I am saying. Again he paused, lingering thoughtfully upon the words. The wanderer glanced at Anorna as though asking her whether he should not put a sudden end to the strange monologue. She was pale and her eyes were bright, but she shook her head. Let him say what he will say, she answered, taking the question as though it had been spoken. Let him say all he will. Perhaps it is the last time. And so you give me your gracious leave to speak, said Israel Kafka. And you will let me say all that it is in my heart to say to you, before this other man, and then you will make an end of me. I see. I accept the offer. I can even thank you for your patience. You are kind today. I have known you harder. Well, then I will speak out. I will tell my story, not that anyone may judge between you and me. There is neither judge nor justice for those who love in vain. So I loved you. That is the whole story. Do you understand me, sir? I loved this woman, but she would not love me. That is all. And what of it? And what then? Look at her, and look at me. The beginning, and the end. In a manner familiar to Orientals, the unhappy man laid one finger upon his own breast, and with the other hand pointed at Unorna's fair young face. The wanderer's eyes obeyed at the guiding gesture, and he looked from one to the other, and again the belief crossed his thoughts that there was less of madness about Israel Kafka than Kajork would have had him think. Trying to read the truth from Unorna's eyes, he saw that they avoided his, and he fancied they detected symptoms of distress in her pallor and contracted lips. And yet, he argued, that if it were all true, she would silence the speaker, and that the only reason for her patience must be sought in her willingness to humor the diseased brain in its wanderings. In either case, he pitied Israel Kafka profoundly, and his compassion increased from one moment to another. I loved her. There is a history in those three words which neither the eloquent tongue nor the skilled pen can tell. See how coldly I speak. I command my speech. I may pick and choose among ten thousand words and phrases and describe love at my leisure. She grants me time. She is very merciful today. 
what would you have me say you know what love is think of such love as yours can have been and take that and three times over and a hundred thousand times and cram it burning flaming melting into your bursting heart then you would know a tenth of what i have known love indeed who can have known love but me i stand alone since the dull unlovely world first jarred and trembled and began to move there has not been another of my kind nor has man suffered as i have suffered and been crushed and torn and thrown aside to die without even the mercy of a death wound describe it tell it look at me i am both love's description and the epitaph on his gravestone in me he lived me he tortured with me he dies never to live again as he has lived this once there is no justice and no mercy think not that it is enough to love and that you will be loved in return do not think that do not dream that do you not know that the fiercest drought is as a spring rain to the rocks which thirst not and need no refreshment again he fixed his eyes on unorna's face and faintly smiled apparently she was displeased what is it that you would say she asked coldly what is this that you tell us of rocks and rain and death wounds and the rest you say you loved me once that was a madness you say that i never loved you that at least is truth is that your story it is indeed short enough and i marvel at the many words in which you have put so little she laughed in a hard tone but israel kafka's eyes grew dark and the somber fire beamed in them as he spoke again the weary tortured smile left his wan lips and his pale face grew stern laugh laugh unorna he cried you do not laugh alone and yet i love you still i love you so well in spite of all that i cannot laugh at you as i would even though i were to see you again clinging to the rock and imploring it to take pity on your thirst and he who dies for you unorna of him you ask nothing save that he will crawl away and die alone and not disturb your delicate life with such an unseemly sight you talk of death exclaimed unorna scornfully you talk of dying for me because you are ill to-day to mark your arabian will have cured you and then for all i know you will talk of killing me instead this is child's talk boy's talk if we are to listen to you you must be more eloquent you must give us such a tale of woe as shall draw tears from our eyes and sobs from our breast then we will applaud you and let you go that shall be your reward the wanderer glanced at her in surprise there was a bitterness in her tone of which he had not believed her soft voice capable why do you hate him so if he is mad he asked the reason is not far to seek said kafka this woman here god made her crooked-hearted love her and she will hate you as only she has learned how to hate show her that cold face of yours and she will love you so that she will make a carpet of her pride for you to walk on i or spit on either if you deign to be so kind she has a wonderful kind of heart for it freezes when you burn it and melts when you freeze it are you mad indeed asked the wanderer suddenly planting himself in front of kafka they told me so i can almost believe it no i am not mad yet answered the younger man facing him fearlessly you need not come between me and her she can protect herself you would know that if you knew what i saw her do with you first when i came here what did she do the wanderer turned quickly as he stood and looked at unorna do not listen to his ravings she said the word seemed weak and poorly chosen and there was a strange look in her face as though she were either afraid or desperate or both 
She loves you, said Israel Kafka calmly, and you do not know it. She has power over you, as she has over me, but the power to make you love her she has not. She will destroy you, and your estate shall be no better than mine today. We shall have moved on a step, for I shall be dead, and you will be the madman, and she will have found another to love and to torture. The world is full of them. Her altar will never lack sacrifices. The wanderer's face was grave. You may be mad or not, he said. I cannot tell, but you say monstrous things, and you shall not repeat them. Did she not say that I might speak? asked Kafka with a bitter laugh. I will keep my word, said Unorna. You seek your own destruction. Find it in your own way. It will not be the less sure. Speak. Say what you will. You shall not be interrupted. The wanderer drew back, not understanding what was passing, nor why Unorna was so long suffering. Say all you have to say, she repeated, coming forward so that she stood directly in front of Israel Kafka. And you, she added, speaking to the wanderer, leave him to me. He is quite right. I can protect myself, if I need any protection. You remember how we parted, Unona, said Kafka. It is a month today. I did not expect a greeting of you when I came back, or if I did expect it, it was foolish and unthinking. I should have known you better. I should have known that there is one half of your word which you never break, though cruel half, and the one thing which you cannot forgive, and which is my love for you. And yet that is the very thing which I cannot forget. I have come back to tell you so. You may as well know it. Unorna's expression grew cold, as she saw that he abandoned the strain of reproach and spoke once more of his love for her. Yes, I see what you mean, he said very quietly. You mean to show me by your face that you give me no hope. I should have known that by other things I have seen here. God knows I have seen enough. But I meant to find you alone. I went to your home, I saw you go out, I followed you, I entered here, I heard all, and I understood, for I know your power, as this man cannot know it. Do you wonder that I followed you? Do you despise me? Do you think I still care because you do? Love is stronger than the woman loved, and for her we do deeds of baseness, unblushingly, which she would forbid our doing and for which she despises us when she hates us, and loves us all the more dearly when she loves us at all. You hate me, then despise me too, if you will. It is too late to care. I followed you like a spy. I saw what I expected to see. I have suffered what I knew I should suffer. You know that I have been away during this whole month, and that I have traveled thousands of leagues in the hope of forgetting you. And yet, I fancied I had seen you within the month, Unorna said with a cruel smile. They say that ghosts haunt the places they have loved, answered Kafka, unmoved. If that be true, I may have troubled your dreams, and you may have seen me. I have come back broken in body and in heart, I think I have come back to die here. The life is going out of me. But before it is quite gone, I can say two things. I can tell you that I know you at last, and that, in spite of the horror of knowing what you are, I love you still. Am I so very horrible? she asked scornfully. You know what you are, better than I can tell you but not better than I know. I know even the secret meaning of your moods and caprices. I know why you are willing to listen to me this last time so patiently, with only now and then a sneer and a cutting laugh. Why? In order to make me suffer the more. You will never forgive me now, 
for you know that I know, and that alone is a sin past all forgiveness, and, over and above, that I am guilty of the crime of loving you when you have no love for me. And as a last resource, you come to me and recapitulate your misdeeds. The plan is certainly original, though it lacks wit. There is least wit where there is most love, Unorna. I take no account of the height of my folly when I see the depth of my love, which has swallowed up myself and all my life. In the last hour I have known its depth and breadth and strength, for I have seen what it can bear. And why should I complain of it? Have I not many times said that I would die for you willingly? And is it not dying for you to die of love for you? To prove my faith it were too easy a death. When I look into your face I know that there is in me the heart that made true Christian martyrs. Unorna laughed. Would you be a martyr? she asked. Not for your faith, but for the faith I once had in you, and for the love that no martyrdom could kill. I, to prove that love, I would die a hundred deaths, and to gain yours, I would die the death eternal. And you would have deserved it. Have you not deserved enough already, enough of martyrdom, for tracking me today? for following me stealthily like a thief and a spy to find out my ends and my doings. I love you, Anorna. And therefore you suspect me of unimaginable evil. And therefore you come out of your hiding place and accuse me of things I have neither done nor thought of doing, building up falsehood upon lie and lie upon falsehood in the attempt to ruin me in the eyes of one who has my friendship and who is my friend you are foolish to throw yourself upon my mercy israel kafka foolish yes and mad too and my madness is all you have left me take it it is yours you cannot kill my love deny my words deny your deeds let all be false in you. It is but one pain more, and my heart is not broken yet. It will bear another. Tell me that what I saw had no reality, that you did not make him sleep here on this spot before my eyes, that you did not pour your love into his sleeping ears, that you did not command, implore, entreat, and fail. What is it all to me whether you speak truth or not? tell me it is not true that i would die a thousand martyrdoms for your sake as you are and if you were a thousand times worse than you are you are right you are wrong your truth your falsehood you yourself are swallowed up in the love i bear you i love you always and i will say it and say it again your eyes i love them too take me into them unorna whether in hate or love but in love yes love unorna golden unorna with a cry on his lips the name he had given her in other days he made one mad step forwards throwing out his arms as though to clasp her to him but it was too late even while he had been speaking her mysterious influence had overpowered him as he had known that it would when she so pleased she caught his two hands in the air and pressed him back and held him against the tall slab. The whole pitilessness of her nature gleamed like a cold light in her white face. There was a martyr of your race once, she said in cruel tones. His name was Simon Abellus. You talk of martyrdom. You shall know what it means, though it be too good for you who spy upon the woman whom you say you love. The hectic flush of passion sank from Israel Kafka's cheek. Rigid, with outstretched arms and bent head, he stood against the ancient gravestone. Above him, as though raised to heaven in silent supplication, were the sculptured hands that marked the last resting place of a cone. You shall know now, said Unorna, you shall suffer indeed. End of 14. 
Recording by Angelique G. Campbell or BurgundyGrace at gmail.com July 2018 Chapter 15 of The Witch of Prague A Fantastic Tale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Angelique G. Campbell, July 2018. The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale by Francis Marion Crawford. The deeds here described were done in Prague on the 21st day of February in the year 1694. Lazarus and his accomplice, Levi Kurtzendahl, or Brevimanus, or the short-handed, were betrayed by their own people. Lazarus hanged himself in prison, and Levi suffered death by the wheel, repentant, it is said, and himself baptized. A full account of the trial, written in Latin, was printed, and a copy of it may be seen in the State Museum in Prague. The body of Simon Abellus was exhumed, and rest in the Tien Carace, in the chapel on the left of the high altar. The slight extension of certain scenes not fully described in the Latin volume will be pardoned in a work of fiction. Unorna's voice sank from the tone of anger to a lower pitch. She spoke quietly and very distinctly, as though to impress every word upon the ear of the man who was in her power. The wanderer listened, too, scarcely comprehending at first, but slowly yielding to the influence she exerted, until the vision rose before him also, with all its moving scenes, in all its truth, and in all its horror as in a dream the deeds that had been passed before him. The desolate burial ground was peopled with forms and faces of other days. The gravestones rose from the earth and piled themselves into gloomy houses and remote courts and dim streets and venerable churches. The dry and twisted trees shrank down and broadened and swung their branches as arms and drew up their roots out of the ground as feet under them and moved hither and thither. And the knots and the bosses and gnarls upon them became faces, dark, eagle-like, and keen. And the creaking and crackling of the boughs and twigs under the piercing blast that swept by became articulate like the voices of old men talking angrily together. There were sudden changes from day to night and from night to day. In dark chambers, crouching men took counsel of blood together under the feeble rays of the flickering lamp. In the uncertain twilight of winter, muffled figures lurked at the corners of streets, waiting for someone to pass who must not escape them. As the wanderer gazed and listened, Israel Kafka was transformed. He no longer stood with outstretched arms, his back against a crumbling slab, his filmy eyes fixed on Unorna's face. He grew younger. His features were those of a boy of scarcely thirteen years, pale, earnest, and brightened by a soft light which followed him hither and thither. And he was not alone. He moved with others through the old familiar streets of the city, clothed in a fashion of other times, speaking in accents comprehensible, but unlike the speech of today, acting in a dim and far-off light that had once been. The wanderer looked, and, as in dreams, he knew that what he saw was unreal. He knew that the changing walls and streets and houses and public places were built up of gravestones, which in truth were deeply planted in the ground, immovable and incapable of spontaneous motion. He knew that the crowds of men and women were not human beings, but gnarled and twisted trees rooted in the earth, and that the hum of voices which reached his ears was but the sound of dried branches bending in the wind. He knew that Israel Kafka was not the pale-faced boy who glided from place to place, followed everywhere by a soft radiance. He knew that Onorna was the source and origin of the vision, and that the mingling speeches of the actors now shrill and angry altercation, now hissing in low, fierce whisper, 
were really formed upon Unorna's lips and made audible through her tones as the chorus of indistinct speech proceeded from the swaying trees. It was to him but an illusion of which he understood the key and penetrated the secret, but it was marvelous in its way, and he was held enthralled from the first moment when it began to unfold itself. He understood further that Israel Kafka was in a state different from this, that he was suffering all the reality of another life, which to the wanderer was but a dream. For the moment all his faculties had a double perception of things and sounds, distinguishing clearly between the fact and the mirage that distorted and obscured it. For the moment he was aware that his reason was awake, though his eyes and his ears might be sleeping. Then the unequal contest between the senses and the intellect ceased and while still retaining the dim consciousness that the source of all he saw and heard lay in unorna's brain he allowed himself to be led quickly from one scene to another absorbed and taken out of himself by the horror of the deeds done before him at first indeed the vision though vivid seemed objectless and of uncertain meaning the dark depths of the Jews' quarters of the city were open, and it was towards evening. Throngs of gowned men, crooked, bearded, filthy, vulture-eyed, crowded upon each other in a narrow public place, talking in quick, shrill accents, gesticulating with hands and arms and heads and bodies, laughing, chuckling, chattering, hooked-nosed and loose-lipped, grasping fat purses and lean fingers, shaking greasy curls that straggled out under caps of greasy fur glancing to right and left with quick gleaming looks that pierced the gloom like fitful flashes of lightning plucking at each other by the sleeve and pointing long fingers and crooked nails two three and four at a time as markers in their ready reckoning a writhing mass of humanity intoxicated by the smell of gold mad for its possession half hysteric with the fear of losing it timid yet dangerous poisoned to the core by the sweet sting of money, terrible in intelligence, vile in heart, contemptible in body, irresistible in the unity of their greed. The Jews of Prague, two hundred years ago. In one corner of the dusky place there was a little light. A boy stood there beside a veiled woman, and the light that seemed to cling about him was not the reflection of gold. He was very young. His pale face had in it all the lost beauty of the Jewish race. His lips were clearly cut, even, pure in outline and firm. The forehead was broad with thought, the features noble, aquiline, not vulture-like. Such a face might holy Stephen, deacon and proto-martyr, have turned upon the young men who laid their garments at the feet of the unconverted Saul. He stood there, looking on at the scene in the marketplace, not wondering, for nothing of it was new to him, not scorning, for he felt no hate nor wrathful, for he dreamed of peace. He would have had it otherwise, that was all. He would have had the stream flow back upon its source and take a new channel for itself. He would have seen the strength of his people wielded in cleaner deeds for nobler aims. The gold he hated, the race for it he despised, the poison of it he loathed. But he had neither loathing nor contempt nor hatred for the men themselves. He looked upon them, and he loved to think that the carrion vulture might once again be purified and lifted on strong wings and become, as in old days, the eagle of the mountains. For many minutes he gazed in silence. Then he sighed and turned away. He held certain books in his hands, for he had come from the school of the synagogue where, throughout the short winter days, the rabbis taught him and his companions the mysteries of the sacred tongue. The woman by his side was a servant in his father's house, and it was her duty to attend him through the streets until the day when, being judged a man, he should be suddenly freed from the bondage of childish things. Let us go, he said in a low voice, 
The air is full of gold and heavy. I cannot breathe it. Whither? asked the woman. Thou knowest, he answered. And suddenly the faint radiance that was always about him grew brighter and spread out arms behind him to the right and left in the figure of a cross. They walked together side by side quickly and often glancing behind them as though to see whether they were followed. And yet it seemed as though it was not they who moved but the city about them which changed. The throng of busy Jews grew shadowy and disappeared. Their shrill voices were lost in the distance. There were other people in the street of other features and in different garbs, of prouder bearing and hot, restless manner, broad-shouldered, erect, manly, with spur on heel and sword at side. The outline of the old synagogue melted into the murky air and changed its shape and stood out again in other and ever-changing forms. Now they were passing before the walls of a noble palace, now beneath low, long galleries of arches, now again across the open space of the great ring in the midst of the city. Then, all at once, they were standing before the richly carved doorway of the Teen Carache, the very doorway out of which the wanderer had followed the fleeting shadow of Beatrice's figure but a month ago. And they paused and looked again to the right and left and searched the dark corners with piercing glances. Thy life is in thine hand, said the woman, speaking close to the boy's ear. It is yet time. Turn with me and let us go back. The mysterious radiance lit up the youth's beautiful face in the dark street and showed the fearless yet gentle smile that was on his lips. What is there to fear? he asked. Death, answered the woman in a trembling tone. They will kill thee, and it shall be upon my head. And what is death? he asked again, and the smile was still upon his face as he led the way up the steps. The woman bowed her head and drew her veil more closely about her and followed him. Then they were within a church, darker, more ghostly, less rich in those days than now. The boy stood beside the hewn stone basin wherein was the blessed water, and he touched the frozen surface with his fingers and held them out to his companion. Is it thus? he asked and the heavenly smile grew more radiant as he made the sign of the cross. Again the woman inclined her head. Be it not upon me, she exclaimed earnestly, though I would it might be for ever so with thee. It is for ever, the boy answered. He went forward and prostrated himself before the high altar, and the soft light hovered above him. The woman knelt at a little distance from him, with clasped hands and upturned eyes. The church was very dark and silent. An old man in a monk's robe came forward out of the shadow of the choir and stood behind the marble rails and looked down at the boy's prostrate figure, wonderingly. Then the low gateway was opened, and he descended the three steps and bent down to the young head. What wouldst thou? he asked. Simon Abelus rose until he knelt and looked up into the old man's face. I am a Jew. I would be a Christian. I would be baptized. Fearest thou not thy people? the monk asked. I fear not death, answered the boy simply. Come with me. Trembling, the woman followed them both and all were lost in the gloom of the church. They were not to be seen and all was still for a space. Suddenly, a clear voice broke the silence. Ego baptizo terra nomine e petrus e filae et spiritu sancti. Then the woman and boy were standing again without the entrance in the chilly air, and the ancient monk was upon the threshold under the carved arch. His thin hands, white in the darkness, were lifted high, and he blessed them and they went their way. In the moving vision, the radiance was brighter still and illuminated the streets as they moved on. Then a cloud descended over all, and certain days and weeks passed, 
and again the boy was walking swiftly toward the church. But the woman was not with him, and he believed that he was alone, though the messengers of evil were upon him. Two dark figures moved in the shadow, silent, noiseless in their walk, muffled in long garments. He went on, no longer deigning to look back, beyond fear as he had ever been, and beyond even the expectation of a danger. He went into the church, and the two men made gestures, and spoke in low tones, and hid themselves in the shade of the buttresses outside. The vision grew darker, and a terrible stillness was over everything, for the church was not opened to the sight at this time. There was a horror of long waiting with the certainty of what was to come. The narrow street was empty to the eye, and yet there was the knowledge of evil presence, of two strong men waiting in the dark to take their victim to the place of expiation, and the horror grew in the silence and the emptiness until it was unbearable. The door opened and the boy was with the monk under the black arch. The old man embraced him and blessed him and stood still for a moment, watching him as he went down. Then he, also, turned and went back, and the door was closed. Swiftly the two men glided from their hiding place and sped among the uneven pavement. The boy paused and faced them, for he felt that he was taken. They grasped him by the arms on each side, Lazarus his father, and Levi, surnamed the short-handed, the strongest and the cruelest and the most relentless of the younger rabbis. Their grip was rough, and the older man held a coarse woolen cloth in his hand with which to smother the boy's cries if he should call out for help. But he was very calm, and did not resist them. "'What wouldst thou?' he asked. "'And what dost thou in a Christian church?' asked Lazarus in low, fierce tones. "'What Christians do, since I am one of them,' answered the youth, unmoved. Lazarus said nothing, but he struck the boy on the mouth with his hard hand so that the blood ran down. "'Not here!' exclaimed Levi, anxiously looking about, and they hurried him away through dark and narrow lanes. He opposed no resistance to Levi's rough strength, not only suffering himself to be dragged along, but doing his best to keep pace with the man's long strides nor did he murmur at the blows and thrust dealt him from time to time by his father from the other side. During some minutes they were still traversing the Christian part of the city. A single loud cry for help would have brought a rescue. A few words to the rescuers would have roused a mob of fierce men, and the two Jews would have paid with their lives for the deeds they had not yet committed. But Simon Abelus uttered no cry and offered no resistance. He had said that he feared not death, and he had spoken the truth, not knowing what manner of death was to be his. Onward they sped, and in the vision the way they traversed seemed to sweep past them, so that they remained always in sight, though always hurrying on. The Christian quarter was passed, before them hung the chain of one of those gates which gave access to the city of the Jews. With a jeer and an oath the bearded sentry watched them pass, the martyr and his torturers. One word to him even then, and the butt of his heavy halberd would have broken Levi's arm and laid the boy's father in the dust. The word was not spoken on through the filthy ways, on and on through narrow courts and tortuous passages to a dark, low doorway. Then, again, the vision showed but an empty street, and there was a silence for a space, and a horror of long waiting in the falling night. Lights moved within the house, and then one window after another was bolted and barred from within. Still the silence endured until the ear was grown used to it, and could hear sounds very far off from deep down below the house itself, but the walls did not open and the scene did not change. A dull noise, bad to hear, resounded as from beneath a vault, and then another, and another, the sound of cruel blows upon a human body. 
then a pause wilt thou renounce it asked the voice of lazarus kyrie eleison christe eleison came the answer brave and clear lay on levi and let thy arm be strong and again the sounds of blows regular merciless came up from the bowels of the earth dost thou repent dost thou renounce dost thou deny i repent of my sins i renounce your ways i believe in the lord Je the sacred name was not heard a smothered groan as of one losing consciousness in extreme torture was all that came up from below lay on levi lay on nay answered the strong rabbi the boy will die let us leave him here for this night perchance cold and hunger will be more potent than stripes when he shall come to himself as thou sayest answered the father in angry reluctance again all was silent soon the rays of light ceased to shine through the crevices of the outer shutters and sleep descended upon the quarter of the jews still the scene in the vision changed not after a long stillness a clear young voice was heard speaking lord if it be thy will that i die grant that i may bear all in thy name grant that i unworthy may endure in this body the punishments due to me in spirit for my sins and if it be thy will that i live let my life be used also for thy glory the voice ceased and the cloud of passing time descended upon the vision and was lifted again and again and each time the same voice was heard and the sound of torturing blows but the voice of the boy was weaker every night though it was not less brave i believe it said always do what you will you have power over the body but i have the faith over which you have no power so the days and nights passed and though the prayer came up in feeble tones it was born of a mighty spirit and it rang in the ears of the tormentors as the voice of an angel which they had no power to silence appealing from them to the tribunal of the throne of god most high day by day also the rabbis and the elders began to congregate together at evening before the house of lazarus and to talk with him and with each other debating how they might break the endurance of his son and bring him again into the synagogue as one of themselves chief among them in their councils was levi the short-handed devising new tortures for the frail body to bear and boasting how he would conquer the stubborn boy by the might of his hands to heart some of the rabbis shook their heads he is possessed of a devil they said he will die and repent not but others nodded approvingly and wagged their filthy heads and said that when the fool had been chastised the evil spirit would depart from him once more the cloud of passing time descended and was lifted then the walls of the house were opened and in a low arched chamber the rabbi sat about a black table it was night and a single smoking lamp was lighted a mere wick projecting out of a three-cornered vessel of copper which was full of oil and was hung from the vault with blackened wires seven rabbis sat at the board and at the head sat lazarus their crooked hands and claw-like nails moved uneasily and there was a lurid fire in their vultures eyes they bent forward speaking to each other in low tones and from beneath their greasy caps their anointed side curls dangled and swung as they moved their heads but levi the short-handed was not among them their muffled talk was interrupted from time to time by the sound of sharp loud blows as of a hammer striking upon nails as though a carpenter were at work not far from the room in which they sat he has not repented said lazarus from his place 
neither many stripes nor cold nor hunger nor thirst have moved him to righteousness it is written that he shall be cut off from his people he shall be cut off answered the rabbis with one voice it is right and just that he should die continued the father shall we give him over to the christians that he may dwell among them and become one of them and be shown before the world to our shame we will not let him go said the dark man and an evil smile flickered from one face to another as a firefly flutters from tree to tree in the night as though the spirit of evil had touched each one in turn we will not let him go said each again lazarus also smiled as though in assent and bowed his head a little before he spoke i am obedient to your judgment it is yours to command and mine to obey if you say that he must die let him die he is my son take him did not our father abraham lay isaac upon the altar and offer him as a burnt sacrifice before the lord let him die said the rabbis then let him die answered lazarus i am your servant it is mine to obey his blood be on our heads they said and again the evil smile went round it is then expedient that we determine of what manner his death shall be continued the father inclining his body to signify his submission it is not lawful to shed his blood said the rabbis and we cannot stone him lest we be brought to judgment of the christians determine now the manner of his death my masters if you will it let him be brought once more before us let us all hear with our ears his denial and if he repent at the last it is well let him live but if he harden his heart against our entreaties let him die levi hath brought certain pieces of wood hither to my house and is even now at work if the youth is still stubborn in his unbelief let him die even as the unbeliever died by the righteous judgment of the romans let it be so let him be crucified said the rabbis with one voice then lazarus rose and went out and in the vision the rabbis remained seated motionless in their places awaiting his return the noise of levi's hammer echoed through the low vaulted chamber and at each blow the smoking lamp quivered a little casting strange shadows upon the evil faces beneath its light at last footsteps slow and uncertain were heard without the low door opened and lazarus entered holding up the body of his son before him i have brought him before you for the last time he said question him and hear his condemnation out of his own mouth he repents not though i have done my utmost to bring him back to the paths of righteousness question him my masters and let us see what he will say white and exhausted with long hunger and thirst his body broken by torture scarcely any longer sensible to bodily pain simon abellus would have fallen to the ground had his father not held him under the arms his head hung forward and the pale and noble face was inclined toward the breast with the deep dark eyes were open and gazed calmly upon those who sat in judgment at the table a rough piece of linen cloth was wrapped about the boy's shoulders and body but his thin arms were bare hearest thou simon son of lazarus asked the rabbis knowest thou in whose presence thou standest i hear you and i know you all there was no fear in the voice though it trembled from weakness renounce then thy errors and having suffered the chastisement of thy folly return to the ways of thy father and of thy father's house and of all thy people i renounce my sins and whatsoever is yet left for me to suffer i will by god's help 
so bear it as to not be unworthy of Christ's mercy. The rabbis gazed at the brave young face and smiled and wagged their beards talking to one another in low tones. It is as we feared, they said. He is unrepentant and he is worthy of death. It is not expedient that the young adder should live. There is poison under his tongue, and he speaks things not lawful for an Israelite to hear. Let him die, that we may see him no more, and that our children be not corrupted by his false teachings. Hearest thou? Thou shalt die. It was Lazarus who spoke while holding up the boy before the table and hissing the words into his ear. I hear. I am ready. Lead me forth. There is yet time to repent. If thou wilt but deny what thou hast said these many days, and return to us, thou shalt be forgiven, and thy days shall be long among us, and thy children's days after thee and the Lord shall perchance to have mercy and increase thy goods among thy fellows. Let him alone, said the rabbis. He is unrepentant. Lead me forth, said Simon Abelus. Lead him forth, repeated the rabbis. Perchance when he sees the manner of his death before his eyes, he will repent at the last. The boy's fearless eyes looked from one to the other. Whatsoever it be, he said, I have but one life. Take it as you will. I die in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, and into his hands I commend my spirit, which you cannot take. Lead him forth. Let him be crucified, cried the rabbis together. We will hear him no longer. Then Lazarus led his son away from them and left them talking together and shaking their heads and wagging their filthy beards. And in the vision the scene changed. The chamber with its flickering lamp and its black table and all the men who were in it grew dim and faded away. And in its place there was a dim inner court between high houses upon which only the windows of the house of Lazarus opened. There, Upon the ground stood a lantern of horn, and the soft yellow light of it fell upon two pieces of wood, nailed one upon the other to form a small cross, small indeed, and yet tall enough and broad enough and strong enough to bear the slight burden of the boy's frail body, and beside it stood Lazarus and Levi, the short-handed, the strong rabbi, holding Simon and Bellus between them. On the ground lay pieces of cord ready, wherewith to bind him to the cross, for they held it unlawful to shed his blood. It was soon done. The two men took up the cross and set it, with the body hanging thereon, upon the wall of the narrow court, over against the house of Lazarus. Thou mayest still repent during this night, said the father, holding up the horn lantern, and looking into his son's tortured face. Ay, there is yet time, said Levi brutally. He will not die so soon. Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit, said the weak voice once more. Then Lazarus raised his hand and struck him once more on the mouth, as he had done on that first night when he had seized him near the church. But Levi, the short-handed, as though in wrath at seeing all his torments fail, dealt him one heavy blow just where the ear joins the neck, and it was over at last. A radiant smile of peace flickered over the pale face. The eyelids quivered and closed. The head fell forward upon the breast and the martyrdom of Simon Abelus was consummated. Into the dark court came the rabbis one by one from the inner chamber, and each as he came took up the horn lantern, 
and held it to the dead face and smiled and spoke a few low words in the hebrew tongue and then went out into the street until only lazarus and levi were left alone with the dead body then they debated what they should do and for a time they went into the house and refreshed themselves with food and wine and comforted each other well knowing that they had done an evil deed and they came back when it was late and wrapped the body in the coarse cloth and carried it out stealthily and buried it in the jewish cemetery and departed again to their own houses and there he lay said unorna the boy of your race who was faithful to death have you suffered have you for one short hour known the meaning of such great words as you dared to speak to me do you now know what it means to be a martyr to suffer for standing on the very spot where he lay you have felt in some small degree a part of what he must have felt you live be warned if again you anger me your life shall not be spared you the visions had all vanished again the wilderness of grave stones and lean crooked trees appeared wild and desolate as before the wanderer roused himself and saw unorna standing before israel kafka's prostrate body as though suddenly released from a spell he sprang forward and knelt down trying to revive the unconscious man by rubbing his hands and chafing his temples End of chapter 15 of The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale. Recording by Angelique G. Campbell or burgundygrace at gmail.com Chapter 16 of The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter 16 The wanderer glanced at Unorna's face and saw the expression of relentless hatred which had settled upon her features. He neither understood it nor attempted to account for it. So far as he knew, Israel Kafka was mad, a man to be pitied, to be cared for, to be controlled perhaps, but assuredly not to be maltreated. Though the memories of the last half-hour were confused and distorted, the wanderer began to be aware that the young Hebrew had been made to suffer almost beyond the bounds of human endurance. So far as it was possible to judge, Israel Kafka's fault consisted in loving a woman who did not return his love and his worst misdeed had been his sudden intrusion upon an interview in which the wanderer could recall nothing which might not have been repeated to the whole world with impunity. During the last month he had lived a life of bodily and mentally indolence, in which all his keenest perceptions and strongest instincts had been lulled into a semi-dormant state. Unknown to himself, the mainspring of all thought and action had been taken out of his existence together with the very memory of it. For years he had lived and moved and wandered over the earth in obedience to one dominant idea. By a magic of which he knew nothing, that idea had been annihilated temporarily if not forever, and the immediate consequence had been the cessation of all interest and of all desire for individual action. The suspension of all anxiety, restlessness, and mental suffering had benefited the physical man though it had reduced the intelligence to a state bordering upon total apathy. But organizations, mental or physical, of great natural strength, are never reduced to weakness by a period of inactivity. It is those minds and bodies which have been artificially developed by a long course of training to a degree of power they were never intended to possess which lose that force almost immediately in idleness. The really very strong man has no need of constant gymnastic exercise. He will be stronger than other men whatever he does. 
the strong character needs not be constantly struggling against terrible odds in the most difficult situations in order to be sure of its own solidity. Nor must the deep intellect be ever plodding through the mazes of intricate theories and problems that it may feel itself superior to minds of less compass. There is much natural inborn strength of body and mind in the world, and on the whole those who possess either accomplish more than those in whom either is the result of long and well-regulated training. The belief in a great cruelty and a greater injustice roused the man who throughout so many days had lived in calm indifference to every aspect of the humanity around him. Seeing that Israel Kafka could not be immediately restored to consciousness, he rose to his feet again and stood between the prostrate victim and Unorna. "'You are killing this man instead of saving him,' he said. "'His crime, you say, is that he loves you. Is that a reason for using all your powers to destroy him in body and mind?' "'Perhaps,' answered Unorna calmly, though there was still a dangerous light in her eyes. "'No, it is no reason,' answered the wanderer with a decision to which Unorna was not accustomed. "'Kayork tells me that the man is mad. He may be. But he loves you and deserves mercy of you.' "'Mercy!' exclaimed Unorna with a cruel laugh. "'You heard what he said. You were for silencing him yourself. You could not have done it. I have, and most effectually.' Whatever your art really may be, you use it badly and cruelly. A moment ago I was blinded myself. If I had understood clearly while you were speaking that you were making this poor fellow suffer in himself the hideous agony you described, I would have stopped you. You blinded me, as you dominated him. But I am not blind now. You shall not torment him any longer. And how would you have stopped me? How can you hinder me now?" asked Unorna. The wanderer gazed at her in silence for some moments. There was an expression in his face which he had never seen there. Towering above her, he looked down. The massive brows were drawn together, the eyes were cold and impenetrable, every feature expressed strength. "'By force, if need be,' he answered very quietly. The woman before him was not of those who fear or yield. She met his glance boldly. Scarcely half an hour earlier she had been able to steal away his senses and make him subject to her. She was ready to renew the contest, though she realized that a change had taken place in him. "'You talk of force to a woman!' she exclaimed contemptuously. "'You are indeed brave!' "'You are not a woman you are the incarnation of cruelty. I have seen it." His eyes were cold and his voice was stern. Unorna felt a very sharp pain and shivered as though she were cold. Whatever else was bad and cruel and untrue in her wild nature, her love for him was true and passionate and enduring. And she loved him the more for the strength he was beginning to show, and for his determined opposition. The words he had spoken had hurt her as he little guessed they could, not knowing that he alone of men had power to wound her. "'You do not know,' she answered. "'How should you?' Her glance fell and her voice trembled. "'I know enough,' he said. He turned coldly from her and knelt again beside Israel Kafka. He raised the pale head and supported it upon his knee and gazed anxiously into the face, raising the lids with his finger as though to convince himself that the man was not dead. Indeed, there seemed to be but little life left in him as he lay there with outstretched arms and twisted fingers, scarcely breathing. In such a place, without so much as the commonest restorative to aid him, the wanderer saw that he had but little chance of success. Unorna stood aside, not looking at the two men. It was nothing to her whether Kafka lived or died. She was suffering herself, more than she had ever suffered in her life. He had said that she was not a woman, she whose whole woman's nature worshipped him. He had said that she was the incarnation of cruelty. And it was true, 
though it was her love for him that made her cruel to the other. Could he know what she had felt, when she had understood that Israel Kafka had heard her passionate words and seen her eager face and had laughed her to scorn? Could any woman at such a time be less than cruel? Was not her hate for the man who loved her as great as her love for the man who loved her not? Even if she possessed instruments of torture for the soul more terrible than those invented in darker ages to rack the human body, was she not justified in using them all? Was not Israel Kafka guilty of the greatest of all crimes, of loving when he was not loved, and of witnessing her shame and discomfiture? She could not bear to look at him, lest she should lose herself and try to thrust the wanderer aside and kill the man with her hands. Then she heard footsteps on the frozen path, and turning quickly she saw that the wanderer had lifted Kafka's body from the ground and was moving rapidly away, towards the entrance of the cemetery. He was leaving her in anger without a word. She turned very pale and hesitated. Then she ran forward to overtake him, but he, hearing her approach, quickened his stride, seeming but little hampered in his pace by the burden he bore. But Unorna, too, was fleet of foot and strong. "'Stop!' she cried, laying her hand upon his arm. "'Stop! Hear me! Do not leave me so!' But he would not pause, and hurried onward towards the gate, while she hung upon his arm, trying to hinder him and speaking in desperate agitation. She felt that if she let him go now, he would leave her forever. In that moment even her hatred of Kafka sank into insignificance. She would do anything, bear anything, promise anything, rather than lose what she loved so wildly. "'Stop!' she cried again. "'I will save him. I will obey you. I will be kind to him. He will die in your arms if you do not let me help you. Oh, for the love of heaven, wait one moment, only one moment!' She so thrust herself in the wanderer's path, hanging upon him and trying to tear Kafka from his arms, that he was forced to stand still and face her. "'Let me pass!' he exclaimed, making another effort to advance. But she clung to him, and he could not move. "'No, I will not let you go,' she murmured. "'You can do nothing without me. You will only kill him, as I would have done a moment ago.' "'And as you will do now.' he said sternly, if I let you have your way. By all that is holy in heaven I will save him. He shall not even remember. Do not swear. I shall not believe you. You will believe when you see. You will forgive me. You will understand." Without answering, he exerted his strength and clasping the insensible man more firmly in his arms, he made one or two steps forward. Unorna's foot slipped on the frozen ground, and she would have fallen to the earth, but she clung to him with desperate energy. Seeing that she was in danger of some bodily hurt if he used greater force, the wanderer stopped again, uncertain how to act. Unorna stood before him, panting a little from the struggle, her face as white as death. "'Unless you kill me,' she said, "'you shall not take him away so. Hold him in your arms, if you will but let me speak to him." "'And how shall I know that you will not hurt him, you who hate him as you do?' "'Am I not at your mercy?' asked Unorna. "'If I deceive you, can you not do what you will with me, even if I try to resist you, which I will not? Hold me if you choose, lest I should escape you, and if Israel Kafka does not recover his strength and his consciousness, then take me with you and deliver me up to justice as a witch, as a murderess, if you will." The wanderer was silent for a moment. Then he realized that what she said was true. She was in his power. "'Restore him if you can,' he said. Unorna laid her hands upon Kafka's forehead, and, bending down, whispered into his ear words which were inaudible even to the man who held him. The mysterious change from sleep to consciousness was almost instantaneous. He opened his eyes and looked first at Unorna and then at the wanderer. There was neither pain nor passion in his face, but only wonder. 
A moment more and his limbs regained their strength. He stood upright and passed his hand over his eyes as though trying to remember what had happened. "'How came I here?' he asked in surprise. "'What has happened to me?' "'You fainted,' said Unorna quietly. "'You remember that you were very tired after your journey. The walk was too much for you. We will take you home.' "'Yes, yes, I must have fainted. Forgive me, it comes over me sometimes.' He evidently had complete control of his faculties at the present moment, when he glanced curiously from the one to the other of his two companions, as they all three began to walk towards the gate. Unorna avoided his eyes, and seemed to be looking at the irregular slabs they passed on their way. The wanderer had intended to free himself from her as soon as Kafka regained his senses, but he had not been prepared for such a sudden change. He saw now that he could not exchange a word with her without exciting the man's suspicion, and he was by no means sure that the first emotion might not produce a sudden and dangerous effect. He did not even know how great the change might be, which Unorna's words had brought about. That Kafka had forgotten at once his own conduct and the fearful vision which Unorna had imposed upon him was clear, but it did not follow that he had ceased to love her. Indeed, to one only partially acquainted with the laws which governed hypnotics, such a transition seemed very far removed from possibility. He, who in one moment had himself been made to forget utterly the dominant passion and love of his life, was so completely ignorant of the fact that he could not believe such a thing possible in any case whatsoever. In the dilemma in which he found himself there was nothing to be done but to be guided by circumstances. He was not willing to leave Kafka alone with the woman who hated him, and he saw no means of escaping her society so long as he chose to impose it upon them both. He supposed, too, that Unorna realized this as well as he did, and he tried to be prepared for all events by revolving all the possibilities in his mind. But Unorna was absorbed by very different thoughts. From time to time she stole a glance at his face and she saw that it was stern and cold as ever. She had kept her word, but he did not relent. A terrible anxiety overwhelmed her. It was possible, even probable, that he would henceforth avoid her. She had gone too far. She had not reckoned upon such a nature as his, capable of being roused to implacable anger by mere sympathy for the suffering of another. Then, understanding it at last, she had thought it would be enough that those sufferings should be forgotten by him upon whom they had been inflicted. She could not comprehend the horror he had felt for herself and for her hideous cruelty. She had entered the cemetery in the consciousness of her strong will, and of her mysterious powers certain of victory, sure that having once sacrificed her pride and stooped so low as to command what should have come of itself, she should see his face change and hear the ring of passion in that passionless voice. She had failed in that, and utterly. She had been surprised by her worst enemy. She had been laughed to scorn in the moment of her deepest humiliation, and she had lost the foundations of friendship in the attempt to build upon them the hanging gardens of an artificial love. In that moment, as they reached the gate, Unorna was not far from despair. A Jewish boy, with puffed red lips and curving nostrils, was loitering at the entrance. The wanderer told him to find a carriage. Two carriages,' said Unorna quickly. The boy ran out. "'I will go home alone,' she added. "'You two can drive together.' The wanderer inclined his head in assent, but said nothing. Israel Kafka's dark eyes rested upon hers for a moment. Why not go together? he asked. Unorna started slightly and turned as though about to make a sharp answer, but she checked herself, for the wanderer was looking at her. She spoke to him instead of answering Kafka. It is the best arrangement, do you not think so? she asked. Quite the best. I shall be gratified if you will bring me word of him, she said, glancing at Kafka. The wanderer was silent as though he had not heard. 
Have you been in pain? Do you feel as though you had been suffering? She asked of the younger man, in a tone of sympathy and solicitude. No. Why do you ask? Unorna smiled and looked at the wanderer with intention. He did not heed her. At that moment two carriages appeared and drew up at the end of the narrow alley which leads from the street to the entrance of the cemetery. All three walked forward together. Kafka went forward and opened the door of one of the conveyances for Unorna to get in. The wanderer, still anxious for the man's safety, would have taken his place, but Kafka turned upon him almost defiantly. "'Permit me,' he said. "'I was before you here.' The wanderer stood civilly aside and lifted his hat. Unorna held out her hand and he took it coldly, not being able to do otherwise. "'You will let me know, will you not?' she said. "'I am anxious about him.' He raised his eyebrows a little and dropped her hand. "'You shall be informed,' he said. Kafka helped her to get into the carriage. She drew him by the hand so that his head was inside the door and the other man could not hear her words. "'I am anxious about you,' she said very kindly. "'Make him come himself to me and tell me how you are.' "'Surely, if you have asked him.' "'He hates me,' whispered Unorna quickly. "'Unless you make him come he will send no message.' "'Then let me come myself. I am perfectly well.' "'Hush! No!' she answered hurriedly. "'Do as I say. It will be best for you, and for me. Good-bye.' "'Your word is my law,' said Kafka, drawing back. His eyes were bright and his thin cheek was flushed. It was long since she had spoken so kindly to him. A ray of hope entered his life. The wanderer saw the look and interpreted it rightly. He understood that in that brief moment Unorna had found time to do some mischief. Her carriage drove on and left the two men free to enter the one intended for them. Kafka gave the driver the address of his lodgings. Then he sank back into the corner, exhausted and conscious of his extreme weakness. A short silence followed. "'You are in need of rest,' said the wanderer, watching him curiously. "'Indeed, I am very tired, if not actually ill. You have suffered enough to tire the strongest." "'In what way?' asked Kafka. "'I have forgotten what happened. I know that I followed Unorna to the cemetery. I had been to her house, and I saw you afterwards together. I had not spoken to her since I came back from my long journey this morning. Tell me what occurred. Did she make me sleep? I feel as if I have felt before when I have fancied that she has hypnotized me." The wanderer looked at him in surprise. The question was asked as naturally as though it referred to an everyday occurrence of little or no weight. "'Yes,' he answered. "'She made you sleep.' "'Why? Do you know? If she has made me dream something, I have forgotten it.' The wanderer hesitated a moment. I cannot answer your question," he said at length. "'Ah! She told me that you hated her,' said Kafka, turning his dark eyes to his companion. "'But yet,' he added, "'that is hardly a reason why you should not tell me what happened.' "'I could not tell you the truth without saying something which I have no right to say to a stranger, which I could not easily say to a friend.' "'You need not spare me. It might save you. Then say it, though I do not know from what danger I am to be saved. But I can guess, perhaps, you would advise me to give up the attempt to win her. Precisely. I need say no more. On the contrary, said Kafka with sudden energy, when a man gives such advice as that to a stranger he is bound to give also his reasons. The wanderer looked at him calmly as he answered, "'One man need hardly give a reason for saving another man's life. Yours is in danger.' "'I see that you hate her, as she said you did.' "'You and she are both mistaken in that. I am not in love with her, and I have ceased to be her friend. As for my interest in you, 
It does not even pretend to be friendly. It is that which any man may feel for a fellow being, and what any man would feel who had seen what I have seen this afternoon." The calm bearing and speech of the experienced man of the world carried weight with it in the eyes of the young Moravian, whose hot blood knew little of restraint and less of caution. With the keen instinct of his race in the reading of character, he suddenly understood that his companion was at once generous and disinterested. A burst of confidence followed close upon the conviction. "'If I am to lose her love, I would rather lose my life also, and by her hand,' he said hotly. "'You are warning me against her. I feel that you are honest, and I see that you are in earnest. I thank you. If I am in danger, do not try to save me. I saw her face a few moments ago, and she spoke to me. I cannot believe that she is plotting my destruction." The wanderer was silent. He wondered whether it was his duty to do or say more. Unorna was a changeable woman. She might love the man tomorrow. But Israel Kafka was too young to let the conversation drop. Boylike, he expected confidence for confidence, and was surprised at his companion's taciturnity. "'What did she say to me when I was asleep?' he asked after a short pause. "'Did you ever hear the story of Simon Abelis? the wanderer inquired by way of answer. Kafka frowned and looked round sharply. "'Simon Abelis, He was a renegade Hebrew boy. His father killed him. He is buried in the Teinkirch. What of him? What has he to do with Unorna or with me? I am myself a Jew. The time has gone by when we Jews hid our heads. I am proud of what I am, and I will never be a Christian. What can Simon Abelis have to do with me?" "'Little enough, now that you are awake. And when I was asleep, what then? She made me see him, perhaps. She made you live his life. She made you suffer all that he suffered." "'What?' cried Israel Kafka in a loud and angry tone. What I say," returned the other quietly. And you did not interfere? You did not stop her? No, of course, I forgot that you are a Christian." The wanderer looked at him in surprise. It had not struck him that Israel Kafka might be a man of the deepest religious convictions, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and that what he would resent most would be the fact that in his sleep Unorna had made him play the part and suffer the martyrdom of a convert to Christianity. This was exactly what took place. He would have suffered anything at Unorna's hands and without complaint, even to bodily death. But his wrath rose furiously at the thought that she had been playing with what he held most sacred that she had forced from his lips the denial of the faith of his people and the confession of the Christian belief, perhaps the very words of the hated creed. The modern Hebrew of Western Europe might be indifferent in such a case as though he had spoken in the delirium of a fever, but the Jew of the less civilized East is a different being, and in some ways a stronger. Israel Kafka represented the best type of his race, and his blood boiled at the insult that had been put upon him. The wanderer saw and understood and at once began to respect him, as men who believe firmly in opposite creeds have been known to respect each other even in a life-and-death struggle. "'I would have stopped her if I could,' he said. "'Were you sleeping too?' asked Kafka hotly. "'I cannot tell. I was powerless, though I was conscious. I saw only Simon Abelis in it all though I seem to be aware that you and he were one person. I did interfere, as soon as I was free to move. I think I saved your life. I was carrying you away in my arms when she waked you. I thank you. I suppose it is as you tell me. You could not move, but you saw it all, you say. You saw me play the part of the apostate. You heard me confess the Christian's faith. Yes, I saw you die in agony, confessing it still." Israel Kafka ground his teeth and turned his face away. The wanderer was silent. 
A few moments later the carriage stopped at the door of Kafka's lodging. The latter turned to his companion, who was startled by the change in the young face. The mouth was now closely set, the features seemed bolder, the eyes harder and more manly. A look of greater dignity and strength was in the whole. "'You do not love her?' he asked. "'Do you give me your word that you do not love her?' If you need so much to assure you of it, I give you my word. I do not love her. Will you come with me for a few moments? I live here." The wanderer made a gesture of assent. In a few moments they found themselves in a large room furnished almost in eastern fashion, with few objects but those of great value. Israel Kafka was alone in the world, and was rich. There were two or three divans a few low, octagonal, inlaid tables, a dozen or more splendid weapons hung upon the wall, and the polished wooden floor was partly covered with extremely rich carpets. "'Do you know what she said to me when I helped her into the carriage?' asked Kafka. "'No, I did not attempt to hear. She did not mean that you should hear her. She made me promise to send you to her with news of myself.' She said that you hated her and would not go to her unless I begged you to do so. Is that true?" I have told you that I do not hate her. I hate her cruelty. I will certainly not go to her of my own choice. She said that I had fainted. That was a lie. She invented it as an excuse to attract you, on the ground of her interest in my condition. Evidently. She hates me with an extreme hatred. Her real interest lay in showing you how terrible that hatred could be. It is not possible to conceive of anything more diabolically bad than what she did to me. She made me her sport, yours too, perhaps, or she would at least have wished it. On that holy ground where my people lie in peace, she made me deny my faith. She made me, in your eyes and her own, personate a renegade of my race. She made me confess in the Christian creed. She made me seem to die for a belief I abhor. Can you conceive of anything more devilish? A moment later she smiles upon me and presses my hand, and is anxious to know of my good health. And, but for you, I should never have known what she had done to me. I owe you gratitude though it be for the worst pain I have ever suffered. But do you think I will forgive her?" "'You would be very forgiving if you could,' said the wanderer, his own anger rising again at the remembrance of what he had seen. "'And do you think that I can love still?' "'No. Israel Kafka walked the length of the room and then came back and stood before the wanderer and looked into his eyes. His face was very calm and resolute, the flush had vanished from his thin cheeks, and the features were set in an expression of irrevocable determination. Then he spoke, slowly and distinctly. "'You are mistaken. I love her with all my heart. I will therefore kill her.' The wanderer had seen many men in many lands, and had witnessed the effects of many passions. He gazed earnestly into Israel Kafka's face, searching in vain for some manifestation of madness. But he was disappointed. The Moravian had formed his resolution in cold blood and intended to carry it out. His only folly appeared to lie in the announcement of his intention. But his next words explained even that. "'She made me promise to send you to her if you would go,' he said. "'Will you go to her now?' What shall I tell her? I warn you that, since you need not warn me, I know what you would say. But I will be no common murderer. I will not kill her as she would have killed me. Warn her, not me. Go to her and say, Israel Kafka has promised before God that he will take your blood in expiation, and there is no escape from the man who is himself ready to die. Tell her to fly for her life and that quickly. "'And what will you gain by doing this murder?' asked the wanderer, calmly. 
He was revolving schemes for Unorna's safety, and half amazed to find himself forced in common humanity to take her part. I shall free myself of my shame in loving her at the price of her blood and mine. Will you go? And what is to prevent me from delivering you over to safe keeping before you do this deed? You have no witness, answered Kafka with a smile. You are a stranger in the city and in this country, and I am rich. I shall easily prove that you love Unorna and that you wish to get rid of me out of jealousy. That is true, said the wanderer thoughtfully. I will go. Go quickly, then, said Israel Kafka, for I shall follow soon. As the wanderer left the room, he saw the Moravian turn toward the place where the keen, splendid eastern weapons hung upon the wall. End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of the Witch of Prague: A Fantastic Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Witch of Prague: A Fantastic Tale by francis marion crawford chapter seventeen the wanderer knew that the case was urgent and the danger great there was no mistaking the tone of israel kafka's voice nor the look in his face nor did the savage resolution seem altogether unnatural in a man of the moravian breeding the wanderer had no time and but little inclination to blame himself for the part he had played in disclosing to the principal actor the nature of the scene which had taken place in the cemetery and the immediate consequences of that disclosure though wholly unexpected did not seem utterly illogical israel kafka's nature was eastern violently passionate and at the same time long-suffering in certain directions as only the fatalist can be he could have loved for a lifetime faithfully without requital he would have suffered in patience unorna's anger scorn pity or caprice he had long before now resigned his free will into the keeping of a passion which was degrading as it enslaved all his thoughts and actions but which had something noble in it inasmuch as it fitted him for the most heroic self-sacrifice unorna's act had brought the several seemingly contradictory elements of his character to bear upon one point he had realized in the same moment that it was impossible for her to love him that her changing treatment of him was not the result of caprice but of a fixed plan of her own in the execution of which she would spare him neither falsehood nor insult that to love such a woman was the lowest degradation that he could nevertheless not destroy that love and finally that the only escape from his shame lay in her destruction and that this must in all probability involve his own death also at the same time he felt that there was something solemn in the expiation he was about to exact something that accorded well with the fierce traditions of ancient israel and the deed should not be done stealthily or in the dark unorna must know that she was to die by his hand and why he had no object in concealment for his own life was already ended by the certainty that his love was hopeless and on the other hand fatalist as he was he believed that unorna could not escape him and that no warning could save her the wanderer understood most of these things as he hastened towards her house through the darkening streets not a carriage was to be seen and he was obliged to traverse the distance on foot as often happens at supreme moments when everything might be gained by the saving of a few minutes in conveying a warning 
he saw himself in a very strange position half an hour had not elapsed since he had watched unorna driving away from the cemetery and had inwardly determined that he would never if possible set eyes on her again scarcely two hours earlier he had been speaking to her of the sincere friendship which he felt was growing up for her in his heart since then he had learned almost beyond the possibility of a doubt that she loved him and he learned too to despise her he had left her meaning that the parting should be final and now he was hurrying to her house to give her the warning which alone could save her from destruction and yet he found it impossible to detect any inconsistency in his own conduct as he had been conscious of doing his utmost to save israel kafka from her so now he knew that he was doing all he could to save urena from the moravian and he recognized the fact that no man with the commonest feelings of humanity could have done less in either case but he was conscious also of a change in himself which he did not attempt to analyze his indolent self-satisfied apathy was gone the strong interest of human life and death stirred him mind and body together acquired their activity and he was at all points once more a man he was ignorant indeed of what had been taken from him the memory of beatrice was gone and he fancied himself one who had never loved woman he looked back with horror and amazement upon the emptiness of his past life wondering how such an existence as he had led or fancied he had led could have been possible but there was scant time for reflection upon the problem of his own mission in the world as he hastened toward unorna's house his present mission was clear enough and simple enough though by no means easy of accomplishment what israel kafka had told him was very true should he attempt a denunciation he would have little chance of being believed it would be easy enough for kafka to bring witnesses to prove his own love for unorna and the wanderer's intimacy with her during the past month and the latter's consequent interest in disposing summarily of his moravian rival a stranger in the land would have small hope of success against a man whose antecedents were known whose fortunes were reputed great and who had at his back the whole gigantic strength of the jewish interest in prague if he chose to invoke the assistance of his people the matter would end in a few days in the wanderer being driven from the country while israel kafka would be left behind to work his will as might seem best in his own eyes there was keyork arabian so far as it was possible to believe in the sincerity of any of the strange persons among whom the wanderer found himself it seemed certain that the sage was attached to unorna by some bond of mutual interest which he would be loath to break keyork had many acquaintances and seemed to possess everywhere a certain amount of respect whether because he was perhaps a member of some widespread mysterious society of which the wanderer knew nothing or whether this importance of his was due to his personal superiority of mind and wide experience of travel no one could say but it seems certain that if unorna could be placed for a time being in a safe refuge it would be best to apply to keyork to ensure her further protection meanwhile the refuge must be found and unorna must be conveyed to it without delay the wanderer was admitted without question he found unorna in her accustomed place she had thrown aside her furs and was sitting in an attitude of deep thought her dress was black and in the soft light of the shaded lamps she was like a dark marble statue set in the midst of thick shrubbery in a garden 
her elbows rested on her knee her chin upon her beautiful heavy hand only in her hair there was a bright colour she knew the wanderer's footsteps but she neither moved her body nor turned her head she felt that she grew paler than before and she could hear her heart beating strongly i come from israel kafka said the wanderer standing still before her she knew from his tone how hard his face must be and she would not look up what of him she asked in a voice without expression is he well he bids me say to you that he has promised before heaven to take your life and that there is no escape from a man who is ready to lay down his own unorna turned her head slowly towards him and a very soft look stole over her strange face and you have brought me his message this warning to save me she said as i tried to save him from you an hour ago but there is little time the man is desperate whether mad or sane i cannot tell make haste determine where to go for safety and i will take you there but unorna did not move she only looked at him with an expression he could no longer misunderstand he was cold and impassive i fancy it will not be safe to hesitate long he said he is in earnest i do not fear israel kafka and i fear death less answered unorna deliberately why does he mean to kill me i think that in his place most every human man would feel as he does though religion or prudence or fear or all three together might prevent them from doing what they would wish to do you too and which of the three would prevent you from murdering me none perhaps though pity might i want no pity least of all from you what i have done i have done for you and for you only the wanderer's face showed only a cold disgust he said nothing you do not seem surprised said unorna you know that i love you i know it a silence followed during which unorna returned to her former attitude turning her eyes away and resting her chin upon her hand the wanderer began to grow impatient i must repeat that in my opinion you have not much time to spare he said if you are not in a place of safety in half an hour i cannot answer for the consequences no time there is all eternity what is eternity or time or life to me i will wait for him here why did you tell him what i did if you wish me to live why since there are to be questions why did you exercise your cruelty upon an innocent man who loves you why there are reasons enough unorna's voice trembled slightly you do not know what happened how should you you were asleep you may as well know since i may be beyond telling you an hour from now you may as well know how i love you and to what depths i have gone down to win your love i would rather not receive your confidence the wanderer answered haughtily i came here to save your life not to hear your confessions and when you have heard you will no longer wish to save me if you choose to leave me here i will wait for israel kafka alone he may kill me if he pleases i do not care but if you stay you shall hear what i have to say she glanced at his face he folded his arms and stood still whatever she had done he would not leave her alone at the mercy of the desperate man whom he expected every moment to enter the room if she would not save herself he might nevertheless disarm kafka and prevent the deed as his long sleeping energy revived in him the thought of a struggle was not disagreeable i loved you from the moment when i first saw you said unorna trying to speak calmly but you loved another woman do you remember her her name was beatrice and she was very dark as i am fair you had lost her and you had sought her for years you entered my house thinking that she had gone in before you 
do you remember that morning it was a month ago to-day you told me the story you have dreamed it said the wanderer in cold surprise i never loved any woman yet unorna laughed bitterly how perfect it all was at first she exclaimed how smooth it seemed how easy you slept before me out there by the river that very afternoon and in your sleep i bade you forget and you forgot wholly your love the woman her very name even as israel kafka forgot to-day what he had suffered in the person of the martyr you told him the story and he believes you because he knows me and knows what i can do you can believe me or not as you will i did it you are dreaming the wanderer repeated wondering whether she was not out of her mind i did it i said to myself that if i could destroy your old love root it out from your heart and from your memory and make you as one who had never loved at all then you would love me as you had once loved her with your whole free soul i said i was beautiful is it true is it not and young i am and i loved as no other woman ever loved and i said that it was enough and that soon you would love me too a month has passed away since then you are of ice of stone i do not know of what you are this morning you hurt me i thought it was the last hurt and that i should die then instead of to-night do you remember you thought i was ill and you went away when you were gone i fought with myself my dreams yes i had dreamed of all that can make earth heaven and you had waked me you said that you would be a brother to me you talked of friendship the sting of it it is no wonder that i grew faint with pain had you struck me in the face i would have kissed your hand but your friendship rather be dead than loving beheld a friend and i had dreamed of being dear to you for my own sake of being dearest and first and alone beloved since the other was gone and i had burned her memory the pride i had still until that moment i fancied that it was in my power if i would stoop so low to make you sleep again as you had slept before and to make you at my bidding feel all i felt i fought with myself i would not go down to that depth and then i said that even that were better than your friendship even a false semblance of love inspired by my will preserved by my suggestion and so i fell you came back to me and i led you to that lonely place and made you sleep and then i told you what was in my heart and poured out my fire of my soul into your ears a look came into your face i shall not forget it my folly was upon me and i thought it was for me i know the truth now sleeping the old memory revived in you of her whom waking you will never remember again but the look was there and i bade you awake my soul rose in my eyes i hung upon your lips the loving word i longed for seemed already to tremble in the air then came the truth you awoke and your face was stone calm smiling indifferent unloving and all this israel kafka had seen hiding like a thief almost beside us he saw it all he heard it all my words of love my agony of waiting my utter humiliation my burning shame was i cruel to him he had made me suffer and he suffered in his turn all this you did not know you know it now there is nothing more to tell will you wait here until he comes will you look on and be glad to see me die will you remember in the years to come with satisfaction that you saw the witch killed for her many misdeeds and for the chief of them all for loving you the wanderer had listened to her words but the tale they told was beyond the power of his belief 
he stood still in his place with folded arms debating what he should do to save her one thing alone was clear she loved him to distraction possibly he thought her story was but an invention to excuse her cruelty and to win his commiseration it failed to do either at first but yet he would not leave her to her fate you shall not die if i can help it he said simply and if you save me do you think that i will leave you she asked with sudden agitation turning and half rising from her seat think what you will be doing if you save me think well you say that israel kafka is desperate i am worse than desperate worse than mad with my love she sank back again and hid her face for a moment he on his part began to see the terrible reality and strength of her passion and silently wondered what the end would be he too was human and pity for her began at last to touch his heart you shall not die if i can save you he said again she sprang to her feet very suddenly and stood before him you pity me she cried what lie is that which says that there is a kinship between pity and love think well beware be warned i have told you much but you do not know me yet if you save me you save me but to love you more than i do already look at me for there is neither god nor hell nor pride nor shame there is nothing that i will not do nothing i shall be ashamed or afraid of doing if you save me you save me that i may follow you as long as i live i will never leave you you shall never escape my presence your whole life shall be full of me you do not love me and i can threaten you with nothing more intolerable than myself your eyes will weary of the sight of me and your ears at the sound of my voice do you think i have no hope a moment ago i had none but i see it now whether you will or not i shall be yours you may make a prisoner of me i shall be in your keeping then and shall know it and feel it and love my prison for your sake even if you will not let me see you if you would escape from me you must kill me as israel kafka means to kill me now and then i shall die by your hand and my life will have been yours and given to you how can you think that i have no hope i have hope and certainly for i shall be near you always to the end always 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 i will cling to you as i do now and say i love you i love you yes and you will cast me off but i will not go i will clasp your feet and say again i love you and you may spurn me man god wanderer devil whatever you are beloved always tread upon me trample on me crush me you cannot save yourself you cannot kill my love she had tried to take his hand and he had withdrawn his she had fallen upon her knees and as he tried to free himself had fallen almost to her length upon the marble floor clinging to his very feet so that he could make no step without doing her some hurt he looked down amazed and silent and as he looked she cast one glance upward to his stern face the bright tears streaming like falling gems from her unlike eyes her face pale and quivering her rich hair all loosened and falling about her and then neither body nor heart nor soul could bear the enormous strain that was laid upon them a low cry broke from her lips a stormy sob another and another like quick short waves breaking over the bar when the tide is low and the wind is rising suddenly the wanderer was in sore straits for the minutes were passing quickly and he remembered the last look on kafka's face and how he had felt the moravian standing before the weapons on the wall and nothing had been done yet not so much as an order given not to admit him if he came to the house 
at any moment he might be upon them and the storm showed no signs of being spent her wild convulsive sobbing was painful to hear if he tried to move she dragged herself frantically at his feet so that he feared lest he should tread upon her hands he pitied her now most truly though he guessed rightly that to show his pity would be but to add fuel to the blazing flame then in an interval of a second as she drew breath to weep afresh he fancied that he heard sounds below as of a great door being opened and closed again with a quick strong movement stooping low he put his arms about her and raised her from the floor at his touch her sobbing ceased for a moment as though she had wanted only that to soothe her in spite of him she let her head rest upon his shoulder letting him still feel that if he did not support her weight with his arm she would fall again in the midst of the most passionate and real outbursts of despairing love there was no artifice which she would not use to be nearer to him to extort even the semblance of a caress i heard someone come in below he said hurriedly it must be he decide quickly what to do either stay or fly you have not ten seconds for your choice she turned her imploring eyes to his let me stay here and end it all that you shall not he exclaimed dragging her towards the end of the hall opposite to the usual entrance and where he knew that there must be a door behind the screen of plants his hold tightened upon her yielding waist her head fell back and her full lips parted in an ecstasy of delight as she felt herself hurried along in his arms scarcely touching the floor with her feet ah now now let it come now she sighed it must be now or never he said almost roughly if you will leave this house with me now very well but leave this room you shall if i am to meet that man and stop him i will meet him alone leave you alone ah no not that they had reached the exit now at the same instant both heard someone enter at the other end and rapid footsteps on the marble pavement which is it to be asked the wanderer pale and calm he had pushed her through before him and seemed ready to go back alone with violent strength she drew him to her closed the door and slipped the strong steel bolt across below the lock there was a dim light in the passage together then she said i shall at least be with you a little while longer is there another way out of the house asked the wanderer anxiously more than one come with me as they disappeared in the corridor they heard behind them the noise of a door lock as someone tried to force it open then a heavy sound as though a man's shoulder struck against the solid panel unorna led the way through the narrow winding passage illuminated here and there by small lamps with shades of soft colors blown in bohemian glass pushing aside a curtain they came out into a small room the wanderer uttered an involuntary exclamation of surprise as he recognized the vestibule and saw before him the door of the great conservatory open as israel kafka had left it that the latter was still trying to pursue them through the opposite excess was clear enough for the blows he was striking on the panel echoed loudly into the hall swiftly and silently unorna closed the entrance and locked it securely he is safe for a little while she said keyork will find him there when he comes an hour hence and keyork will perhaps bring him to his senses she had regained control of herself to all appearances and she spoke with perfect calm and self-possession the wanderer looked at her in surprise and with some suspicion 
her hair was all falling about her shoulders but saving this sign there was no trace of the recent storm nor the least indication of passion if she had been acting a part throughout before an audience she would have seemed less indifferent when the curtain fell the wanderer having little cause to trust her found it hard to believe that she had not been counterfeiting it seemed impossible that she should be the same woman who but a moment earlier had been dragging herself at his feet in wild tears and wilder protestations of her love if you are sufficiently rested he said with a touch of sarcasm which he could not restrain i would suggest that we do not wait any longer here she turned and faced him and he saw now how very white she was so you think that even now i have been deceiving you that is what you think i see it in your face before he could prevent her she had opened the door wide again and was advancing calmly into the conservatory israel kafka she cried in loud clear tones i am here i am waiting come the wanderer ran forward he caught sight in the distance of a pair of fiery eyes and of something long and thin and sharp gleaming under the soft lamps he knew then that all was deadly earnest swift as thought he caught unorna and bore her from the hall locking the door again and setting his broad shoulders against it as he put her down the daring act she had done appealed to him in spite of himself i beg your pardon he said almost deferentially i misjudged you is it that she answered either i will be with you or i will die by his hand by yours by my own it will matter little when it's done you need not lean against the door it is very strong your furs are hanging there and here are mine let us be going quietly as though nothing unusual had happened they descended the stairs together the porter came forward with all due ceremony to open the shut door unorna told him that if keyork arabian came while he she was out he was to be shown directly into the conservatory a moment later she and her companion were standing together in the small irregular square before the clementium where will you go asked the wanderer with you she answered laying her hand upon his arm and looking into his face as though waiting to see what direction he would choose unless you send me back to him she added glancing quickly at the house and making as though she would withdraw her hand once more if it is to be that i will go alone there seemed to be no way out of the terrible dilemma and the wanderer stood still in deep thought he knew that if he could but free himself from her for half an hour he could get help from the right quarter and take israel kafka red-handed and armed as he was for the man was caught as in a trap and must stay there until he was released and there would be little doubt from his manner when taken that he was either mad or consciously attempting some crime there was no longer any necessity he thought for unorna to take refuge anywhere for more than an hour in that time israel kafka would be in safe custody and she could re-enter her house with nothing to fear but he counted without unorna's unyielding obstinacy she threatened if he left her for a moment to go back to israel kafka a few minutes earlier she had carried out her threat and the consequences had been almost fatal if you are in your right mind he said at last beginning to walk towards the corner you will see that what you wish to do is utterly against reason i will not allow you to run the risk of meeting israel kafka to-night but i cannot take you with me no i will hold you if you try to escape me and i will bring you to a place of safety by force if need be and you will leave me there and i shall never see you again i will not go and you will find it hard to take me anywhere in the crowded city by force 
you are not israel kafka with the whole jews quarter at your command in which to hide me the wanderer was perplexed he saw however that if he would yield the point and give his word to return to her she might be induced to follow his advice if i promise to come back to you will you do what i ask he inquired will you promise truly i have never broken a promise yet did you promise that other woman that you would never love again i wonder if so you are faithful indeed but you have forgotten that will you come back to me if i let you take me where i shall be safe to-night i will come back whenever you send for me if you fail my blood is on your head yes on my head be it very well i will go to that house where i first stayed when i came here take me there quickly no not quickly either let it be very long i shall not see you until to-morrow a carriage was passing at a foot's pace the wanderer stopped it and helped unorna to get in the place was very near and neither spoke though he could feel her hand upon his arm he made no attempt to shake her off at the gate they both got out and he rang a bell that echoed through the vaulted passages far away in the interior to-morrow said unorna touching his hand he could see even in the dark the look of love she turned upon him good-night he said and in the next moment she had disappeared within end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the witch of prague a fantastic tale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada the witch of prague a fantastic tale by francis marion crawford chapter eighteen having made the necessary explanations to account for her sudden appearance unorna found herself installed in two rooms of modest dimensions and very simply though comfortably furnished it was quite a common thing for ladies to seek a retreat and quiet in the convent during two or three weeks of the year and there was plenty of available space at the disposal of those who wished to do so such visits were indeed most commonly made during the lenten season and on the day when unorna sought refuge among the nuns it chanced that there was but one other stranger within the walls she was glad to find that this was the case her peculiar position would have made it hard for her to bear with equanimity the quiet observation of a number of women most of whom would probably have been to some extent acquainted with the story of her life and some of whom would certainly have wished out of curiosity to enter into nearer acquaintance with her while within the convent while not intending to prolong their intercourse with her any further it could not be expected indeed that in a city like prague such a woman as unorna could escape notice and the fact that little or nothing was known of her true history had left a very wide field for the imagination of those who chose to invent one for her the common story and the one which on the whole was the nearest to the truth told that she was the daughter of a noble of eastern bohemia who had died soon after her birth the last of his family having converted his ancestral possessions into money for unorna's benefit in order to destroy all trace of her relationship to him the secret must of course have been confined to some one but it had been kept faithfully and unorna herself was no wiser than those who mused themselves with fruitless speculations regarding her origin if from the first 
from the moment when as a young girl she left the convent to enter into possession of her fortune she had chosen to assert some right to a footing in the most exclusive aristocracy in the world it is not impossible that the protection of the abbess might have helped her to obtain it the secret of her birth would however have rendered a marriage with a man of that class all but impossible and would have entirely excluded her from the only other position considered dignified for a well-born woman of fortune unmarried and wholly without living relations or connections that of a lady canoness on the crown foundation moreover her wild bringing up and the singular natural gifts she possessed and which she could not resist the impulse to exercise had in a few months placed her in a position from which no escape was possible so long as she continued to live in prague and against those few chiefly men who for her beauty's sake or out of curiosity would gladly have made her acquaintance she raised an impassable barrier of pride and reserve nor was her reputation altogether an evil one she lived in a strange fashion it is true but the very fact of her extreme seclusion had kept her name free from stain if people spoke of her as the witch it was more from habit and half in jest than in earnest in strong contradiction to the cruelty which she could exercise ruthlessly when roused to anger was her well-known kindness to the poor and her charities to institutions founded for their benefit were in reality considerable and were said to be boundless these explanations seem necessary in order to account for the readiness with which she turned to the convent when she was in danger and for the facilities which were then what at once offered her for a stay long or short as she could please to make it some of the more suspicious nuns looked grave when they heard that she was under their roof others again had been attracted to her during the time she had formerly spent with them and there was not lacking those who disapproving of her presence held her peace in the anticipation that the rich and eccentric lady would on departing present a gift of value to their order the rooms which were kept at the disposal of ladies desiring to make a religious retreat for a short time were situated on the first floor of one wing of the convent overlooking a garden which was not within the cloistered precincts but which were cultivated for the convenience of the nuns who themselves never entered it the windows on this side were not latticed and the ladies who occupied the apartments were at liberty to look out upon the small square of land for their view of the street beyond being cut off however by a wall in which there was one iron gate for the convenience of the gardeners who were thus not obliged to pass through the main entrance of the convent in order to reach their work within the rooms all opened out upon a broad vaulted corridor lighted in the daytime by a huge arch window looking upon an inner court and at night by a single lamp suspended in the middle of the passage by a strong iron chain the pavement of this passage was of broad stones once smooth and even but now worn and made irregular by long use the rooms for the guests were carpeted with sombre colours and warmed by high stoves built up of glazed white tiles the furniture as it has been said was simple but afforded all that was strictly necessary for ordinary comfort each apartment consisting of a bedroom and a sitting-room small in lateral dimensions but relatively very high the walls were thick and not easily penetrated by any sounds from without and as in many religious houses the entrance from the quarter were all closed by double doors the outer one of strong oak with a lock and solid bolt 
the inner one of lighter material but thickly padded to exclude sound as well as currents of cold air each sitting-room contained a table a sofa three or four chairs a small bookshelf and a praying stool provided with a hard and well-worn cushion for the knees over this a brown wooden crucifix was hung upon the gray wall in the majority of convents it is not usual nor even permissible for ladies in retreat to descend to the nuns refectory when there are many guests they are usually served by lay sisters in a hall set apart for the purpose when there are few their simple meals are brought to them in their rooms moreover they are of course put on no religious robe though they dress themselves in black in the church or chapel as the case may be they do not take places within the lattice choir with the sisters but either sit in the body of the building or occupy a side chapel reserved for their use or else perform their devotions kneeling at high windows above the choir which communicate within with rooms accessible from the convent it is usual for them to attend mass vespers the benediction and complines but when there are midnight services they are not expected to be present unorna was familiar with convent life and was aware that the benediction was over and that the hour for the evening meal was approaching a fire had been lighted in her sitting-room but the air was still very cold and she sat wrapped in her furs as when she had arrived leaning back in a corner of the sofa her head inclined forward and one white hand resting on the green baize cloth which covered the table she was very tired and the absolute stillness was refreshing and restoring after the long drawn-out emotions of the stormy day never in her short and passionate life had so many events been crowded into the space of a few hours since the morning she had felt almost everything that her wild high-strung nature was capable of feeling love triumph failure humiliation anger hate despair and the danger of sudden death she was amazed when looking back she remembered that at noon on that day her life and all its interests had been stationary at the point familiar to her during a whole month the point that still lay within the boundaries of hope's kingdom the point at which the man she loved had wounded her by speaking of brotherly affection and sisterly regard she could almost believe when she thought of it all that someone had done to her as she had done to others that she had been cast into a state of sleep and had been forced against her will to live through the storms of years in the lethargy of an hour and yet despite all her memory was distinct her faculties were awake her intellect had lost none of its clearness even in the last and worst hour of all she could recall each look on the wanderer's face each tone of his cold speech each intonation of her own passionate outpourings her strong memory had retained all and there was not the slightest break in the continuity of her recollections but there was little comfort to be derived from the certainty that she had not been dreaming and that everything had really taken place precisely as she remembered it she would have given all she possessed which was much to return to the hour of noon on that same day in so far as a very unruly nature can understand itself unorna understood the springs of the action she regretted and confessed that in all likelihood she would do again as she had done at each successive stage 
indeed since the last great outbreak of her heart she realized more than ever the great proportions which her love had of late assumed and she saw that she was indeed ready as she had said to dare everything and risk everything for the sake of obtaining the very least show of passion in return it was quite clear to her since she had failed so totally that she should have had patience that she ought to have accepted gratefully the man's offer of brotherly devotion and trusted in time to bring about a further and less platonic development but she was equally sure that she could never have found the patience and that if she had restrained herself to-day she would have given way to-morrow she possessed all the blind indifference to consequences which is a chief characteristic of the slav nature when dominated by passion she had shown it in her rash readiness to face israel kafka at the moment of leaving her own home if she could not have had what she longed for she cared as little what became of her as she cared for kafka's own fate she had but one object one passion one desire and to all else her indifference was supreme life and death in this world or the next were less weighty than feathers in a scale that measured hundreds of tons the very idea of balance for the moment beyond her imagination for a while indeed the pride of a woman at once young beautiful and accustomed to authority had kept her firm in the determination to be loved for herself as she believed that she deserved to be loved and just so long as that remained she had held her head high confidently expecting that the mask of indifference would soon be shivered that the eyes she adored would soften with warm light that the hand she worshipped would tremble suddenly as though wakening to life within her own but that pride was gone and from its disappearance there had been but one step to most utter degradation of soul to which a woman can descend and from that again but one step more to a resolution almost stupid in its hardened obstinacy but as though to show how completely she was dominated by the man whom she could not win even her last determination had yielded under the slightest pressure from his will she had left her house beside him with the mad resolve never again to be parted from him cost what it might reputation fortune life itself and yet ten minutes had not elapsed before she found herself alone trusting to a mere word of his for the hope of ever seeing him again she seemed to have no individuality left he had spoken and she had obeyed he had commanded and she had done his bidding she was even more ashamed of this than of having wept and sobbed and dragged herself at his feet in the first moment she had submitted deluding herself with the idea she had expressed that he was consigning her to a prison and that her freedom was dependent on his will the foolish delusion vanished she saw that she was free when she chose to descend the steps she had just mounted to go out through the gate she had lately entered and to go whithersoever she would at the mere risk of meeting israel kafka and that risk she heartily despised being thoroughly brave by nature and utterly indifferent to death by force of circumstance she comforted herself with the thought that the wanderer would come to her once at least when she was pleased to send for him she had that loyal belief inseparable from true love until violently overthrown by irrefutable evidence and which sometimes has such power as to return even then overthrowing the evidence of the senses themselves are there not men who trust women and women who trust men in spite of the vilest betrayals love is indeed often the inspirer of subjective visions creating in the beloved objects the qualities it admires and virtues it adores 
powerless to accept what is not willing to see dwelling in a fortress guided by intangible and therefore indestructible fiction and proof against the artillery of facts unorna's confidence was however not misplaced the man whose promise she had received had told the truth when he had said that she had never broken any promise whatsoever in this at least there was therefore comfort on the morrow she would see him again the moment of complete despair had passed when she had received that assurance from his lips and as she thought of it sitting in the absolute stillness of her room the proportions of the storm grew less and possible dimensions of a future hope greater just as the seafarer when his ship lies in a flat calm of the oily harbour thinks half incredulously of the danger past despises himself for the anxiety he felt and vows that on the morrow he will face the waves again though the winds blow ever so fiercely in unorna the master passion was as strong as ever in a dim vision the wreck of her pride floated still in the stormy distance but she turned her eyes away for it was no longer a part of her the spectre of her humiliation rose up and tried to taunt her with her shame she almost smiled at the thought that she could still remember it he lived she lived and he should yet be hers as her physical weariness began to disappear in the absolute quiet and rest her determination revived her power was not all gone yet on the morrow she would see him again she might still fix her eyes on his and in an unguarded moment cast him into a deep sleep she remembered that look on his face in the old cemetery she had guessed rightly it had been for the faint memory of beatrice but she would bring it back again and it should be for her for he should never wake again had she not done as much with the ancient scholar who for long years had lain in her room in that mysterious state who obeyed when she commanded him to rise and walk to eat to speak why not the wanderer then to outward eyes he would be alive and awake calm natural happy and yet he would be sleeping in that condition at least she could command his actions his thoughts and his words how long could it be made to last she did not know nature might rebel in the end and throw off the yoke of the heavily imposed will an interval might follow full again of storm and passion and despair but it would pass and he would again fall under her influence she had read and keyork arabian had told her of the marvels done every day by physicians of common power in the great hospitals and universities of the empire and elsewhere throughout europe none of them appeared to be men of extraordinary natural gifts their powers were but weakness compared with hers even with miserable hysteric women they often had to try again and again before they could produce the hypnotic sleep for the first time when they had got as far as that indeed they could bring their learning their science and their experience to bear and they could make foolish experiments familiar to unorna from her childhood as the sights and sounds of her daily life few if any of them had even the power necessary to hypnotize an ordinary strong man in health she on the contrary had never failed in that and at the first trial except with keyork arabian a man of whom she said in her heart half in jest and half superstitiously that he was not a man at all but a devil or a monster of over whom earthly influences had no control all her energy returned the colour came back to her face her eyes sparkled her strong white hands contracted and opened and closed again as though she would grasp something the room too had become warmer and she had forgotten to lay aside her furs 
she longed for more air and rising walked across the room it occurred to her that the great corridor would be deserted and as quiet as her own apartment and she went out and began to pace the stone flags her head high looking straight before her she wished that she had him there now and she was angry at the thought that she had not seen earlier how easy it could all be done however strong he might be having twice been under her influence before he could not escape it again in those moments when they had stood together before the great dark buildings of the clementium it might all have been accomplished and now she must wait until the morning but her mind was determined it mattered not how it mattered not in what state he should be hers no one would know what she had done it was nothing to her that he would be wholly unconscious of his past life had she not already made him forget the most important part of it he would still be himself and yet he would love her and speak lovingly to her and act as she would have him act everything could be done and she would risk nothing for she would marry him and make him her lawful husband and they would spend their lives together in peace in the house wherein she had so abased herself before him foolishly believing that as a mere woman she could win him she paced the corridor passing and repassing beneath the light of the single lamp that hung in the middle walking quickly with a sensation of pleasure in the movement and in the cold draught that fanned her cheek then she heard footsteps distinct from the echo of her own and she stood still two women were coming towards her through the gloom she waited near her own door supposing that they would pass her as they came near she saw that the one was a nun habited in the plain grey robe and black and white headdress of the order the other was a lady dressed like herself in black the light burned so badly that as the two stopped and stood for a moment conversing together unorna could not clearly distinguish their faces then the lady entered one of the rooms the third or fourth from unorna's and the nun remained standing outside apparently hesitating whether to turn to the right or to the left or asking herself in which direction her occupations called her unorna made a movement and at the sound of her foot the nun came towards her sister paul unorna exclaimed recognizing her as her face came under the glare of the lamp and holding out her hands unorna cried the nun with an intonation of surprise and pleasure i did not know that you were here what brings you back to us a caprice sister paul nothing but a caprice i shall perhaps be gone to-morrow i am sorry answered the sister one night is but a short retreat from the world she shook her head rather sadly much may happen in a night replied unorna with a smile you used to tell me that the soul knew nothing of time have you changed your mind come into my room and let us talk i have not forgotten your hours you can have nothing to do for the moment unless it is supper time we have just finished said sister paul entering readily enough the other lady who is staying here insisted upon supping in the guest's refectory out of curiosity perhaps poor thing and i met her on the stairs as she was coming up are she and i the only ones here unorna asked carelessly yes there is no one else and she only came this morning you see it is still the carnival season in the world it is in lent that the great ladies come to us and then we have often not a room free the nun smiled sadly shaking her head again in a way that seemed habitual with her after all she added as unorna said nothing it is better that they should come then rather than not at all 
though I often think it would be better still if they spent carnival in the convent and Lent in the world. The world you speak of would be a gloomy place if you had the ordering of it, Sister Paul, observed Yornorna with a little laugh. Ah, oh, well, I dare say it would seem so to you. I know little enough of the world as you understand it, save for what our guests tell me and indeed i am glad that i do not know more you know almost as much as i do the sister looked long and earnestly into unorna's face as though searching for something she was a thin pale woman over forty years of age not a wrinkle marked her waxen skin and her hair was entirely concealed under the smooth headdress but her age was in her eyes what is your life unorna she asked suddenly we hear strange tales of it sometimes though we know also that you do great works of charity but we hear strange tales and strange words do you unorna suppressed a smile of scorn what do people say of me i never ask strange things strange things repeated the nun with a shake of the head what are they tell me one of them as an instance i should fear to offend you indeed i am sure i should though we were good friends once and still are the more reason why you should tell me what is said of course i am alone in the world and people will always tell vile tales of women who have no one to protect them no no sister paul hastened to assure her as a woman no word has reached us that touches your fair name on the contrary i have heard worldly women say much more that is good of you in that respect than they will say of each other but there are other things unorna other things which fill me with fear for you they call you by a name which makes me shudder when i hear it a name repeated unorna in surprise and with considerable curiosity a name a word what you will no i cannot tell you and besides it must be untrue unorna was silent for a moment and then understood she laughed aloud with perfect unconcern i know she cried how foolish of me they call me the witch of course sister paul's face grew very grim and she immediately crossed herself devoutly looking askant at unorna as she did so but unorna only laughed again perhaps it is very foolish said the nun but i cannot bear to hear such a thing said of you it is not said in earnest do you know why they call me the witch it is very simple it is because i can make people sleep people who are suffering or mad or in great sorrow and then they rest that is all my magic you can put people to sleep anybody sister paul opened her faded eyes very wide but that is not natural she added in a perplexed tone and what is not natural cannot be right and is all right that is natural asked unorna thoughtfully it is not natural repeated the other how do you do it do you use strange words and herbs and incantations unorna laughed again but the nun seemed shocked by her levity and she forced herself to be grave no indeed she answered i look into their eyes and tell them to sleep and they do poor sister paul you are behind the age in the dear old convent here the thing is done in half of the great hospitals of europe every day and men and women are cured in that way of diseases that paralyze them in body as well as in mind men study to learn how it is done it is as common to-day as a means of healing as the medicines you know by name and taste it's called hypnotism again the sister crossed herself i have heard the word i think she said as though she thought there might be something diabolical in it and do you heal the sick in this way by means of this thing sometimes unorna answered 
there is an old man for instance whom i have kept alive for many years by making him sleep a great deal unorna smiled a little but you have no words with it nothing nothing it is my will that is all but if it is of good and not of the evil one there should be a prayer with it could you not say a prayer with it unorna i dare say i could replied the other trying not to laugh but that would be doing two things at once my will would be weakened it cannot be of good said the nun it is not natural and it is not true that the prayer can distract the will from the performance of a good deed she shook her head more energetically than usual and is it not good either that you should be called a witch you who have lived here among us it is not my fault exclaimed unorna somewhat annoyed by her persistence and besides sister paul even if the devil is in it it would be all right all the same the nun held up her hands in holy horror and her jaw dropped my child my child how can you say such things to me it is very true unorna answered quietly smiling at her amazement if people who are ill are made well is it not real good even if the evil one does it it is not good to make him do good if one can even against his will no no cried sister paul in great distress do not talk like that let us not talk of it at all whatever it is it is bad and i do not understand it and i am sure that none of us here could no matter how well you explain it but if you do it unorna my dear child then say a prayer each time against temptation and the devil's works with that the good nun crossed herself a third time and unconsciously from force of habit began to tell her beads with one hand mechanically smoothing her broad starched collar with the other unorna was silent for a few minutes plucking at the sable lining of the cloak which lay beside her upon the sofa where she had dropped it let us talk of other things she said at last talk of the other lady who is here who is she what brings her here into retreat at this time of year poor thing yes she is very unhappy answered sister paul it is a sad story so far as i have heard it her father is just dead and she is alone in the world the abbess received a letter yesterday from the cardinal archbishop requesting that we would receive her and this morning she came his eminence knew her father it appears she is only to be here for a short time i believe until her relations come to take her home to her own country her father was taken ill in a country place near the city which he had hired for the shooting season and the poor girl was left all alone out there the cardinal thought that she would be safer and perhaps less unhappy with us while she is waiting of course said unorna with a faint interest how old is she poor child she is not a child she must be five and twenty years old though perhaps her sorrow makes her look older than she is and what is her name beatrice i cannot remember the name of the family unorna started end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the witch of prague a fantastic tale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada the witch of prague a fantastic tale by francis marion crawford chapter nineteen what is it asked the nun noticing unorna's sudden movement nothing 
the name of beatrice is familiar to me that is all it suggested something though sister paul was as unworldly as five-and-twenty years of cloistered life can make a woman who is naturally simple in mind and devout in thought she possessed the faculty of quick observation which is learned as readily and exercised perhaps as constantly in the midst of a small community where each member is in some measure dependent upon all the rest for the daily pittance of ideas as in wider spheres of life you may have seen this lady or you may have heard of her she said i would like to see her unorna answered thoughtfully she was thinking of all the possibilities in the case she remembered the clearness and precision of the wanderer's first impression when he first told her how he had seen beatrice in the tien kirch and she reflected that the name was a very uncommon one the beatrice of his story too had a father and no other relation and was supposed to be travelling with him but the uncertain light in the corridor unorna had not been able to distinguish the lady's features but the impression she had received had been that she was dark as beatrice was there was no reason in the nature of things why this should not be the woman whom the wanderer loved it was natural enough that being left alone in a strange city at such a moment she should have sought refuge in a convent and this being admitted it followed that she was naturally had been advised to retire to one in which unorna found herself it being the one in which ladies were most frequently received as guests unorna could hardly trust herself to speak she was conscious that sister paul was watching her and she turned her face from the lamp there can be no difficulty about your seeing her or talking with her if you wish it said the nun she told me that she would be at the compline at nine o'clock if you were there yourself you can see her come in and watch her when she goes out do you think you have ever seen her no answered unorna in an odd tone i am sure that i have not sister paul concluded from unorna's manner that she must have reason to believe that the guest was identical with someone of whom she had heard very often her manner was abstracted and she seemed ill at ease but that might be the result of fatigue are you not hungry asked the nun you have had nothing since you came i am sure no yes it is true answered unorna i had forgotten it would be very kind of you to send me something sister paul rose with alacrity to unorna's great relief i will see to it she said holding out her hand we shall meet in the morning good night good night dear sister paul will you say a prayer for me she added the question suddenly by an impulse of which she was hardly conscious indeed i will with all my heart my dear child answered the nun looking earnestly into her face you are not happy in your life she added with a slow sad movement of her head no i am not happy but i will be i fear not said sister paul almost under her breath as she went out softly unorna was left alone she could not sit still in her extreme anxiety it was agonizing to think that the woman she longed to see was so near her but that she could not upon any reasonable pretext go and knock at her door and see her and speak to her she felt also the terrible doubt as to whether she would recognize her at first sight as the same woman whose shadow had passed between herself and the wanderer on that eventful day a month ago the shadow had been veiled but she had a prescient consciousness of the features beneath the veil nevertheless she might be mistaken it would be necessary to seek her acquaintance by some excuse and endeavour to draw from her some portion of her story 
enough to confirm Unorna's suspicions, or to prove conclusively that they were unfounded. To do this, Unorna herself needed all her strength and coolness, and she was glad when a lay sister entered the room bringing her evening meal. There were moments when Unorna, in favorable circumstances, was able to sink into the so-called state of second sight by an act of volition, and she wished now that she could close her eyes and see the face of the woman who was only separated from her by two or three walls. But that was not possible in this case. To be successful, she would have needed some sort of guiding thread or she must have already known the person she wished to see. She could not command that inexplicable condition as she could dispose of her other powers, at all times and in almost all moods. She felt that if she were at present capable of falling into the trance state at all, her mind would wander uncontrolled in some other direction. There was nothing to be done but to have patience. The lay sister went out. Unorna ate mechanically what had been set before her and waited. She felt that a crisis perhaps more terrible than that through which she had lately passed was at hand. If the stranger should prove to be indeed the Beatrice whom the wanderer loved, her brain was in a whirl when she thought of being brought face to face with the woman who had been before her and every cruel and ruthless instinct of her nature rose and took shape in plans for her rival's destruction she opened her door careless of the draught of frozen air that rushed in from the corridor she wished to hear the lady's footsteps when she left her room to go to the church and she sat down and remained motionless fearing lest her own footfall should prevent the sound from reaching her the heavy-toned bells began to ring far off in the night at last it came the opening of a door the slight noise made by a light tread upon the pavement she rose quietly and went out following in the same direction she could see nothing but a dark shadow moving before her towards the opposite end of the passage farther and farther from the hanging lamp unorna could hear her own heart beating as she followed first to the right then to the left there was another light at this point the lady had noticed that someone was coming behind her and turned her head to look back the delicate dark profile stood out clearly unorna held her breath walking swiftly forward but in a moment the lady went on and entered the chapel-like room from which a great balconied window looked down into the church above the choir as unorna went in she saw her kneeling upon one of the stools her hands folded her head inclined her eyes closed a black veil loosely thrown over her still blacker hair and falling down upon her shoulder without hiding her face Unorna sank upon her knees, compressing her lips to restrain the incoherent exclamation that almost broke from them in spite of her, clasping her hands desperately, so that the faint blue veins stood out upon the marble surface. Below, hundreds of candles blazed upon the altar in the choir and sent their full yellow radiance up to the faces of the two women as they knelt there almost side by side both young both beautiful but utterly unlike in a single glance unorna had understood that it was true at arm's length separated from her from the rival whose very existence made her own happiness an utter impossibility with unchanging unwilling gaze she examined every detail of that beauty which the wanderer had so loved that even when forgotten there was no sight in his eyes for other women it was indeed such a face as a man would find it hard to forget unorna seeing the reflection of it in the wanderer's mind had fancied it otherwise though she could not but recognize the reality from the impression she had received she had imagined it more ethereal more faint more sexless 
more angelic and she had seen it in her thoughts divine it was but womanly beyond unorna's own dark delicately aquiline tall and noble the purity it expressed was of earth and not of heaven it was not transparent for there was life in every feature it was sad indeed almost beyond human sadness but it was sad with the mortal sorrows of this world not with the unfathomable melancholy of a suffering saint the lips were human womanly pure and tender but not formed for speech of prayer alone the drooping lids not drawn but darkened with faint uneven shadows by the flow of many tears were slowly lifted now and again disclosing a vision of black eyes not meant for endless weeping nor made so deep and warm only to strain their sight towards heaven above forgetting earth below unorna knew that those same eyes could gleam and flash and blaze with love and hate and anger that under the rich pale skin the blood could rise and ebb with the changing tide of the heart the warm lips could part with passion and moving form words of love she saw pride in the wide sensitive nostrils strength in the even brow and queenly dignity in the perfect poise of the head upon the slender throat and the clasped hands were womanly too neither full and white and heavy like those of a marble statue as unorna's were nor thin and oversensitive like those of a holy woman in old pictures but real and living delicate in outline but not without nervous strength hands that might linger in another's not wholly passive but all responsive to the thrill of a loving touch it was very hard to bear a better woman than unorna might have felt something evil and cruel and hating in her heart at the sight of so much beauty in one who held her place in the queen of the kingdom where she longed to reign unorna's cheek grew very pale and her unlike eyes were fierce and dangerous it was well for her that she could not speak to beatrice then for she wore no mask and the dark beauty would have seen the danger of death in the face of the fair and would have turned and defended herself in time but the sweet singing of the nuns came softly up from below echoing to the groined roof rising and falling high and low and the full radiance of the many waxen tapers shone steadily from the great altar gilding and warming statue and cornice and ancient moulding and casting deep shadows into all the places that it could not reach and still the two women knelt in their high balcony the one wrapped in fervent prayer the other wondering that the presence of such hatred as hers should have no power to kill and all the time making a supreme effort to compose her own features into the expression of friendly sympathy and interest which she knew she would need so soon as the singing ceased and it was time to leave the church again the psalms were finished there was a pause and then the words of the ancient hymn floated up to unorna's ears familiar in years gone by almost unconsciously she herself by force of old habit joined in the first verse then suddenly she stopped not realizing indeed the horrible gulf that lay between the words that passed her lips and the thoughts that were at work in her heart but silenced by the near sound of a voice less rich and full but far more exquisite and tender than her own beatrice was singing too with joined hands and parted lips and upturned face let dreams be far and phantasms of the night bind thou our foe sang beatrice in long sweet notes unorna heard no more the light dazzled her and the blood beat in her heart it seemed as though no prayer that was ever prayed could be offered up more directly against herself and the voice that sang it 
though not loud had a rare power of carrying every syllable distinctly in its magic tones even to a great distance as she knelt it was as if beatrice had been even nearer and had breathed the words into her very ear afraid to look round lest her face should betray her emotion unorna glanced down at the kneeling nuns she started sister paul alone of them all was looking up her faded eyes fixed on unorna's with a look that implored and yet despaired her clasped hands a little raised from the low desk before her most evidently offering up the words with the whole fervent intention of her pure soul as an intercession for your Narna's sins for one moment the strong cruel heart almost wavered not through fear but under the nameless impression that sometimes takes holds of men and women the divine voice beside her seemed to dominate the hundred voices below the nun's despairing look chilled for one instant all her love and all her hatred so that she longed to be alone away from it all and forever but the hymn ended the voice was silent and sister paul's glance turned again towards the altar the moment was past and unorna was again what she had been before then followed the cantissel the voice of the prioress in the versicles after that and the voices of the nuns no longer singing as they had made the responses the creed a few more versicles and responses the short final prayers and all was over from the church below came up the soft sound that many women make when they move silently together the nuns were passing out in their appointed order beatrice remained kneeling a few moments longer crossed herself and then rose at the same moment unorna was on her feet the necessity for immediate action at all costs restored the calm to her face and the tactful skill to her actions she reached the door first and then half turning her head stood aside as though to give beatrice precedence in passing beatrice glanced at her face for the first time and then by a courteous movement of the head signified that unorna should go out first unorna appeared to hesitate beatrice to protest both women smiled a little and unorna with a gesture of submission passed through the doorway she had managed it so well that it was almost impossible to avoid speaking as they threaded the long corridors together unorna allowed a moment to pass as though to let her companion understand the slight awkwardness of the situation and then addressed her in a tone of quiet and natural civility we seem to be the only ladies in retreat she said yes beatrice answered even in that one syllable something of the quality of her thrilling voice vibrated for an instant they walked a few steps farther in silence i am not exactly in retreat she said presently either because she felt that it would be almost rude to say nothing or because she felt her position to be clearly understood i am waiting here for someone who is to come for me it is a very quiet place to rest in said unorna i'm fond of it you often come here perhaps not now answered unorna but i was here for a long time when i was very young by a common instinct as they fell into conversation they began to walk more slowly side by side indeed said beatrice with a slight increase of interest then you were brought up here by the nuns not exactly it was a sort of refuge for me when i was almost a child i was left here alone until i was thought old enough to take care of myself there was a little bitterness in her tone intentional but masterly in its truth to nature left by your parents beatrice asked the question seemed almost inevitable i had none i never knew a father or a mother unorna's voice grew sad with each syllable they had entered the great corridor in which their apartments were situated and were approaching beatrice's door 
they walked more and more slowly in silence during the last few moments after unorna had spoken unorna sighed the passing breath travelling on the air of the lonely place seemed both to invite and to offer sympathy my father died last week beatrice said in a very low tone that was not quite steady i am quite alone here and in the world she laid her hand upon the latch and her deep black eyes rested upon unorna's as though almost but not quite conveying an invitation hungry for human comfort yet too proud to ask it i am very lonely too said unorna may i sit with you for a while she had but just time to make the bold stroke that was necessary in another moment she knew that beatrice would have disappeared within her heart beat violently until the answer came she had been successful will you indeed beatrice exclaimed i am a poor company but i shall be very glad if you will come in she opened her door and unorna entered the apartment was almost exactly like her own in size and shape and furniture but it already had the air of being inhabited there were books upon the table and a square jewel case and an old silver frame containing a large photograph of a stern dark man in middle age beatrice's father as unorna at once understood cloaks and furs lay in some confusion upon the chairs a large box stood with a lid raised against the wall displaying a quantity of lace among which lay silks and ribbons of soft colours i only came this morning beatrice said as though to apologise for the disorder unorna sank down in a corner of the sofa shading her eyes from the bright lamp with her hand she could not help looking at beatrice but she felt that she must not let her scrutiny be too apparent nor her conversation too eager beatrice was proud and strong and could doubtless be very cold and forbidding when she chose and do you expect to be here long unorna asked as beatrice established herself at the other end of the sofa i cannot tell was the answer i may be here but a few days or i may have to stay a month i lived here for years said unorna thoughtfully i suppose it would be impossible now i should die of apathy and inanition she laughed in a subdued way as though respecting beatrice's mourning but i was young then she added suddenly withdrawing her hand from her eyes so that the full light of the lamp fell upon her she chose to show that she too was beautiful and she knew that beatrice had as yet hardly seen her face as they passed through the gloomy corridors it was an instant of vanity and yet for her purpose it was a right one the effect was sudden and unexpected and beatrice looked at her almost fixedly in undisguised admiration young then she said you are young now less young than i was then unorna answered with a little sigh followed instantly by a smile i am five-and-twenty said beatrice woman enough to try and force a confession from her new acquaintance are you i would not have thought it we are nearly of an age quite perhaps for i'm not yet twenty-six but then it's not the years she stopped suddenly beatrice wondered whether unorna were married or not considering the age she admitted and her extreme beauty it seemed probable that she must be it occurred to her that the acquaintance had been made without any presentation and that neither knew the other's name since i'm a little the younger she said i shall tell you who i am unorna made a slight movement she was on the point of saying that she knew already and too well i am beatrice varanger i am unorna she could not help a sort of cold defiance that sounded in her tone as she pronounced the only name she could call hers unorna beatrice repeated 
courteously enough but with an air of surprise yes that is all it seems strange to you they call me so because i was born in february in the month we call unor indeed it is strange and so is my story though it would have little interest for you forgive me you are wrong it would interest me immensely if you would tell me a little of it but i am such a stranger to you i do not feel as though you are that unorna answered with a very gentle smile you are very kind to say so said beatrice quietly unorna was perfectly well aware that it must seem strange to say the least of it that she should tell beatrice the wild story of her life when they had as yet exchanged barely a hundred words but she cared little what beatrice thought provided that she could interest her she had a distinct intention of making the time slip by unnoticed until it should be late she related her history so far as it was known to herself simply and graphically substantially as it had been already set forth but with an abundance of anecdote and comment which enhanced the interest and at the same time extended its limits interspersing her monologues with remarks which called for an answer and which served as tests of her companion's attention she hinted but lightly at her possession of unusual powers over animals and spoke not at all of the influence she could exert upon people beatrice listened eagerly she could have told on her part that for years her own life had been dull and empty and that it was long since she had talked with any one who had so roused her interest at last unorna was silent she had reached the period of her life which had begun a month before that time and at that point her story ended then you are not married beatrice's tone expressed an interrogation and a certain surprise no said unorna i am not married and you if i may ask beatrice started visibly it had not occurred to her that the question might seem a natural one for unorna to ask although she had said that she was alone in the world unorna might have supposed her to have lost her husband but unorna could see that it was not surprise alone that had startled her the question as she knew it must had roused a deep and painful train of thought no said beatrice in an altered voice i am not married i shall never marry a short silence followed during which she turned her face away i have pained you said unorna with profound sympathy and regret forgive me how could i be so tactless how could you know beatrice asked simply not attempting to deny the suggestion but unorna was suffering too she had allowed herself to imagine that in the long years which had passed beatrice might perhaps have forgotten it had even crossed her mind that she might indeed be married but in the few words and in the tremor that accompanied them as well as in the increased pallor of beatrice's face she detected a love not less deep and constant and unforgotten than the wanderer's own forgive me unorna repeated i might have guessed i have loved too she knew that here at least she could not feign and she could not control her voice but with supreme judgment of the effect she allowed herself to be carried beyond all reserve in the one short sentence her whole passion expressed itself genuine deep strong ruthless she let the words come as they would and beatrice was startled by the passionate cry that burst from the heart so wholly unrestrained for a long time neither spoke again and neither looked at the other to all appearances beatrice was the first to regain her self-possession and then all at once the words came to her lips which could be restrained no longer for years she had kept silent for there had been no one to whom she could speak for years she had sought him as best she could as he had sought her fruitlessly and at last hopelessly 
and she had known that her father was seeking him also everywhere that he might drag her to the ends of the earth at the mere suspicion of the wanderer's presence in the same country it had amounted to madness with him of the kind not seldom seen beatrice might marry whom she pleased but not the one man she loved day by day and year by year their two strong wills had been silently opposed and neither the one nor the other had ever been unconscious of the struggle nor had either yielded a hair's breadth but beatrice had been at her father's mercy for he could take her whether he would and in that she could not resist him never in that time had she lost face in the devotion of the man she sought and at last it was only in the belief that he was dead that she could discover an explanation of his failure to find her still she would not change and still through the years she loved more and more truly and passionately and unchangingly the feeling that she was in the presence of a passion as great as unhappy and as masterful as her own unloosed her tongue such things happen in this strange world men and women of deep and strong feelings outwardly cold reserved taciturn and proud have been known once in their lives to pour out the secrets of their hearts to a stranger or a mere acquaintance as they could never have done to a friend beatrice seemed scarcely conscious of what she was saying or of unorna's presence the words long kept back and sternly restrained fell with a strange strength from her lips and they were not one of them from first to last that did not sheathe itself like a sharp knife in unorna's heart the enormous jealousy of beatrice which had been growing within her besides her love during the last month was reaching the climax of its overwhelming magnitude she hardly knew when beatrice ceased speaking for the words were still all ringing in her ears and clashing madly in her own breast and prompting her fierce nature to do some violent deed but beatrice looked for no sympathy and did not see unorna's face she had forgotten unorna herself at the last and she sat staring at the opposite wall then she rose quickly and taking something from the jewel box thrust it into unorna's hands i cannot tell why i have told you but i have you shall see him too what does it matter we have both loved we are both unhappy we shall never meet again what is it unorna tried to ask holding the closed case in her hands she knew what was within it well enough and her self-command was forsaking her it was almost more than she could bear it was as though beatrice was wreaking vengeance on her instead of her destroying her rival as she had meant to do sooner or later beatrice took the thing from her opened it gazed at it a moment and put it again into unorna's hands it was like him she said watching her companion as though to see what effect the portrait would produce then she shrank back unorna was looking at her her face was livid and unnaturally drawn and the extraordinary contrast in the colour of her two eyes were horribly apparent the one seemed to freeze the other to be on fire the strongest and worst passions that can play upon the human soul were all expressed with awful force in the distorted mask and not a trace of the magnificent beauty so lately there was visible beatrice shrank back in horror you know him she cried half guessing at the truth i know him and i love him said unorna slowly and fiercely her eyes fixed on her enemy and gradually leaning towards her so as to bring her face near and near to beatrice the dark woman tried to rise and could not there were worse than anger or hatred or the intent to kill in those dreadful eyes there was a fascination from which no living thing could escape she tried to scream 
to shut out the vision to raise her hand as a screen before it nearer and nearer it came and she could feel the warm breath of it upon her cheek then her brain reeled her limbs relaxed and her head fell back against the wall i know him and i love him were the last words beatrice heard End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Georgia Bondi. London, England. GeorgiaBondi.com the Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale by Francis Marion Crawford Chapter 20 Footnote The deeds here recounted are not imaginary. Not very long ago, the sacrilege which Anorna attempted was actually committed at night in a Catholic church in London under circumstances that clearly provided the intention of some person or persons to defile the consecrated wafers a case of hypnotic suggestion to the committal of a crime in a convent occurred in hungary not many years since with a different object namely a daring robbery but precisely as here described a complete account of the case will be found with authority and evidence in a pamphlet entitled ein experimentale studie auf dem gebiet des hypnotismus by Dr. R. von Kraft Ebbing, Professor of Psychiatry and for Nervous Diseases in University of Graz, 2nd edition, Stuttgart, Ferdinand, Enk, 1889. It is not possible in a work of fiction to quote learned authorities at every chapter, but it may be said here, and once for all, that all the most important situations have been taken from cases which have come under medical observation within the last few years. End of footnote. Anorna was hardly conscious of what she had done. She had not the intention of making Beatrice sleep, for she had no distinct intention whatever at that moment. Her words and her look had been but the natural results of overstrained passion, and she repeated what she had said again and again, and gazed long and fiercely into Beatrice's face before she realised that she had unintentionally thrown her rival and enemy into the intermediate state. It is rarely that the first stage of hypnotism produces the same consequences in two individuals. In Beatrice, it took the form of total unconsciousness, as though she had merely fainted away. Anorna gradually regained her self-possession. After all, Beatrice had told her nothing which she did not either wholly know or partly guess, and her anger was not the result of the revelation, but of the way in which the story had been told. Word after word, phrase after phrase, had cut her and stabbed her to the quick. And when Beatrice had thrust the miniature into her hands, her wrath had risen in spite of herself. But now she had returned to a state in which she could think connectedly, and now that she saw Beatrice asleep before her, she did not regret what she had unwittingly done. From the first moment, in the balcony over the church, where she had realised she was in the presence of the woman she hated, she had determined to destroy her. To accomplish this, she would in any case have used her especial weapons, and though she had intended to steal by degrees upon her enemy, lulling her to sleep by a more gentle fascination, at an hour when the whole convent should be quiet, yet since the first step had been made unexpectedly, and without her will, she did not regret it. She leaned back and looked at Beatrice during several minutes, smiling to herself from time to time, scornfully and cruelly. Then she rose and locked the outer door and closed the inner one carefully. She knew from long ago that no sound could then find its way to the corridor without. She came back and sat down again, and again looked at the sleeping face, and she admitted for the hundredth time that evening that Beatrice was very beautiful. 
If he could see us now, she exclaimed aloud. The thought suggested something to her. She would like to see herself beside this woman and compare the beauty he loved with the beauty that could not touch him. It was very easy. She found a small mirror and set it upon the back of the sofa on a level with Beatrice's head. Then she changed the position of the lamp and looked at herself and touched her hair and smoothed her brow and loosened the black lace about her white throat. And she looked from herself to Beatrice and back to herself again many times. It is strange that black should suit us both so well. She so dark and I so fair, she said. She will look well when she is dead. She gazed again for many seconds at the sleeping woman. But he will not see her then, she added, rising to her feet and laying the mirror on the table. She began to walk up and down the room, as was her habit, when in deep thought, turning over in her mind the deed to be done and the surest and best way of doing it. It never occurred to her that Beatrice could be allowed to live beyond that night. If the woman had been but an unconscious obstacle in her path, and Norna would have spared her life. But as matters stood, she had no inclination to be merciful. There was nothing to prevent the possibility of a meeting between Beatrice and the Wanderer, if Beatrice remained alive. They were in the same city together, and their parts might cross at any moment. The Wanderer had forgotten, but it was not sure that the artificial forgetfulness would be proof against an actual sight of the woman once so dearly loved. The same consideration was true of Beatrice. She too might be made to forget, though it was always an experiment of uncertain issue and of more than uncertain result, even when successful so far as duration was concerned. Anorna reasoned coldly with herself, recalling all that Keyork Arabian had told her, and all that she had read. She tried to admit that Beatrice might be disposed of in some other way, but the difficulties seemed to be insurmountable. To effect such a disappearance, Anorna must find some safe place in which the wretched woman might drag out her existence undiscovered. But Beatrice was not like the old beggar who in its hundredth year had leaned against Anorna's door, unnoticed and uncared for, and had been taken in and had never been seen again. The case was different. The aged scholar, too, had been cared for as he could not have been cared for elsewhere, and in the event of an inquiry being made, he could be produced at any moment and would even afford a brilliant example of Anorna's charitable doings. But Beatrice was a stranger, and a person of some importance in the world. The Cardinal Archbishop himself had directed the nuns to receive her, and they were responsible for her safety. To spirit her away in the night would be a dangerous thing. Wherever she was to be taken, Anorna would have to lead her there alone. Anorna would herself be missed. Sister Paul already suspected that the name of witch was more than a mere appellation. There would be a search made, and suspicion might easily fall upon Anorna, who would have been obliged, of course, to conceal her enemy in her own house for lack of any other convenient place. There was no escape from the deed. Beatrice must die. Anorna could produce death in a form that could leave no trace, and it would be attributed to a weakness of the heart. Does anyone account otherwise for those sudden deaths which are no longer unfrequent in the world? A man, a woman, is to all appearances in perfect health. He or she was last seen by a friend who describes the conversation accurately and expresses astonishment at the catastrophe which followed so closely upon the visit. He or she is found alone by a servant or a third person in profound lethargy from which neither restoratives nor violent shocks upon the nerves can produce any awakening. In one hour or a few hours, it is over. There is an examination, and the authorities pronounce an ambiguous verdict. Death from syncope of the heart. Such things happen, they say, 
with a shake of the head. And indeed, they know that such things really do happen, and they suspect that they do not happen naturally, but there is no evidence, not even so much as may be detected in a clever case of vegetable poisoning. The heart has stopped beating, and death has followed. There are wise men by score today who do not ask what made it stop, but who made it stop. But they have no evidence to bring, and the new jurisprudence, which in some countries covers the cases of thefts and frauds committed under hypnotic suggestion, cannot as yet lay down a law for cases where a man has been told to die and dies from weakness of the heart. And yet it is known, and well known, that by hypnotic suggestion the pulse can be made to fall to the lowest number of beatings consistent with life, and that the temperature of a body can be commanded beforehand to stand at a certain degree, and a fraction of a degree, at a certain hour, high or low, as may be desired. Let those who do not believe read accounts of what is done from day to day in the great European seats of learning, Accounts which everyone bears the name of some man speaking with authority and responsible to the world of science for every word he speaks, and doubly so for every word he writes. A few believe in the antiquated doctrine of electric animal currents. The vast majority are firm in the belief that the influence is a moral one. All admit that whatever force or influence lies at the root of hypnotism, the effects it can produce are practically unlimited, terrible in their comprehensiveness, and almost entirely unprovided for in the scheme of modern criminal law. Anorna was sure of herself, and of her strength to perform what she contemplated. There lay the dark beauty in the corner of the sofa, where she had sat and talked so long, and told her last story, the story of her life, which was now to end. A few determined words spoken in her ear, a pressure of the hand upon the brow and the heart, and she would never wake again. She would lie there still until they found her, hour after hour, the pulse growing weaker and weaker, those delicate hands colder, the face more set. At the last, there would be a convulsive shiver of the queenly form, and that would be the end. The physicians and the authorities would come and would speak of a weakness of the heart, and there would be masses sung for her soul, and she would rest in peace. Her soul in peace. Anorna stood still. Was that to be all her vengeance upon the woman who had stood between her and happiness? Was there to be nothing but that? Nothing but the painless passing of the pure young spirit from earth to heaven? Was no one to suffer for all of Anorna's pain? It was not enough. There must be more than that, and yet what more? That was the question. What imaginable wealth of agony would be a just retribution for her existence? Anorna could lead her as she had led Israel Kafka, through the life and death of a martyr, through a life of wretchedness and a death of shame. But then the moment must come at last, since this was to be a death indeed, and her spotless soul would be beyond Nona's reach for ever. No, that was not enough. Since she could not be allowed to live, to be tormented, vengeance must follow her beyond the end of life. Anorna stood still, and an awful light of evil came into her face, a thought of which the enormity would have terrified a common being had entered her mind and taken possession of it. Beatrice was in her power. Beatrice should die in mortal sin, and her soul would be lost for ever. For a long time she did not move but stood looking down at the calm and lovely face of her sleeping enemy, devising a crime to be imposed upon her for her eternal destruction. Anorna was very superstitious, or the hideous scheme could never have presented itself to her. To her mind, the deed was everything, 
whatever it was to be. And the intention or the unconsciousness in the doing it could have nothing to do with the consequences to the soul of the doer. She made no theological distinctions. Beatrice should commit some terrible crime and should die in committing it. Then she would be lost, and the devils would do in hell the worst torment which Anorna could not do on earth. A crime, a robbery, a murder, it must be done in the convent. Norna hesitated, bending her brow and pouring in imagination over the dark catalogue of all imaginable evil. A momentary and vague terror cast its shadow on her thoughts. By some accident of connection between two ideas, her mind went back a month and reviewed as in a flash of light all that she had thought and done since that day. She could think calmly now of the deeds, which even she would not have dared then. She thought of the evening when she had cried aloud that she would give her soul to know the wanderer safe, of the quick answer that had followed, and of Keok Arabian's face. Was he a devil indeed, as she sometimes fancied? And had there been a reality and a binding meaning in that contract? Keok Arabian, he indeed possessed the key to all evil. What would he have done with Beatrice? Would he make her rob the church, murder the abbess in her sleep? Bad, but not bad enough. Anona started. A deed suggested itself, so hellish, so horrible in its enormity, so far beyond all conceivable human sin, that for one moment her brain reeled. She shuddered again and again, and groped for support, and leaned against the wall in a bodily weakness of terror. For one moment she, who feared nothing, was shaken by fear from head to foot. Her face turned white, her knees shook, her sight failed her, her teeth chattered, her lips moved hysterically. But she was strong still. The thing she had sought had come to her suddenly. She set her teeth, and she thought of it again and again, till she could face the horror of it without quaking. Is there any limit to the hardening of the human heart? The distant bells rang out the call to midnight prayer. Anorna stopped and listened. She had not known how quickly time was passing, but it was better so. She was glad it was so late, and she said so to herself. But the evil smile that was sometimes in her face was not there now. She had thought a thought that had left a mark on her forehead. Was there any reality? in that jesting contract with Keorg Arabian. She must wait before she did the deed. The nuns would go down in the lighted church and kneel and pray before the altar. It would last some time, the midnight lessons, the psalms, the prayer, and she must be sure that all was quiet, for the deed could not be done in a room where Beatrice was sleeping. She was conscious of the time now, and every minute seemed an hour, and every second was full of that one deed, done over and over again before her eyes, until every awful detail of the awful whole was stamped indelibly upon her brain. She sat down now, and leaning forwards was watching the innocent woman, and wondering how she would look when she was doing it, but she was calm now, as she had felt that she had never been in her life. Her breath came evenly, her heart beat naturally. She thought connectedly of what she was about to do, but the time seemed endless. The distant clocks chimed the half hour, three quarters, past midnight. Still, she waited. At the stroke of one, she rose from her seat and standing beside Beatrice, laid her hand upon the dark brow. A few questions, a few answers followed. She must assure herself 
that her victim was in the right state to execute minutely all her commands. Then she opened the door upon the corridor and listened. Not a sound broke the intense stillness, and all was dark. The hanging lamps had been extinguished, and the nuns had all returned from the midnight service to their cells. No one would be stirring until four o'clock, and half an hour was all that Anorna needed. She took Beatrice's hand. The dark woman rose with half-closed eyes and set features. Anorna led her out into the dark passage. It is light here, Anorna said. You can see your way, but I am blind. Take my hand, so, and lead me to the church by the nun's staircase. Make no noise. I do not know the staircase, said the sleeper in drowsy tones. Anorna knew the way well enough, but not wishing to take a light with her, she was obliged to trust herself to her victim, for whose vision there was no such thing as darkness unless Anorna willed it. Go as you went today, to the room where the balcony is, but do not enter it. The staircase is on the right of the door and leads into the choir. Go. Without hesitation, Beatrice led her out into the impenetrable gloom with a swift, noiseless footstep in the direction commanded, never wavering nor hesitating whether to turn to the right or the left, but walking as confidently as though in broad daylight. Anorna counted the turnings and knew there was no mistake. Beatrice was leading her unerringly towards the staircase. They reached it and began to descend the winding steps. Anorna, holding her leader by one hand, steadied herself with the other against the smooth curved wall, fearing at every moment lest she should stumble and fall in the total darkness. But Beatrice never faltered. To her, the way was as bright as though the noonday sun had shone before her. The stairs ended abruptly against the door. Beatrice stood still. She had received no further commands, and the impulse ceased. Draw back the bolt and take me into the church, said Anorna, who could see nothing, but who knew that the nuns fastened the door behind them when they returned into the convent. Beatrice obeyed without hesitation and led her forwards. They came out between the high carved seats of the choir, behind the high altar. The church was not quite as dark as the staircase and passages had been, and Anorna stood still for a moment. In some of the chapels, hanging lamps of silver were lighted, and their tiny flames spread a faint radiance upwards and sideways, though not downwards, sufficient to break the total obscurity to eyes accustomed for some minutes to no light at all. The church stood, too, on a little eminence in the city, where the air without was less murky and impenetrable with the night mists. And though there was no moon, the high upper windows of the nave were distinctly visible in the gloomy height, like great lancet-shaped patches of grey upon a black ground. In the dimness, all objects took vast and mysterious proportions. A huge giant reared its head against one of the pillars, crowned with a high-pointed crown, stretching out one great shadowy hand into the gloom. The tall pulpit was there as Anorna knew, and the hand was the wooden crucifix, standing out in its extended socket. The black confessionals, too, took shape, like monster nuns kneeling in their heavy hoods and veils, with their heads inclined behind the fluted pilasters, just within the circle of the feeble chapel lights. Within the choir, the deep shadows seemed to fill the carved stalls with the black ghosts of long-dead sisters, returned to their familiar seats out of the damp crypt below. The great lectern in the midst of the half-circle behind the high altar became a hideous skeleton, headless, its straight arms folded on its bony breast. The back of the high altar itself was a great throne, whereon sat in judgment a misty being of awful form, judging the dead women all through the lonely night. The stillness was appalling. Not a rat stirred. The Norna shuddered, not at what she saw, but at what she felt. 
she had reached the place, and the doing of the deed was at hand. Beatrice stood beside her erect, asleep, motionless, her dark face just outlined in the surrounding dusk. Nonna took her hand and led her forwards. She could see now, and the moment had come. She brought Beatrice before the high altar and made her stand in front of it. Then she herself went back and groped for something in the dark. It was the pair of small wooden steps upon which the priest mounts in order to open the golden door of the high tabernacle above the altar, when it is necessary to take therefrom the sacred host for the benediction, or other consecrated wafers for the administration of the communion. To all Christians of all denominations whatsoever, the bread wafer, when once consecrated, is a holy thing. To Catholics and Lutherans, there is there substantially the presence of God. No imaginable act of sacrilege can be more unpardonable than the desecration of the tabernacle and the willful defilement and the destruction of the sacred host. This was Anorna's determination. Beatrice should commit this crime against heaven and then die with the whole weight of it upon her soul. And thus should her soul itself be tormented for ever and ever to ages of ages. Considering what she believed, it is no wonder that she should have shuddered at the tremendous thought. And yet, in the distortion of her reasoning, the sin would be upon Beatrice who did the act, and not upon herself who commanded it. There was no diminution of her own faith in the sacredness of the place, and the holiness of the consecrated object. Had she been one whit less sure of that, her vengeance would have been vain, and her whole scheme meaningless. She came back out of the darkness and set the wooden steps in their place before the altar at Beatrice's feet. Then, as though to save herself from all participation in the guilt of the sacrilege which was to follow, she withdrew outside the communion rail and closed the gate behind her. Beatrice, obedient to her smallest command and powerless to move or act without her suggestion, stood as she had been placed, with her back to the church and her face to the altar. Above her head the richly wrought door of the tabernacle caught what little light there was and reflected it from its own uneven surface. Anorna paused for a moment, looked at the shadowy figure and then glanced behind her into the body of the church, not out of any ghostly fear, but to assure herself that she was alone with her victim. She saw that all was quite ready, and then she calmly knelt down just upon one side of the gate and rested her folded hands upon the marble rail. A moment of intense stillness followed. Again, the thought of Keok Arabian flashed across her mind. Had there been any reality, she vaguely wondered, in that compact made with him? What was he doing now? but the crime was to be Beatrice's, not hers. Her heart beat fast for a moment, and then she grew very calm again. The clock in the church tower chimed the first quarter past one. She was able to count the strokes, and was glad to find that she had lost no time. As soon as the long singing echo of the bells had died away, she spoke, not loudly, but clearly and distinctly. Beatrice Varanga. Go forward and mount the steps I have placed for you. The dark figure moved obediently, and Anorna heard the slight sound of Beatrice's foot upon wood. The shadowy form rose higher and higher in the gloom and stood upon the altar itself. Now, do as I command you. Open the wide door of the tabernacle. It seemed to stretch out its hand as though searching for something, and then the arm fell again to the side. Do as I command you. Norna repeated with the angry and dominant intonation that always came into her voice when she was not obeyed. Again the hand was raised for a moment, groped in the darkness and sank down into the shadow. 
Beatrice Varanga, you must do my will. I order you to open the door of the tabernacle, to take out what is within, and to throw it to the ground. Her voice rang clearly through the church. And may the crime be on your soul for ever and ever, she added in a low voice. A third time the figure moved. A strange flash of light played for a moment upon the tabernacle. The effect, Anorna thought, of the gold door being suddenly opened. But she was wrong. The figure moved indeed and stretched out a hand and moved again. A sudden crash of something very heavy falling upon stone broke the great stillness. The dark form tottered, reeled, and fell to its length upon the great altar. Anorna saw that the golden door was still closed and that Beatrice had fallen. Unable to move or act by her own free judgment, and compelled by Anorna's determined command, she had made a desperate effort to obey. Anorna had forgotten that there was a raised step upon the altar itself, and that there were other obstacles in the way, including heavy candlesticks and the framed cannon of the mass, all of which are usually set aside before the tabernacle is opened by the priest. In attempting to do as she had told, the sleeping woman had stumbled, had overbalanced herself, had clutched one of the great silver candlesticks so that it fell heavily beside her, and then, having no further support, she had fallen herself. Anorna sprang to her feet and hastily opened the gate of the railing. In a moment, she was standing by the altar at Beatrice's head. She could see that the dark eyes were open now. The great shock had recalled her to consciousness. Where am I? she asked in great distress, seeing nothing in the darkness now and groping with her hands. Sleep. Be silent and sleep said Anorna in low, firm tones, pressing her palm upon the forehead. No, no, cried the startled woman in a voice of horror. No, I will not sleep. No, do not touch me. Oh, where am I? Help, help. She was not hurt. With one strong, lithe movement, she sprang to the ground and stood with her back to the altar, her hands stretched out to defend herself from Anorna but Anorna knew what extreme danger she was in if Beatrice left the church awake and conscious of what had happened. She seized the moving arms and tried to hold them down, pressing her face forward so as to look into the dark eyes she could but faintly distinguish. It was no easy matter, however, for Beatrice was young and strong and active. Then all at once she began to see Anorna's eyes as Anorna could see hers and she felt the terrible influence stealing over her again. No, 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 she cried, struggling desperately. You shall not make me sleep. I will not. I will not. There was a flash of light again in the church, this time from behind the high altar, and the noise of quick footsteps. But neither Anorna nor Beatrice noticed the light or the sound. Then the full glow of a strong lamp fell upon the faces of both and dazzled them, and Anorna felt a cool, thin hand upon her own. Sister Paul was beside them, her face very white, and her faded eyes turning from one to the other. It was very simple. Soon after Compline was over, the nun had gone to Anorna's room, had knocked and entered. To her surprise, Anorna was not there, but Sister Paul imagined that she had lingered over her prayers and would soon return. The good nun had sat down to wait for her, and telling her beads, had fallen asleep. The unaccustomed warmth and comfort of the guest room had been too much for the weariness that constantly oppressed a constitution broken with ascetic practices. Accustomed by long habit to awake at midnight to attend the service, her eyes opened of themselves, indeed, but a full hour later than usual. She heard the clock strike one, and for a moment she could not believe her senses, then she understood that she had been asleep, and was amazed to find that Anorna had not come back. She went out hastily into the corridor. The lay sister had long ago extinguished the hanging lamp, but Sister Paul saw light streaming from Beatrice's open door. She went in and called aloud. The bed had not been touched. Beatrice was not there. Sister Paul began to think that both the ladies must have gone to the midnight service. The corridors were dark, and they might have lost their way. She took the lamp from the table and went to the balcony at which the guests performed the devotion. 
It had been her light that had flashed across the door of the tabernacle. She had looked down to the choir and far below her had seen a figure, unrecognisable from that height in the dusk of the church, but clearly the figure of a woman standing upon the altar. Visions of horror rose before her eyes of sacrilegious practices of witchcraft, for she had thought of nothing else during the whole evening. Lamp in hand, she descended the stairs to the choir and reached the altar, providentially, just in time to save Beatrice from falling a victim again to the evil fascination of the enemy who had planned the destruction of her soul as well as her body. "'What is this? What are you doing in this holy place at this hour?' asked Sister Paul solemnly and sternly. Unorna folded her arms and was silent. No possible explanation of the struggle presented itself, even to her quick intellect. She fixed her eyes on the nun's face, concentrating all her will, for she knew that unless she could control her also, she herself was lost. Beatrice answered the question, drawing herself up proudly against the great altar and pointing at Anorna with her outstretched hand, her dark eyes flashing indignantly. We were talking together, this woman and I, she looked at me, she was angry, and then I fainted, or fell asleep, I can't tell which. I awoke in the dark to find myself lying upon the altar here. Then she took hold of me and tried to make me sleep again, but I would not. Let her explain herself what she has done, and why she brought me here. Sister Paul turned to Unorna, and met the full glare of the unlike eyes, with her own calm, half-heavenly look of innocence. What have you done, Unorna? What have you done? She asked very sadly. But Unorna did not answer. She only looked at the nun more fixedly and savagely. She felt that she might as well have looked upon some ancient picture of a saint in heaven and bid it close its eyes. But she would not give up the attempt, for her only safety lay in its success. For a long time, Sister Paul returned her gaze steadily. Sleep, said Anorna, putting up her hand. Sleep, I command you. But Sister Paul's eyes did not waver. A sad smile played for a moment upon her waxen features. You have no power over me, for your power is not of good, she said slowly and softly. Then she quietly turned to Beatrice and took her hand. Come with me, my daughter, she said. I have a light and will take you to a place where you will be safe. She will not trouble you any more tonight. Say a prayer, my child, and do not be afraid. I'm not afraid, said Beatrice. But where is she? she asked suddenly. Anorna had glided away while they were speaking. Sister Paul held the lamp high and looked in all directions. Then she heard the heavy door of sacristy swing upon its hinges and strike with a soft thud against the small leathern cushion. Both women followed her, but as they opened the door again, a blast of cold air almost extinguished the lamp. The night wind was blowing in from the street. She is gone out, said Sister Paul. Alone and at this hour. Heaven help her. It was as she said. Anorna had escaped. End of chapter 20. Recording by Georgia Bondi, London, England, georgiabondi.com. Chapter 21 of The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague, a Fantastic Tale, by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter 21 After leaving Unorna at the convent, the wanderer had not hesitated as to the course he should pursue. It was quite clear that the only person to whom he could apply at the present juncture was Kayork Arabian. Had he been at liberty to act in the most natural and simple way, 
he would have applied to the authorities for a sufficient force with which to take Israel Kafka into custody as a dangerous lunatic. He was well aware, however, that such a proceeding must lead to an inquiry of a more or less public nature, of which the consequences might be serious, or at least extremely annoying to Unorna. Of the inconvenience to which he might himself be exposed, he would have taken little account, though his position would have been as difficult to explain as any situation could be. The important point was to prevent the possibility of Unorna's name being connected with an open scandal. Every present circumstance in the case was directly or indirectly the result of Unorna's unreasoning passion for himself, and it was clearly his duty, as a man of honour, to shield her from the consequences of her own acts, as far as lay in his power. He did not indeed believe literally all that she had told him in her mad confession. Much of that, he was convinced, was but a delusion. It might be possible, indeed, for Unorna to produce forgetfulness of such a dream as she impressed upon Kafka's mind in the cemetery of that same afternoon, or even, perhaps, of some real circumstance of merely relative importance in a man's life. But the wanderer could not believe that it was in her power to destroy the memory of the great passion through which she pretended that he himself had passed. He smiled at the idea, for he had always trusted his own senses and his own memory. Unorna's own mind was clearly wandering, or else she had invented the story, supposing him credulous enough to believe it. In either case it did not deserve a moment's consideration except as showing to what lengths her foolish and ill-bestowed love could lead her. Meanwhile she was in danger. She had aroused the violent and deadly resentment of Israel Kafka, a man who, if not positively insane, as K. York Arabian had hinted, was by no means in a normal state of mind or body, a man beside himself with love and anger, and absolutely reckless of life for the time being, a man who, for the security of all concerned, must be at least temporarily confined in a place of safety, until a proper treatment and the lapse of a certain length of time should bring him to his senses. For the present he was wholly untractable, being at the mercy of the most uncontrolled passions, and of one of those intermittent phases of blind fatalism to which the Semitic races are peculiarly subject. There were two reasons which determined the wanderer to turn to Kearch Arabian for assistance, besides his wish to see the bad business end quickly and without publicity. Kearch, so far as the wanderer was aware, was himself treating Israel Kafka's case, and would therefore know what to do, if anyone knew at all. Secondly, it was clear from the message which Unorna had left with the porter of her own house that she expected Kearch to come at any moment. He was then in immediate danger of being brought face to face with Israel Kafka without having received the least warning of his present condition, and it was impossible to say what the infuriated youth might do at such a moment. He had been shut up, caught in his own trap as it were, for some time, and his anger and madness might reasonably be supposed to have been aggravated rather than cooled by his unexpected confinement. It was as likely as not that he would use the weapon he carried upon the first person with whom he found himself face to face, especially if that person made any attempt to overpower and disarm him. The wanderer drove to Kearch Arabian's house, and, leaving his carriage to wait in case of need, ascended the stairs and knocked at the door. For some reason or other Kearch would not have a bell in his dwelling, whether because, like Mahomet, he regarded the bell as the devil's instrument, or because he was really nervously sensitive to the sound of one nobody had ever discovered. The wanderer knocked, therefore, and Kearch answered the knock in person. "'My dear friend!' he exclaimed in his richest and deepest voice, as he recognized the wanderer. "'Come in. I am delighted to see you. You will join me at supper. This is good indeed.' He took his visitor by the arm and led him in. Upon one of the tables stood a round brass platter, covered, so far as it was visible, with Arabic inscriptions, and highly polished, one of those commonly used all over the East at the present day for the same purpose. Upon this were placed at random several silver bowls, mere hemispheres without feet, 
remaining in a convenient position by their own weight. One of these contained snowy rice, in that perfectly dry but tender state dear to the taste of Orientals, in another was a savory, steaming mess of tender capon, chopped in pieces with spices and aromatic herbs, a third contained a pure white curd of milk, and a fourth was heaped up with rare fruits. A flagon of bohemian glass, clear and bright as rock crystal, and covered with very beautiful traceries of black and gold, with a drinking vessel of the same design, stood upon the table beside the platter. My simple meal, said Keorg, spreading out his hands and smiling pleasantly. You will share it with me. There will be enough for two. So far as I am concerned, I should say so, the wanderer answered with a smile. But my business is rather urgent. Suddenly he saw that there was a third person in the room, and glanced at Keorg in surprise. "'I want to speak a few words with you alone,' he said. "'I would not trouble you, but—not in the least, not in the least, my dear friend,' asseverated Keorg, motioning him to a chair beside the board. "'But we are not alone,' observed the wanderer, still standing and looking at the stranger. Keorg saw the glance and understood. He broke into peals of laughter. "'That,' he exclaimed presently, "'that is only the individual. He will not disturb us. Pray be seated.' "'I assure you that my business is very private,' the wanderer objected. "'Quite so, of course. But there is nothing to fear. The individual is my servant, a most excellent creature, who has been with me for many years. He cooks for me, cleans the specimens, and takes care of me in all ways. A most reliable man, I assure you." Of course, if you can answer for his discretion. The individual was standing a little distance from the table observing the two men intently, but respectfully with his keen little black eyes. The rest of his square, dark face expressed nothing. He had perfectly straight, jet-black hair, which hung evenly all around his head and flat against his cheeks. He was dressed entirely in a black robe of the nature of a caftan, gathered closely round his waist by a black girdle, and fitting tightly over his stalwart shoulders. "'His discretion is beyond all doubt,' Keorg answered, "'and for the best of all reasons. He is totally deaf and dumb and absolutely illiterate. I brought him years ago in Astrakhan of a Russian friend. He is very clever with his fingers. It is he who stole from me the Malayan lady's head over there, after she was executed. And now, my dear friend, let us have supper." There were neither plates nor knives nor forks upon the table, and at a sign from Keorg, the individual retired to procure those western encumbrances to eating. The wanderer, acquainted as he had long been with his host's eccentricities, showed little surprise, but understood that whatever he said would not be overheard any more than if they had been alone. He hesitated a moment, however, for he had not determined exactly how far it was necessary to acquaint Keorg with the circumstances, and he was anxious to avoid all reference to Unorna's folly in regard to himself. The individual returned, bringing, with other things, a drinking-glass for the wanderer. Keorg filled it and then filled his own. It was clear that ascetic practices formed no part of his scheme for the prolongation of life. As he raised his glass to his lips, his bright eyes twinkled. "'To Keorg's long life and happiness,' he said calmly, and then sipped the wine. "'And now for your story,' he added, brushing the brown drops from his white moustache with a small damask napkin which the individual presented to him and immediately received again to throw it aside as unfit for a second use. "'I hardly think that we can afford to linger over supper,' the wanderer said, noticing Keorg's coolness with some anxiety. "'The case is urgent. Israel Kafka has lost his head completely. He has sworn to kill Unorna, and is at the present moment confined in the conservatory in her house.' The effect of the announcement upon Keorg was so extraordinary that the wanderer started, not being prepared for any manifestation of what seemed to be the deepest emotion. 
The gnome sprang from the table with a cry that would have been like the roar of a wounded wild beast if it had not articulated a terrific blasphemy. "'Unorna is quite safe,' the wanderer hastened to say. "'Safe? Where?' shouted the little man, his hands already on his furs. The individual, too, had sprung across the room like a cat and was helping him. In five seconds Keyork would have been out of the house. "'In a convent. I took her there, and saw the gate close behind her.' Keyork dropped his furs and stood still a moment. The individual, always unmoved, rearranged the coat and cap neatly in their place, following all his master's movements, however, with his small eyes. Then the sage broke out in a different strain. He flung his arms round the wanderer's body and attempted to embrace him. "'You have saved my life! The curse of the three black angels on you for not saying so first! he cried in agony of ecstasy. "'Preserver, what can I do for you? Savior of my existence, how can I repay you? You shall live forever, as I will. You shall have all my secrets. The gold spider shall spin her web in your dwelling. The part of fortune shall shine on your path, it shall rain jewels on your roof, and your winter shall have snows of pearls. You shall—' "'Good heavens, Keyork! interrupted the wanderer. "'Are you mad? What is the matter with you?' Mad? The matter? I love you! I worship you! I adore you! You have saved her life, and you have saved mine! You have almost killed me with fright and joy in two moments! You have—' Be sensible, Keorg. You Norna is quite safe. But we must do something about Kafka, and—' The rest of his speech was drowned in another shout from the gnome, ending in a portentous peal of laughter. He had taken his glass again and was toasting himself. "'To Keorg, to his long life, to his happiness!' he cried. Then he wet his lips again in the golden juice, and the individual, unmoved, presented him with a second napkin. The wine seemed to steady him, and he sat down again in his place. "'Come,' he said, "'let us eat first. I have an amazing appetite, and Israel Kafka can wait.' "'Do you think so? Is it safe?' the wanderer asked. "'Perfectly,' returned Keorg, growing quite calm again. "'The locks are very good on those doors. I saw to them myself.' "'But someone else—' "'There is no someone else,' interrupted the sage sharply. "'Only three persons can enter the house without question. You, I, and Kafka. You and I are here, and Kafka is there already.' When we have eaten, we will go to him, and I flatter myself that the last state of the young man will be so immeasurably worse than the first, that he will not recognize himself when I have done with him." He had helped his friend and began eating. Somewhat reassured, the wanderer followed his example. Under the circumstances, it was as well to take advantage of the opportunity for refreshment. No one could tell what might happen before morning. It just occurs to me said Keorg, fixing his keen eyes on his companion's face, that you have told me absolutely nothing, except that Kafka is mad and that Unorna is safe." "'Those are the most important points,' observed the wanderer. "'Precisely. But I am sure that you will not think me indiscreet if I wish to know a little more. For instance, what was the immediate cause of Kafka's extremely theatrical and unreasonable rage? That would interest me very much. Of course he is mad, poor boy, but I take delight in following out the workings of an insane intellect. Now there are no phases of insanity more curious than those in which the patient is possessed with a desire to destroy what he loves best. These cases are especially worthy of study, because they happen so often in our day." The wanderer saw that some explanation was necessary, and he determined to give one in as few words as possible. "'Unorna and I had strolled into the Jewish cemetery,' he said. While we were talking there, Israel Kafka suddenly came upon us and spoke and acted very wildly. He is madly in love with her. She became very angry and would not let me interfere. Then, by way of punishment for his intrusion, I suppose, she hypnotized him and made him believe that he was Simon Abelus, 
and brought the whole of the poor boy's life so vividly before me, as I listened, that I actually seemed to see the scenes. I was quite unable to stop her or to move from where I stood, though I was quite awake. But I realized what was going on, and I was disgusted at her cruelty to the unfortunate man. He fainted at the end, but when he came to himself he seemed to remember nothing. I took him home and Unorna went away by herself. Then he questioned me so closely as to what had happened that I was weak enough to tell him the truth. Of course, as a fervent Hebrew, which he seems to be, he did not relish the idea of having played the Christian martyr for Unorna's amusement, and amidst the graves of his own people. He there and then impressed me that he intended to take Unorna's life without delay, but insisted that I should warn her of her danger, saying that he would not be a common murderer. Seeing that he was mad and in earnest, I went to her. There was some delay which proved fortunate, as it turned out, for we left the conservatory by the small door just as he was entering from the other end. We locked it behind us, and going round by the passages locked the other door upon him also, so that he was caught in a trap. And there he is, unless someone has let him out." "'And then you took Unorna to the convent?' Keorg had listened attentively. I took her to the convent, promising to come to her when she should send for me. Then I saw that I must consult you before doing anything more. It would not do to make a scandal of the matter." No, answered Keorg thoughtfully. It will not do. The wanderer had told his story with perfect truth, and yet in a way which entirely concealed the very important part Unorna's passion for him had played in the sequence of events. Seeing that Keorg asked no further questions, he felt satisfied that he had accomplished his purpose as he had intended, and that the sage suspected nothing. He would have been very much disconcerted had he known that the latter had long been aware of Unorna's love, and was quite able to guess at the cause of Kafka's sudden appearance and extreme excitement. Indeed, so soon as he had finished the short narrative, his mind reverted with curiosity to Keorg himself and he wondered what the little man had meant by his amazing outburst of gratitude on hearing of Unorna's safety. Perhaps he loved her. More impossible things than that had occurred in the wanderer's experience. Or possibly he had an object to gain in exaggerating his thankfulness to Unorna's preserver. He knew that Keorg rarely did anything without an object, and that, although he was occasionally very odd and excitable, he was always in reality perfectly well aware of what he was doing. He was roused from his speculations by Keorg's voice. "'There will be no difficulty in securing Kafka,' he said. "'The real question is, what shall we do with him?' "'He is very much in the way at present, and he must be disposed of at once, or we shall have more trouble. How infinitely more to the purpose it would have been if he had wisely determined to cut his own throat instead of Unorna's! But young men are so thoughtless!" "'I will only say one thing,' said the wanderer, "'and then I will leave the direction to you. The poor fellow has been driven mad by Unorna's caprice and cruelty. I am determined that he shall not be made to suffer gratuitously anything more. Do you think that Unorna was intentionally cruel to him?" inquired Keorg. I can hardly believe that. She has not a cruel nature. You would have changed your mind if you had seen her this afternoon, but that is not the question. I will not allow him to be ill-treated." No, no, of course not, Keorg answered with eager assent. But of course you will understand that we have to deal with a dangerous lunatic and that it may be necessary to use whatever means are most sure and certain." "'I shall not quarrel with your means,' the wanderer said quietly, "'provided that there is no unnecessary brutality. If I see anything of the kind, I will take the matter into my own hands.' "'Certainly, certainly,' said the other, eyeing with curiosity the man who spoke so confidently of taking out of Keorg Arabian's grasp whatever had once found its way into it. He shall be treated with every consideration," the wanderer continued. Of course, if he is very violent, we shall have to use force. We will take the individual with us," said Keorg. 
He is very strong. He has a trick of breaking silver florins with his thumbs and fingers which is very pretty. I fancy that you and I could manage him. It is a pity that neither of us has the faculty of hypnotizing. This would be the proper time to use it. A great pity. But there are other things that will do almost as well. What, for instance? A little ether in a sponge. He would only struggle a moment, and then he would be much more really unconscious than if he had been hypnotized. Is it quite painless? Quite, if you give it gradually. If you hurry the thing, the man feels as though he were being smothered. But the real difficulty is what to do with him, as I said before. Take him home and get a keeper from the lunatic asylum, the wanderer suggested. Then comes the whole question of an inquiry into his sanity, objected Keorg. We come back to the starting point. We must settle all this before we go to him. A lunatic asylum is not a club in this country. There is a great deal of formality connected with getting into it, and a great deal more connected with getting out. Now I could not get a keeper for Kafka without going to the physician in charge and making a statement, and demanding an examination and all the rest of it. And Israel Kafka is a person of importance among his own people. He comes of great Jews in Moravia, and we should have the whole Jews' quarter, which means nearly the whole of Prague, in a broad sense, about our ears in twenty-four hours. No, no, my friend, to avoid an enormous scandal things must be done very quietly indeed. I cannot see anything to be done, then, unless we bring him here," said the wanderer, falling into the trap from sheer perplexity. Everything that Keorg had said was undeniably true. "'He would be a nuisance in the house,' answered the sage, not wishing, for reasons of his own, to appear to accept the proposition too eagerly. "'Not but that the individual would make a capital keeper. He is as gentle as he is strong and as quick as a tiger-cat." "'So far as that is concerned,' said the wanderer coolly, "'I could take charge of him myself, if you did not object to my presence.' "'You do not trust me,' said the other, with a sharp glance. "'My dear Keorg, we are old acquaintances, and I trust you implicitly to do whatever you have predetermined to do for the advantage of your studies, unless someone interferes with you. You have no more respect for human life or sympathy for human suffering than you have belief in the importance of anything not conducive to your researches. I am perfectly well aware that if you thought you could learn something by making experiments upon the body of Israel Kafka, you would not scruple to make a living mummy of him, you would do it without the least hesitation. I should expect to find him with his head cut off, living by means of a glass heart and thinking through a rabbit's brain. That is the reason why I do not trust you. Before I could deliver him into your hands, I would require of you a contract to give him back unhurt, and a contract of the kind you would consider binding." Keorg Arabian wondered whether Unorna, in the recklessness of her passion, had betrayed the nature of the experiment they had been making together, but a moment's reflection told him that he need have no anxiety on this score. He understood the wanderer's nature too well to suspect him of wishing to convey a covert hint instead of saying openly what was in his mind. "'Taste one of these oranges,' he said, by way of avoiding an answer. "'They have just come from Smyrna.' The wanderer smiled as he took the proffered fruit. "'So that, unless you have a serious objection to my presence,' he said, continuing his former speech, you will have me as a guest so long as Israel Kafka is here." Keorg Arabian saw no immediate escape. "'My dear friend,' he exclaimed with alacrity, "'if you are really in earnest, I am as really delighted. So far from taking your distrust ill, I regard it as a providentially fortunate bias of your mind, since it will keep us together for a time. You will be the only loser. You see how simply I live. There is a simplicity which is the extremest development of refined Sybarism," the wanderer said, smiling again. I know your simplicity of old, 
It consists of getting precisely what you want and in producing local earthquakes and revolutions when you cannot get it. Moreover, you want what is good, to the taste at least." "'There is something in that,' answered Keark with a merry twinkle in his eye. "'Happiness is a matter of speculation. Comfort is a matter of fact. Most men are uncomfortable, because they do not know what they want. If you have tastes, study them. If you have intelligence, apply it to the question of gratifying your tastes. Consult yourself first, and nobody second. Consider this orange. I am fond of oranges, and they suit my constitution admirably. Consider the difficulty I have had in procuring it at this time of year, not in the wretched condition in which they are sold in the market, plucked half green in Spain or Italy and ripened on the voyage in the fermenting heat of the decay of those which are already rotten, but ripe from the tree and brought to me directly by the shortest and quickest means possible. Consider this orange, I say. Do you vainly imagine that if I had but two or three like it I would offer you one? I would not be so rash as to imagine anything of the kind, my dear Keork. I know you very well. If you offer me one, it is because you have a week's supply at least." Exactly, said Keork, and a few despair, because they will only keep a week as I like them, and because I would no more run the risk of missing my orange a week hence for your sake than I would deprive myself of it today. And that is your simplicity. That is my simplicity. It is indeed a perfectly simple matter, for there is only one idea in it and in all things I carry that one idea out to its ultimate expression. That one idea, as you very well put it, is to have exactly what I want in this world. And you will be getting what you want in having me quartered upon you as poor Israel Kafka's keeper? asked the wanderer, with an expression of amusement. But Keork did not wince. Precisely, he answered without hesitation. In the first place, you will relieve me of much trouble and responsibility, and the individual will not be so often called away from his manifold and important household duties. In the second place, I shall have a most agreeable and intelligent companion with whom I can talk as long as I like. In the third place, I shall undoubtedly satisfy my curiosity. In what respect, if you please? I shall discover the secret of your wonderful interest in Israel Kafka's welfare. I always like to follow the workings of a brain essentially different from my own, philanthropic, of course. How could it be anything else? Philanthropy deals with a class of ideas wholly unfamiliar to me. I shall learn much in your society. And possibly I shall learn something from you," the wanderer answered. There is certainly much to be learnt. I wonder whether your ideas upon all subjects are as simple as those you hold about oranges. Absolutely. I make no secret of my principles. Everything I do is for my own advantage." Then, observed the wanderer, the advantage of Unorna's life must be an enormous one to you, to judge by your satisfaction at her safety. Keyork stared at him a moment and then laughed but less heartily and loudly than usual his companion fancied. "'Very good!' he exclaimed. "'Excellent! I fell into the trap like a rat into a basin of water. You are indeed an interesting companion, my dear friend. So interesting that I hope we shall never part again.' There was a rather savage intonation in the last words. They looked at each other intently, neither wincing nor lowering his gaze. The wanderer saw that he had touched upon Keyork's greatest and most important secret, and Keyork fancied that his companion knew more than he actually did. But nothing further was said, for Keyork was far too wise to enter into explanation, and the wanderer knew well enough that if he was to learn anything it must be by observation and not by questioning. Keyork filled both glasses in silence, and both men drank before speaking again. And now that we have refreshed ourselves, he said, returning naturally to his former manner, we will go and find Israel Kafka. It is as well that we should have given him a little time to himself. He may have returned to his senses without any trouble on our part. 
Shall we take the individual?" "'As you please,' the wanderer answered indifferently as he rose from his place. "'It is very well for you not to care,' observed Keorg. "'You are big and strong and young, whereas I am a little man and very old at that. I shall take him for my own protection. I confess that I value my life very highly. It is part of that simplicity which you despise. That devil of a Jew is armed, you say?" "'I saw something like a knife in his hand as we shut him in,' said the wanderer with the same indifference as before. "'Then I will take the individual,' Keorg answered promptly. "'A man's bare hands must be strong and clever to take a man's life in a scuffle, and few men can use a pistol to any purpose. But a knife is a weapon of precision. I will take the individual, decidedly.' He made a few rapid signs, and the individual disappeared, coming back a moment later attired in a long coat not unlike his master's, except that the fur of the great collar was of a common fox instead of being of sable. Keorg drew his peaked cape comfortably down over the tips of his ears. "'The ether! he exclaimed. "'How forgetful I am growing! Your charming conversation had almost made me forget the object of our visit!' He went back and took the various things he needed. Then the three men went out together. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague, a Fantastic Tale, by Francis Marion Crawford, Chapter Twenty Two. More than an hour had elapsed since the wanderer and Unorna had finally turned the key upon Israel Kafka, leaving him to his own reflections. During the first moments he made desperate efforts to get out of the conservatory, throwing himself with all his weight and strength against the doors and thrusting the point of his long knife into the small apertures of the locks. Then seeing that every attempt was fruitless, he desisted and sat down, in a state of complete exhaustion. A reaction began to set in after the furious excitement of the afternoon and he felt all at once that it would be impossible for him to make another step or raise his arm to strike. A man less sound originally in bodily constitution would have broken down sooner, and it was a proof of Israel Kafka's extraordinary vigor and energy that he did not lose his senses in a delirious fever at the moment when he felt that his strength could bear no further strain. But his thoughts, such as they were, did not lack clearness. He saw that his opportunity was gone, and he began to think of the future, wondering what would take place next. Assuredly, when he had come to Unorna's house with the fixed determination to take her life, the last thing that he had expected had been to be taken prisoner and left to his own meditations. It was clear that the wanderer's warning had been conveyed without loss of time, and had saved Unorna from her immediate fate. Nevertheless, he did not regret having given her the opportunity of defending herself. He had not meant that there should be any secret about the deed, for he was ready to sacrifice his own life in executing it. Yet he was not altogether brave. He had neither Unorna's innate indifference to physical danger, nor the wanderer's calm superiority to fear. He would not have made a good soldier and he could not have faced another man's pistol at fifteen paces without experiencing a mental and bodily commotion not unlike terror, which he might or might not have concealed from others, but which would in any case have been painfully apparent to himself. It is a noticeable fact in human nature that a man of even ordinary courage will at any time, when under excitement, risk his life rather than his happiness. Moreover, an immense number of individuals, naturally far from brave, destroy their own lives yearly in the moment when all chances of happiness are temporarily eclipsed. 
the inference seems to be that mankind, on the whole, values happiness more highly than life. The proportion of suicides from so-called honorable motives is small as compared with the many committed out of despair. Israel Kafka's case was by no means a rare one. The fact of having made to play a part which to him seemed at once blasphemous and ignoble had indeed turned the scale, but was not the motive. In all things, the final touch which destroys the balance is commonly mistaken for the force which has originally produced a state of unstable equilibrium, whereas there is very often no connection between the one and the other. The Moravian himself believed that the sacrifice of Unorna, and of himself afterwards, was to be an expiation of the outrage Unorna had put upon his faith in his own person. He had merely seized upon the first excuse which presented itself for ending all, because he was in reality past hope. We have as yet no absolute test of sanity, as we have of fever in the body and of many other unnatural conditions of the human organism. The only approximately accurate judgments in the patient's favor are obtained from examinations into the relative consecutiveness and consistency of thought in the individual examined, when the whole tendency of that thought is towards an end conceivably approvable by a majority of men. A great many philosophers and thinkers have accordingly been pronounced insane at one period of history, and have been held up as models of sanity at another. The most immediately destructive consequences of individual reasoning on a limited scale, murder and suicide, have been successfully regarded as heroic acts, as criminal deeds, and as the deplorable but explicable actions of irresponsible beings in consecutive ages of violence, strict law and humanitarianism. It seems to be believed that the combination of murder and suicide is more commonly observed under the last of the three reigns than it was under the first. It was undoubtedly least common under the second. In other words, it appears probable that the practice of considering certain crimes as the result of insanity has a tendency to make those crimes increase in number, as they undoubtedly increase in barbarity from year to year. Meanwhile, however, no definite conclusion has been reached as to the state of mind of a man who murders the woman he loves and then ends his own life. Israel Kafka may therefore be regarded as mad or sane. In favor of the theory of his madness the total uselessness of the deed he contemplated may be adduced. On the other hand, the extremely consecutive and consistent nature of his thoughts and actions gives evidence of his sanity. When he found himself a prisoner in Unorna's conservatory, his intention underwent no change though his body was broken with fatigue and his nerves with the long-continued strain of a terrible excitement. His determination was as cool and as fixed as ever. These somewhat dry reflections seem necessary to the understanding of what followed. The key turned in the lock and the bolt was slipped back. Instantly Israel Kafka's energy returned. He rose quickly and hid himself in the shrubbery, in a position from which he could observe the door. He had seen Unorna enter before, and had of course heard her cry before the wanderer had carried her away, and he had believed that she had wished to face him, either with the intention of throwing herself upon his mercy, or in the hope of dominating him with her eyes as she had so often done before. Of course he had no means of knowing that she had already left the house. He imagined that the wanderer had gone, and that Unorna, being freed from his restraint, was about to enter the place again. The door opened, and the three men came in. Kafka's first idea, on seeing himself disappointed, was that they had come to take him into custody, and his first impulse was to elude them. The wanderer entered first, tall, stately, indifferent, the quick glance of his deep eyes alone betraying that he was looking for someone. Next came Keyork Arabian, muffled still in his furs, turning his head sharply from side to side in the midst of the sable collar that half buried it, and evidently nervous. Last of all, the individual, who had divested himself of his outer coat and whose powerful proportions did not escape Israel Kafka's observation. It was clear that if there were a struggle it could have but one issue. 
Kafka would be overpowered. His knowledge of the disposition of the plants and trees offered him a hope of escape. The three men had entered the conservatory, and if he could reach the door before they noticed him, he could lock it upon them, as it had been locked upon himself. He could hear their footsteps on the marble pavement very near him, and he caught glimpses of their moving figures through the thick leaves. With cat-like tread he glided along the shadows of the foliage until he could see the door. From the entrance an open way was left in a straight line towards the middle of the hall, down which his pursuers were still slowly walking. He must cross an open space in the line of their vision in order to get out, and he calculated the distance to be traversed while listening to their movements, until he felt sure that they were so far from the door as not to be able to reach him. Then he made his attempt, darting across the smooth pavement with his knife in his hand. There was no one in the way. Then came a violent shock, and he was held as in a vice, so tightly that he could not believe himself in the arms of a human being. His captors had anticipated that he would try to escape, and has posted the individual in the shadow of a tree near the doorway. The deaf and dumb man had received his instructions by means of a couple of quick signs, and not a whisper had betrayed the measures taken. Kafka struggled desperately, for he was within three feet of the door and still believed an escape possible. He tried to strike behind him with his sharp blade of which a single touch would have severed muscle and sinew like silk threads, but the bear-like embrace seemed to confine his whole body, his arms, and even his wrists. Then he felt himself turn round and the individual pushed him towards the middle of the hall. The wanderer was advancing quickly and Keyork Arabian, who had again fallen behind, peered at Kafka from behind his tall companion, with a grotesque expression in which bodily fear and a desire to laugh at the captive were strongly intermingled. "'It is of no use to resist,' said the wanderer quietly. "'We are too strong for you.' Kafka said nothing, but his bloodshot eyes glared up angrily at the tall man's face. He looks dangerous, and he still has that thing in his hand," said Keyork Arabian. I think I will give him either at once, while the individual holds him. Perhaps you could do it." "'You will do nothing of the kind,' the wanderer answered. "'What a coward you are, Keyork!' he added contemptuously. Going to Kafka's side, he took him by the wrist of the hand which held the knife, but Kafka still clutched it firmly. You had better give it up," he said. Kafka shook his head angrily and set his teeth, but the wanderer unclasped the fingers by quiet force and took the weapon away. He handed it to Keyork, who breathed a sigh of relief as he looked at it, smiling at last and holding his head on one side. To think, he soliloquized, that an inch of such pretty stuff as Damascus steel in the right place can draw the sharp red line between time and eternity." He put the knife tenderly away in the bosom of his fur coat. His whole manner changed and he came forward with his usual almost jaunty step. "'And now that you are quite harmless, my dear friend,' he said, addressing Israel Kafka, "'I hope to make you see the folly of your ways. I suppose you know that you are quite mad and that the proper place for you is in a lunatic asylum. The wanderer laid his hand heavily upon Kayark's shoulder. "'Remember what I told you,' he said sternly. "'He will be reasonable now. Make your fellow understand that he is to let him go.' "'Better shut the door first, said Kayork, suiting the action to the word, and then coming back. "'Make haste,' said the wanderer with impatience. "'The man is ill, whether he is mad or not.' Released at last from the individual's iron grip, Israel Kafka staggered a little. The wanderer took him kindly by the arm, supporting his steps and leading him to a seat. Kafka glanced suspiciously at him and at the other two, but seemed unable to make any further effort and sank back with a low groan. His face grew pale and his eyelids drooped. "'Get some wine, something to restore him,' the wanderer said. Keyork looked at the Moravian critically for a moment. Yes, he assented. He is more exhausted than I thought. He is not very dangerous now. 
Then he went in search of what was needed. The individual retired to a distance and stood looking on with folded arms. "'Do you hear me?' asked the wanderer, speaking gently. "'Do you understand what I say?' Israel Kafka nodded, but said nothing. "'You are very ill. This foolish idea that has possessed you this evening comes from your illness. Will you go away quietly with me and make no resistance, so that I may take care of you?' This time there was not even a movement of the head. "'This is merely a passing thing,' the wanderer continued in a tone of quiet encouragement. "'You have been feverish and excited, and I dare say you have been too much alone of late. If you will come with me, I will take care of you and see that all is well.' "'I told you that I would kill her, and I will,' said Israel Kafka faintly but distinctly. "'You will not kill her,' answered his companion. "'I will prevent you from attempting it, and as soon as you are well you will see the absurdity of the idea.' Israel Kafka made an impatient gesture, feeble but sufficiently expressive. Then all at once his limbs relaxed, and his head fell forward upon his breast. The wanderer started to his feet and moved him into a more comfortable position. There were one or two quickly drawn breaths, and the breathing ceased altogether. At that moment Keyork returned carrying a bottle of wine and a glass. "'It is too late,' said the wanderer gravely. "'Israel Kafka is dead.' "'Dead!' exclaimed Keyork, setting down what he had in his hands, and hastening to examine the unfortunate man's face and eyes. The individual squeezed him a little too hard, I suppose," he added, applying his ear to the region of the heart, and moving his head about a little as he did so. "'I hate men who make statements about things they do not understand,' he said viciously, looking up as he spoke, but without any expression of satisfaction. "'He is no more dead than you are. The greater pity! It would have been so convenient. It is nothing but a slight syncope probably the result of poorness of blood and an overexcited state of the nervous system. Help me to lay him on his back. You ought to have known that was the only thing to do. Put a cushion under his head. There, he will come to himself presently, but he will not be so dangerous as he was." The wanderer drew a long breath of relief as he helped Keyork to make the necessary arrangements. "'How long will it last?' he inquired. "'How can I tell?' returned Keyork sharply. "'Have you never heard of a syncope? Do you know nothing about anything?' He had produced a bottle containing some very strong salt and was applying it to the unconscious man's nostrils. The wanderer paid no attention to his irritable temper and stood looking on. A long time passed, and yet the Moravian gave no further signs of consciousness. "'It is clear that he cannot stay here if he is to be seriously ill.' the wanderer said. "'And it is equally clear that he cannot be taken away,' retorted Keyork. "'You seem to be in a very combative frame of mind,' the other answered, sitting down and looking at his watch. "'If you cannot revive him, he ought to be brought to more comfortable quarters for the night.' "'In his present condition, of course,' said Keyork, with a sneer. "'Do you think he would be in any danger on the way?' I never think, I know," snarled the sage. The wanderer showed a slight surprise at the roughness of the answer, but said nothing, contenting himself with watching the proceedings keenly. He was by no means past suspecting that Keyork might apply some medicine the very reverse of reviving, if left to himself. For the present there seemed to be no danger. The pungent smell of salts of ammonia pervaded the place but the wanderer knew that Keyork had a bottle of ether in the pocket of his coat, and he rightly judged that a very little of that would put an end to the life that was hanging in the balance. Nearly half an hour passed before either spoke again. Then Keyork looked up. This time his voice was smooth and persuasive. His irritability had all disappeared. "'You must be tired,' he said. "'Why do you not go home? Or else go to my house and wait for us. 
the individual and I can take care of him very well. Thanks, replied the wanderer with a slight smile. I am not in the least tired, and I prefer to stay where I am. I am not hindering you, I believe. Now Keorch Arabian had no interest in allowing Israel Kafka to die, though the wanderer half believed that he had, though he could not imagine what that interest might be. The little man was in reality on the track of an experiment, and he knew very well that so long as he was so narrowly watched it would be quite impossible to try it. In spite of his sneers at his companion's ignorance, he was aware that the latter knew enough to make every effort conducive to reviving the patient if left to himself, and he submitted with a bad grace to doing what he would rather have left undone. He would have wished to let the flame of life sink yet lower before making it brighten again, for he had with him a preparation which he had been carrying in his pocket for months in the hope of accidentally happening upon just such a case as the present, and he longed for an opportunity of trying it. But to give it a fair trial he wished to apply it at the precise point when, according to all previous experience, the moment of death was past, the moment when the physician usually puts his watch in his pocket and looks about for his hat. Possibly if Kafka, being left without any assistance, had shown no further signs of sinking, Keorch would have helped him to sink a little lower. To produce this much-desired result, he had nothing with him but the ether, of which the wanderer of course knew the smell and understood the effects. He saw the chances of making the experiment upon an excellent subject slipping away before his eyes, and he grew more angry in proportion as they seemed farther removed. "'He is a little better,' he said discontentedly, after another long interval of silence. The wanderer bent down and saw that the eyelids were quivering and that the face was less deathly livid than before. Then the eyes opened and stared dreamily at the glass roof. "'And I will,' said the faint, weak voice, as though completing a sentence. "'I think not,' observed Keorg, as though answering. The people who do what they mean to do are not always talking about will." But Kafka had closed his eyes again. This time, however, his breathing was apparent, and he was evidently returning to a conscious state. The wanderer ranged the pillow more comfortably under his head and covered him with his own furs. Keorg, relinquishing all hopes of trying the experiment at present, poured a little wine down his throat. "'Do you think we can take him home tonight? inquired the wanderer. He was prepared for an ill-tempered answer, but not for what Keorg actually said. The little man got upon his feet and coolly buttoned his coat. "'I think not,' he replied. "'There is nothing to be done but to keep him quiet. Good night. I am tired of all this nonsense, and I do not mean to lose my night's rest for all the Israels in Jewry, or all the Jews in Israel. You can stay with him if you please.' Thereupon he turned on his heel, making a sign to the individual who had not moved from his place since Kafka had lost consciousness, and who immediately followed his master. "'I will come and see to him in the morning,' said Keorg carelessly, as he disappeared from sight among the plants. The wanderer's long-suffering temper was roused, and his eyes gleamed angrily as he looked after the departing sage. "'Hound!' he exclaimed in a very audible voice. He hardly knew why he was so angry with the man who called himself his friend. Keorg had behaved no worse than an ordinary doctor, for he had stayed until the danger was over and had promised to come again in the morning. It was his cool way of disclaiming all further responsibility and of avoiding all further trouble which elicited the wanderer's resentment, as well as the unpleasant position in which the latter found himself. He had certainly not anticipated being left in charge of a sick man, and that sick man Israel Kafka, in Unorna's house for the whole night, and he did not enjoy the prospect. The mere detail of having to give some explanation to the servants, who would doubtless come before long to extinguish the lights, was far from pleasant. Moreover, though Keorg had declared the patient out of danger, there seemed to be no absolute certainty that a relapse would not take place before morning and Kafka might actually lay in the certainty, delusive enough, that Unorna could not return until the following day. 
he did not dare to take upon himself the responsibility of calling someone to help him, and of removing the Moravian in his present condition. The man was still very weak and either altogether unconscious, or sleeping the sleep of exhaustion. The weather, too, was bitterly cold, and the exposure to the night air might bring on immediate and fatal consequences. He examined Kafka closely and came to the conclusion that he was really asleep. To wake him would be absolutely cruel as well as dangerous. He looked kindly at the weary face and then began to walk up and down between the plants, coming back at the end of every turn to look again and assure himself that no change had taken place. After some time he began to wonder at the total silence in the house, or rather the silence which was carefully provided for in the conservatory impressed itself upon him for the first time. It was strange, he thought, that no one came to put out the lamps. He thought of looking out into the vestibule beyond to see whether the lights were still burning there. To his great surprise he found the door securely fastened. Keyork Arabian had undoubtedly locked him in, and to all intents and purposes he was a prisoner. He suspected some treachery, but in this he was mistaken. Keyork's sole intention had been to ensure himself from being disturbed in the course of the night by a second visit from the wanderer, accompanied perhaps by Kafka. It immediately occurred to the wanderer that he could ring the bell. But disliking the idea of entering into an explanation, he reserved that for an emergency. Had he attempted it, he would have been still further surprised to find that it would have produced no result. In going through the vestibule, Keyork had used Kafka's sharp knife to cut one of the slender, silk-covered copper wires which passed out of the conservatory on that side, communicating with the servants' quarters. He was perfectly acquainted with all such details of the household arrangement. Keyork's precautions were in reality useless, and they merely illustrate the ruthlessly selfish character of the man. The wanderer would in all probability neither have attempted to leave the house with Kafka that night, nor to communicate with the servants, even if he had been left free to do either, and if no one had disturbed him in his watch. He was disturbed, however, and very unexpectedly, between half-past one and a quarter to two in the morning. More than once he had remained seated for a long time, but his eyes were growing heavy and he roused himself and walked again until he was thoroughly awake. It was certainly true that, of all the persons concerned in the events of the day, except Keyork, he had undergone the least bodily fatigue and mental excitement. But even to the strongest, the hours of the night spent in watching by a sick person seem endless when there is no really strong personal anxiety felt. He was undoubtedly interested in Kafka's fate, and was resolved to protect him as well as to hinder him from committing any act of folly. But he had only met him for the first time that very afternoon and, under circumstances which had not in the first instance suggested even the possibility of a friendship between the two. His position towards Israel Kafka was altogether unexpected, and what he felt was no more than pity for his sufferings and indignation against those who had caused them. When the door was suddenly opened, he stood still in his walk and faced it. He hardly recognized Unorna in the pale, disheveled woman with circled eyes who came towards him under the bright light. She too stood still when she saw him, starting suddenly. She seemed to be very cold, for she shivered visibly and her teeth were chattering. Without the least protection against the bitter night air, she had fled bareheaded and cloakless through the open streets from the church to her home. "'You here?' she exclaimed in an unsteady voice. "'Yes, I am still here,' answered the wanderer. "'But I hardly expected you to come back to-night,' he added. At the sound of his voice a strange smile came into her wan face and lingered there. She had not thought to hear him speak again, kindly or unkindly, for she had come with the fixed determination to meet her death at Israel Kafka's hands, and to let that be the end. Amid all the wild thoughts that had whirled through her brain as she ran home in the dark, that one had not once changed. "'And Israel Kafka?' she asked, almost timidly. "'He is there, asleep.' 
Unorna came forward and the wanderer showed her where the man lay upon a thick carpet, wrapped in furs, his pale head supported by a cushion. "'He is very ill,' she said, almost under her breath. "'Tell me what has happened.' It was like a dream to her. The tremendous excitement of what had happened in the convent had cut her off from the realization of what had gone before. Strange as it seemed even to herself, she scarcely comprehended the intimate connection between the two series of events, nor the bearing of the one upon the other. Israel Kafka sank into such insignificance that she had began to pity his condition, and it was hard to remember that the wanderer was the man whom Beatrice had loved, and of whom she had spoken so long and so passionately. She found, too, an unreasoned joy in being once more by his side, no matter under what conditions. In that happiness, one-sided and unshared, she forgot everything else. Beatrice had been a dream, a vision, an unreal shadow. Kafka was nothing to her, and yet everything, as she suddenly saw, since he constituted a bond between her and the man she loved, which would at least outlast the night. In a flash she saw that the wanderer would not leave her alone with the Moravian and that the latter could not be moved for the present without danger to his life. They must watch together by his side through the long hours. Who could tell what the night would bring forth? As the new development of the situation presented itself, the color rose again to her cheeks. The warmth of the conservatory, too, dispelled the chill that had penetrated her, and the familiar odors of the flowers contributed to restore the lost equilibrium of mind and body. Tell me what has happened," she said again. In the fewest possible words, the wanderer told her all that had occurred up to the moment of her coming, not omitting the detail of the locked door. "'And for what reason do you suppose that Keorg shut you in?' she asked. "'I do not know,' the wanderer answered. "'I do not trust him, though I have known him so long.' "'It was mere selfishness,' said Unorna scornfully. I know him better than you do. He was afraid you would disturb him again in the night." The wanderer said nothing, wondering how any man could be so elaborately thoughtful of his own comfort. "'There is no help for it,' Unorna said. "'We must watch together.' "'I see no other way,' the wanderer answered indifferently. He placed a chair for her to sit in, within sight of the sick man, and took one himself, wondering at the strange situation, and yet not caring to ask Unorna what had brought her back, so breathless and so pale, at such an hour. He believed, not unnaturally, that her motive had been either anxiety for himself or the irresistible longing to see him again, coupled with a distrust of his promise to return when she should send for him. It seemed best to accept her appearance without question, lest an inquiry should lead to a fresh outburst more unbearable now than before, since there seemed to be no way of leaving the house without exposing her to danger. A nervous man like Israel Kafka might spring up at any moment and do something dangerous. After they had taken their places the silence lasted some moments. "'You did not believe all I told you this evening?' said Unorna softly, with an interrogation in her voice. "'No,' the wanderer answered quietly. "'I did not.' I am glad of that. I was mad when I spoke. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale, by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter 23 The wanderer was not inclined to deny the statement which accorded well enough with his total disbelief of the story Unorna had told him. But he did not answer her immediately for he found himself in a very difficult position. He would neither do anything in the least discourteous beyond admitting frankly that he had not believed her, 
when she taxed him with incredulity, nor would say anything which might serve her as a stepping-stone for returning to her original situation. He was, perhaps, inclined to blame her somewhat less than at first, and her changed manner in speaking of Kafka somewhat encouraged his leniency. A man will forgive, or at least condone, much harshness to others when he is thoroughly aware that it has been exhibited out of love for himself, and a man of the wanderer's character cannot help feeling a sort of chivalrous respect and delicate forbearance for a woman who loves him sincerely, though against his will, while he will avoid with an almost exaggerated prudence the least word which could be interpreted as an expression of reciprocal tenderness. He runs the risk, at the same time, of being thrust into the ridiculous position of the man who, though young, assumes the manner and speech of age, and delivers himself of grave, paternal advice to one who looks upon him, not as an elder, but as her chosen mate. After Unorna had spoken, the wanderer, therefore, held his peace. He inclined his head a little, as though to admit that her plea of madness might not be wholly imaginary but he said nothing. He sat looking at Israel Kafka's sleeping face and outstretched form, inwardly wondering whether the hours would seem very long before Keorg Arabian returned in the morning, and put an end to the situation. Unorna waited in vain for some response, and at last spoke again. "'Yes,' she said, "'I was mad. You cannot understand it. I dare say you cannot even understand how I speak of it now, and yet I cannot help speaking." Her manner was more natural and quiet than it had been since the moment of Kafka's appearance in the cemetery. The wanderer noticed the tone. There was an element of real sadness in it, with a leaven of bitter disappointment and a savor of heartfelt contrition. She was in earnest now, as she had been before, but in a different way. He could hardly refuse her a word in answer. Unorna, he said gravely, remember that you are leaving me no choice. I cannot leave you alone with that poor fellow, and so, whatever you wish to say, I must hear. But it would be much better to say nothing about what has happened this evening, better for you and for me. Neither men nor women always mean exactly what they say. We are not angels. Is it not best to let the matter drop? Unorna listened quietly, her eyes upon his face. "'You are not so hard with me as you were,' she said thoughtfully, after a moment's hesitation, and there was a touch of gratitude in her voice. As she felt the dim possibility of a return to her former relations of friendship with him, Beatrice and the scene in the church seemed to be very far away. Again the wanderer found it difficult to answer. "'It is not for me to be hard, as you call it,' he said quietly. There was a scarcely perceptible smile on his face, brought there not by any feeling of satisfaction, but by his sense of his own almost laughable perplexity. He saw that he was very near being driven to the ridiculous necessity of giving her some advice of the paternal kind. "'It is not for me either to talk to you of what you have done to Israel Kafka today he confessed. Do not oblige me to say anything about it. It will be much safer. You know it all better than I do, and you understand your own reasons, as I never can. If you are sorry for him now, so much the better. You will not hurt him any more if you can help it. If you will say that much about the future, I shall be very glad, I confess. Do you think that there is anything which I will not do, if you ask it? Unorna asked very earnestly. "'I do not know,' the wanderer answered, trying to seem to ignore the meaning conveyed by her tone. "'Some things are harder to do than others.' "'Ask me the hardest,' she exclaimed. "'Ask me to tell you the whole truth.' "'No,' he said firmly, in the hope of checking an outburst of passionate speech. "'What you have thought and done is no concern of mine.' If you have done anything that you are sorry for, without my knowledge, I do not wish to know of it. I have seen you do many good and kind acts during the last month, and I would rather leave those memories untouched as far as possible. 
You may have had an object in doing them, which in itself was bad. I do not care. The deeds were good. Take credit for them, and let me give you credit for them. That will do neither of us any harm." "'I could tell you, if you would let me—' "'Do not tell me,' he interrupted. "'I repeat, that I do not wish to know. The one thing that I have seen is bad enough. Let that be all. Do you not see that? Besides, I am myself the cause of it in a measure, unwilling enough, heaven knows. The only cause, said Unorna bitterly. Then I am in some way responsible. I am not quite without blame. We men never are in such cases. If I reproach you, I must reproach myself as well. Reproach yourself? Ah, no! What can you say against yourself? She could not keep the love out of her voice, if she would. Her bitterness had been for herself. I will not go into that, he answered. I am to blame in one way or another. Let us say no more about it. Will you let the matter rest? And let bygones be bygones, and be friends to each other as we were this morning? she asked, with a ray of hope. The wanderer was silent for a few seconds. His difficulties were increasing. A while ago he had told her, as an excuse for herself, that men and women did not always mean exactly what they say, and even now he did not set himself up in his own mind as an exception to the rule. Very honorable and truthful men do not act upon any set of principles in regard to truth and honor. Their instinctively brave actions and naturally noble truthfulness make those principles which are held up to the unworthy for imitation, by those whose business is the teaching of what is good. The wanderer's only hesitation lay between answering the question or not answering it. "'Shall we be friends again?' Unorna asked a second time, in a low tone. "'Shall we go back to the beginning?' "'I do not see how that is possible.' he answered slowly. Unorna was not like him, and did not understand such a nature as his as she understood Keorg Arabian. She had believed that he would at least hold out some hope. "'You might have spared me that,' she said, turning her face away. There were tears in her voice. A few hours earlier his answer would have brought fire to her eyes and anger to her voice, but a real change had come over her not lasting, perhaps, but strong in its immediate effects. "'Not even a little friendship left?' she said, breaking the silence that followed. "'I cannot change myself,' he answered, almost wishing that he could. "'I ought, perhaps,' he added, as though speaking to himself. "'I have done enough harm as it is.' "'Harm? To whom?' She looked round suddenly, and he saw the moisture in her eyes. "'To him,' he replied, glancing at Kafka. "'And to you. You loved him once. I have ruined his life.' "'Loved him? No, I never loved him.' She shook her head, wondering whether she spoke the truth. "'You must have made him think so. I? No, he is mad.' but she shrank before his honest look and suddenly broke down. "'No, I will not lie to you. You are too true. Yes, I loved him, or I thought I did, until you came and I saw that there was no one.' But she checked herself, as she felt the blood rising to her cheeks. She could blush still and still be ashamed. Even she was not all bad, now that she was calm and that the change had come over her. You see, the wanderer said gently, I am to blame for it all. For it all? No, not for the thousandth part of it all. What blame have you in being what you are? Blame God in heaven for making such a man. Blame me for what you know. Blame me for all that you will not let me tell you. Blame Kafka for his mad belief in me, and Keorg Arabian for the rest. But do not blame yourself. Oh, no not that. Do not talk like that, Unorna, he said. Be just first. What is justice? she asked. Then she turned her head away again. 
if you knew what justice means for me, you would not ask me to be just. You would be more merciful." "'You exaggerate.' He spoke kindly, but she interrupted him. "'No, you do not know, that is all. And you can never guess. There is only one man living who could imagine such things as I have done, and tried to do. He is Keorg Arabian. But he would have been wiser than I, perhaps.' She relapsed into silence. Before her rose the dim altar in the church, the shadowy figure of Beatrice standing up in the dark, the horrible sacrilege that was to have been done. Her face grew dark with fear of her own soul. The wanderer went so far as to try and distract her from her gloomy thoughts out of pure kindness of heart. "'I am no theologian,' he said but I fancy that in the long reckoning the intention goes far more than the act." "'The intention!' she cried, looking back with a start. "'If that be true!' With a shudder she buried her face in her two hands, pressing them to her eyes as though to blind them to some awful sight. Then, with a short struggle, she turned to him again. "'There is no forgiveness for me in heaven,' she said. Shall there be none on earth, not even a little, from you to me?" "'There is no question of forgiveness between you and me. You have not injured me, but Israel Kafka. Judge for yourself which of us two, he or I, has anything to forgive. I am to-day what I was yesterday and may be to-morrow. He lies there, dying of his love for you, if ever a man died for love and as though that were not enough, you have tortured him. Well, I will not speak of it. But that is all. I know nothing of the deeds or intentions of which you accuse yourself. You are tired, overwrought, worn out with all this. What shall I say? It is natural enough, I suppose." "'You say there is no question of forgiveness,' she said, interrupting him, but speaking more calmly. "'What is it, then? What is the real question? If you have nothing to forgive, why can we not be friends as we were before?" There is something besides that needed. It is not enough that of two people neither should have injured the other. You have broken something, destroyed something. I cannot mend it. I wish I could." "'You wish you could?' she repeated earnestly. "'I wish that the thing had not been done. I wish that I had not seen what I saw to-day. We should be where we were this morning, and he perhaps would not be here." "'It must have come some day,' Unorna said. "'He must have seen that I loved... that I loved you. Is there any use in not speaking plainly now? Then, at some other time, in some other place, he would have done what he did, and I should have been angry and cruel for it is my nature to be cruel when I am angry, and to be angry easily at that. Men talk so easily of self-control, and self-command, and dignity, and self-respect. They have not loved. That is all. I am not angry now, nor cruel. I am sorry for what I did, and I would undo it, if deeds were nots and wishes deeds. I am sorry, beyond all words to tell you. How poor it sounds now that I have said it! You do not even believe me." "'You are wrong. I know that you are in earnest.' "'How do you know?' she asked bitterly. "'Have I never lied to you? If you believed me, you would forgive me. If you forgave me, your friendship would come back. I cannot even swear to you that I am telling the truth. Heaven would not be my witness now if I told a thousand truths, each truer than the last." "'I have nothing to forgive,' the wanderer said, almost wearily. "'I have told you so. You have not injured me but him.' "'But if it meant a whole world to me! No, for I am nothing to you. But if it cost you nothing but the little breath that can carry the three words, would you say it? Is it much to say? Is it like saying, I love you, or I honor you, respect you? It is so little and would mean so much. To me it can mean nothing, unless you ask me to forgive you deeds of which I know nothing, and then it means still less to me. Will you say it? 
only say the three words once. I forgive you, said the wanderer quietly. It cost him nothing, and to him meant less. Unorna bent her head and was silent. It was something to have heard him say it, though he could not guess the least of the sins which she made it include. She herself hardly knew why she had so insisted. Perhaps it was only the longing to hear the words kind in themselves, if not in tone, nor in his meaning of them. Possibly, too, she felt a dim presentiment of her coming end, and would take it with her that infinitesimal grain of pardon to the state in which she hoped for no other forgiveness. "'It was good of you to say it,' she said at last. A long silence followed, during which the thoughts of each went their own way. Suddenly Israel Kafka stirred in his sleep. The wanderer went quickly forward and knelt down beside him and arranged the silken pillow as best he could. Unorna was on the other side almost as soon. With a tenderness of expression and touch which nothing can describe, she moved the sleeping head into a comfortable position and smoothed the cushion, and drew up the furs disturbed by the nervous hands. The wanderer let her have her way. When she had finished, their eyes met. He could not tell whether she was asking his approval and word of encouragement, but he withheld neither. "'You are very gentle with him. He would thank you if he could.' "'Did you not tell me to be kind to him?' she said. "'I am keeping my word. But he would not thank me. He would kill me if he were awake.' The wanderer shook his head. "'He was ill and mad with pain,' he answered. He did not know what he was doing. When he wakes, it will be different. Unorna rose, and the wanderer followed her. "'You cannot believe that I care,' she said, as she resumed her seat. "'He is not you. My soul would not be the nearer to peace for a word of his.' For a long time she sat quite still, her hands lying idly in her lap her head bent wearily as though she bore a heavy burden. "'Can you not rest?' the wanderer asked at length. "'I can watch alone.' "'No, I cannot rest. I shall never rest again.' The words came slowly, as though spoken to herself. "'Do you bid me to go?' she asked after a time, looking up and seeing his eyes fixed on her. Bid you go, in your own house?" The tone was one of ordinary courtesy. Unorna smiled sadly. "'I would rather you struck me than you spoke to me like that!' she exclaimed. "'You have no need of such civil forbearance with me. If you bid me go, I will go. If you bid me stay, I will not move. Only speak frankly. Say which you would prefer.' "'Then stay,' said the wanderer simply. She bowed her head slightly and was silent again. A distant clock chimed the hour. The morning was slowly drawing near. "'And you,' said Unorna, looking up at the sound, "'will you not rest? Why should you not sleep?' "'I am not tired.' "'You do not trust me, I think,' she answered sadly. "'And yet you might. You might.' Her voice died away dreamily. "'Trust you to watch that poor man? Indeed I do. You were not acting just now, when you touched him so tenderly. You are in earnest. You will be kind to him, and I thank you for it. And you yourself? Do you fear nothing from me, if you should sleep before my eyes? Do you not fear that in your unconsciousness I might touch you and make you more unconscious still, and make you dream dreams and see visions?" The wanderer looked at her and smiled incredulously, partly out of scorn for the imaginary danger, and partly because something told him that she had changed, and would not attempt any of her witchcraft upon him. "'No,' he answered. "'I am not afraid of that.' "'You are right.' she said gravely. My sins are enough already. The evil is sufficient. Do as you will. If you can sleep, then sleep in peace. 
If you will watch, watch with me." Then neither spoke again. Unorna bent her head, as she had done before. The wanderer leaned back, resting comfortably against the cushion of the high carved chair, his eyes directed towards the place where Israel Kafka lay. The air was warm, the scent of the flowers sweet but not heavy. The silence was intense, for even the little fountain was still. He had watched almost all night, and his eyelids drooped. He forgot Unorna and thought only of the sick man, trying to fix his attention on the pale head as it lay under the bright light. When Unorna looked up at last she saw that he was asleep. At first she was surprised, in spite of what she had said to him half an hour earlier, for she herself could not have closed her eyes and felt that she could never close them again. Then she sighed. It was but one proof more of his supreme indifference. He had not even cared to speak to her, and if she had not constantly spoken to him throughout the hours they had passed together, he would perhaps have been sleeping long before now. And yet she feared to wake him, and was almost glad that he was unconscious. In the solitude she could gaze on him to her heart's desire, she could let her eyes look their fill, and no one could say her nay. He must be very tired, she thought, and she vaguely wondered why she felt no bodily weariness, when her soul was so heavy. She sat still and watched him. It might be the last time, she thought, for who could tell what would happen tomorrow? She shuddered as she thought of it all. What would Beatrice do? What would Sister Paul say? How much would she tell of what she had seen? How much had she really seen which she could tell clearly? There were terrible possibilities in the future if all were known. Such deeds, and even the attempt at such deeds, as she had tried to do, could be judged by the laws of the land, she might be brought to trial, if she lived, as a common prisoner, and held up to the execration of the world in all her shame and guilt. But death would be worse than that. As she thought of that other judgment, she grew dizzy with horror, as she had been when the idea had first entered her brain. Then she was conscious that she was again looking at the wanderer as he lay back asleep in his tall chair. The pale and noble face expressed the stainless soul and the manly character. She saw in it the peace she had lost, and yet knew that through him she had lost her peace forever. It was, perhaps, the last time. Never again, perhaps, after the morning had broken, should she look on what she loved best on earth. She would be gone, ruined, dead, perhaps. And he, he would be still himself. He would remember her, half carelessly, half in wonder, as a woman who had once been almost his friend. That would be all that would be left of him in her, beyond a memory of the repulsion he had felt for her deeds. She fancied she could have met the worst in the future less hopelessly if he could have remembered her a little more kindly when all was over. Even now it might be in her power to cast a veil upon the pictures in his mind. But the mere thought was horrible to her, though a few hours before she had hardly trembled at the doing of a frightful sacrilege. In that short time the humiliation of failure, the realization of what she had almost done, above all the ever-rising tide of a real and passionate love, had swept away many familiar landmarks in her thoughts, and had turned much to lead which had once seemed brighter than gold. She hated the very idea of using again those arts which had so directly wrought her utter destruction. But she longed to know that, in the world whither he would doubtless go to-morrow, he would bear with him one kind memory of her, one natural friendly thought not grafted upon his mind by her power, but growing of its own self in his inmost heart. Only a friendly memory, nothing more than that. She rose noiselessly and came to his side and looked down into his face. Very long she stood there, motionless as a statue, beautiful as a morning angel. It was so little that she asked. It was so little compared with all she had hoped, or in comparison with all she had demanded, so little in respect of what she had given. For she had given her soul. 
and in return she asked only for one small kindly thought when all should be over. She bent down as she stood and touched his cool forehead with her lips. "'Sleep on, my beloved,' she said in a voice that murmured softly and sadly. She started a little at what she had done, and drew back, half afraid, like an innocent girl. But as though he had obeyed her words, he seemed to sleep more deeply still. He must be very tired, she thought, to sleep like that, but she was thankful that the soft kiss, the first and last, had not waked him. "'Sleep on,' she said again, in a whisper scarcely audible to herself. "'Forget you, Norna, if you cannot think of her mercifully and kindly. Sleep on, you have the right to rest, and I can never rest again.' You have forgiven. Forget, too, then, unless you can remember better things of me than I have deserved in your memory. Let her take her kingdom back. It was never mine. Remember what you will. Forget at least the wrong I did, and forgive the wrong you never knew, for you will know it surely some day. Ah, love, I love you so. Dream but one dream, and let me think I can take her place." She never loved you more than I, she never can. She would not have done what I have done. Dream only that I am Beatrice for this once. Then, when you wake, you will not think so cruelly of me. Oh, that I might be she, and you your loving self, that I might be she for one day in thought and word, in deed and voice, in face and soul. Dear love, you would never know it, yet I should know that you had had one loving thought for me. You would forget. It would not matter then to you, for you would have only dreamed, and I should have the certainty, forever, to take with me always. As though the words carried a meaning with them to his sleeping senses, a look of supreme and almost heavenly happiness stole over his sleeping face. But Unorna could not see it. She had turned suddenly away, burying her face in her hands upon the back of her own chair. "'Are there no miracles left in heaven?' she moaned, half whispering, lest she should wake him. "'Is there no miracle of deeds undone again, and of forgiveness given, for me? God, God, that we should be forever what we make ourselves!' There were no tears in her eyes now, as there had been twice that night. In her despair, that fountain of relief, shallow always and not apt to overflow, was dried up and scorched with pain. And, for the time at least, worse things were gone from her, though she suffered more. As though some portion of her passionate wish had been fulfilled, she felt that she could never do again what she had done. She felt that she was truthful now as he was, and that she knew evil from good even as Beatrice knew it the horror of her sins took new growth in her changed division. "'Was I lost from the first beginning?' she asked passionately. "'Was I born to be all I am, and foredestined to do all I have done? Was she born an angel, and I a devil from hell? What is it all? What is this life, and what is that other beyond it?' Behind her, in his chair, the wanderer still slept. Still his face wore the radiant look of joy that had so suddenly come into it as she turned away. He scarcely breathed, so calmly he slept. But Unorna did not raise her head nor look at him, and on the carpet near her feet Israel Kafka lay as still and as deeply unconscious as the wanderer himself. By a strange destiny she sat there, between the two men in whom her whole life had been wrecked, and she alone was waking. When she at last raised her eyes the dawn was breaking. Through the transparent roof of glass a cold gray light began to descend upon the warm, still brightness of the lamps. The shadows changed, the colors grew more cold, the dark nooks among the heavy foliage less black. Israel Kafka's face was ghostly and livid. The wanderers had the alabaster transparency that comes upon some strong men in sleep. Still, Neither stirred. Unorna turned from one and looked upon the other. 
For the first time she saw how he had changed, and wondered. "'How peacefully he sleeps,' she thought. "'He is dreaming of her.' The dawn came stealing on, not soft and blushing as in southern lands, but cold, resistless, and grim as ancient fate. Not the maiden herald of the sun, with rose-tipped fingers and gray, liquid eyes, but hard, cruel, sullen, and less darkness following upon a greater, and going before a dull, sunless, and heavy day. The door opened somewhat noisily, and a brisk step fell upon the marble pavement. Unorna rose noiselessly to her feet, and hastening along the open space, came face to face with Keorg Arabian. He stopped and looked up at her from beneath his heavy brows, with surprise and suspicion. She raised one finger to her lips. "'You here already?' he asked, obeying her gesture and speaking in a low voice. "'Hush! Hush!' she whispered, not satisfied. "'They are asleep. You will wake them.' Keorg came forward. He could move quietly enough when he chose. He glanced at the wanderer. He looks comfortable enough," he whispered, half contemptuously. Then he bent down over Israel Kafka and carefully examined his face. To him the ghastly pallor meant nothing. It was but the natural result of excessive exhaustion. "'Put him into a lethargy,' he said under his breath, but with authority in his manner. Unorna shook her head. Keorg's small eyes brightened angrily. "'Do it!' he said. What is this caprice? Are you mad? I want to take his temperature without waking him." Unorna folded her arms. "'Do you want him to suffer more?' asked Keorg, with a diabolical smile. "'If so, I will wake him by all means. I am always at your service, you know.' "'Will he suffer, if he wakes naturally?' "'Horribly. In the head.' Unorna knelt down and let her hand rest a few seconds on Kafka's brow. The features, drawn with pain, immediately relaxed. "'You have hypnotized the one,' grumbled Keorg as he bent down again. "'I cannot imagine why you should object to doing the same for the other.' "'The other?' Unorna repeated in surprise. "'Our friend there, in the armchair.' "'It is not true. He fell asleep of himself.' Keorg smiled again, incredulously this time. He had already applied his pocket thermometer and looked at his watch. Unorna had risen to her feet, disdaining to defend herself against the imputation expressed in his face. Some minutes passed in silence. "'He has no fever,' said Keorg, looking at the little instrument. "'I will call the individual, and we will take him away.' "'Where?' "'To his lodging, of course.' Where else? He turned and went towards the door. In a moment Unorna was kneeling again by Kafka's side, her hand upon his forehead, her lips close to his ear. "'This is the last time that I will use my power on you or upon anyone,' she said quickly, for the time was short. "'Obey me, as you must. Do you understand me? Will you obey?' "'Yes.' came the faint answer, as from very far off. "'You will wake two hours from now. You will not forget all that has happened, but you will never love me again. I forbid you ever to love me again. Do you understand?' "'I understand.' "'You will only forget that I have told you this, though you will obey. You will see me again.' and if you can forgive me of your own free will, forgive me then. That must be of your own free will. Wake in two hours of yourself, without pain or sickness." Again she touched his forehead, and then sprang to her feet. Keorg was coming back with his dumb servant. At a sign the individual lifted Kafka from the floor, taking him from the wanderer's furs and wrapping him in the others which Keorg had brought. The strong man walked away with his burden as though he were carrying a child. Keorg Arabian lingered a moment. "'What made you come back so early?' he asked. "'I will not tell you,' she answered, drawing back. 
No. Well, I am not curious. You have an excellent opportunity now. An opportunity? Unorna repeated with a cold interrogative. Excellent, said the little man, standing on tiptoe to reach her ear, for she would not bend her head. You have only to whisper into his ear that you are Beatrice, and he will believe you for the rest of his life. Go, said Unorna. Though the word was not spoken above her breath, it was fierce and commanding. Kaork Arabian smiled in an evil way, shrugged his shoulders, and left her. End of chapter 23《Chapter Twenty Four of the Witch of Prague: A Fantastic Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague: A Fantastic Tale by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter Twenty Four. When Norna was left alone with the wanderer, his attitude did not change, his eyes did not open as she stood before him. Still he wore the look which had at first attracted Keyork Arabian's attention, and which had amazed Unorna herself. It was the expression that had come into his face in the old cemetery, when in his sleep she had spoken to him of love. He is dreaming of her, Unorna said to herself again, as she turned sadly away. But since Keyork had been with her, a doubt had assailed her which painfully disturbed her thoughts, so that her brow contracted with anxiety, and from time to time she drew a quick hard breath. Keyork had taken it for granted that the wanderer's sleep was not natural. She tried to recall what had happened shortly before dawn, but it was no wonder that her memory served her ill, and refused to bring back distinctly the words she had spoken. Her whole being was unsettled and shaken, so that she found it hard to recognize herself. The stormy hours through which she had lived since yesterday had left their trace. The lack of rest, instead of producing physical exhaustion, had brought about an excessive mental weariness, and it was not easy for her now to find all the connecting links between her actions. Then, above all else, there was the great revulsion that had swept over her and after her last and greatest plan of evil had failed, causing in her such a change as could hardly have seemed natural or even possible to a calm person watching her inmost thoughts. And yet such sudden changes take place daily in the world of crime and passion, in one uncalled for confession, of which it is hard to trace the smallest reasonable cause, the intricate wickedness of a lifetime are revealed and repeated. In the mysterious impulse of a moment, the murderer turns back and delivers himself to justice. Under an influence for which there is often no accounting, the woman who has sinned securely through long years lays bare her guilt and throws herself upon the mercy of the man whom she has so skillfully and consistently deceived. We know the fact. The reason we cannot know. Perhaps, to nature's not wholly bad, sin is a poison of which the moral organization can only bear a certain fixed amount, great or small, before rejecting it altogether and with loathing. We do not know. We speak of the workings of conscience, not understanding what we mean. It is like that subtle something which we call electricity. We can play with it, command it, lead it, neutralize it, and die of it, make light and heat with it, or language and sound kill with it and cure with it, while absolutely ignorant of its nature. We are no nearer to a definition of it than the Greek who rubbed a bit of amber and lifted with it a tiny straw, and from amber electron called the something electricity. Are we even as near as that to a definition of the human conscience? The change that had come over Unorna, whether it was to be lasting or not, was profound. The circumstances under which it took place are plain enough. The reasons must be left to themselves. It remains only to tell the consequences which thereon follow. The first of these was a hatred of that extraordinary power with which nature had endowed her, which brought with it a determination never again to make use of it for any evil purpose, and, if possible, never even for good. But as though her unhappy fate were forever fighting against her good impulses, that power of hers had exerted itself unconsciously since her resolution had been formed. Georg Arabian's words, and his evident though unspoken disbelief in her denial, showed her that he at least had, was convinced of the fact that the wanderer was not sleeping a natural sleep. Unorna tried to recall what she had done and said, 
but all was vague and indistinct. Of one thing she was sure. She had not laid her hand upon his forehead, and she had not intentionally done any of those things which she had always believed necessary for producing the results of hypnotism. She had not willed him to do anything. She thought and she felt sure that she had pronounced no words of the nature of a command. Step by step, she tried to reconstruct for her comfort a detailed recollection of what had passed, but every effort in that direction was fruitless. Like many men far wiser than herself, she believed in the mechanics of hypnotic science, in the touches, in the passes, in the fixed look, in the will to fascinate. More than once, Keorg Arabian had scoffed at what he called her superstitions, and had maintained that all the varying phenomena of hypnotism, all the witchcraft of the darker ages, all the visions undoubtedly shown to wandering eyes by medieval sorcerers, were traceable to moral influence, and to no other cause. Unorna could not accept his reasoning. For her there was a deeper and yet more material mystery in it, as in her own life, a mystery which she cherished as an inheritance, which impressed her with a sense of her own strange destiny and of the gulf which separated her from other women. She could not detach herself from the idea that the supernatural played a part in all her doings, and she clung to the use of gestures and passes and words in the exercise of her art, in which she fancied a hidden and secret meaning to exist. Certain things had especially impressed her. The not uncommon answer of hypnotics to the question concerning their identity, I am the image in your eyes, is undoubtedly elicited by the fact that their extraordinarily acute and perhaps magnifying vision perceives the image of themselves in the eyes of the operator with abnormal distinctiveness, and, not impossibly, of a size quite incompatible with the dimensions of the pupil. To Unorna, the answer meant something more. It suggested the actual presence of the person she was influencing in her own brain, and whenever she was undertaking anything especially difficult, she endeavored to obtain the reply relating to the image as soon as possible. In the present case, she was sure that she had done none of the things which she considered necessary to produce a definite result. She was totally unconscious of having impressed upon the sleeper any suggestion of her will. Whatever she had said, she had addressed the words to herself without any attention that they should be heard or understood. These reflections comforted her as she paced the marble floor, and yet Keorg's remark rang in her ears and disturbed her. She knew how vast his experience was and how much he could tell by a single glance at a human face. He had been familiar with every phase of hypnotism long before she had known him, and might reasonably be supposed to know by inspection whether the sleep were natural or not. That a person hypnotized may appear to sleep as naturally as one not under the influence is certain, but the condition of rest is also very often different, to a practiced eye, from that of an ordinary slumber. There is a fixity in the expression of the face, and in the attitude of the body, which cannot continue under ordinary circumstances. He had perhaps noticed both signs in the wanderer. She went back to his side and looked at him intently. She had scarcely dared to do so before, and she felt that she might have been mistaken. The light, too, had changed, for it was broad day, though the lamps were still burning. Yet, even now, she could not tell. Her judgment of what she saw was disturbed by many intertwining thoughts. At least, he was happy. Whatever she had done, if she had done anything, it had not hurt him. There was no possibility of misinterpreting the sleeping man's expression. She wished that he would wake, though she knew how the smile would fade, how the features would grow cold and indifferent, and how the gray eyes she loved would open with a look of annoyance at seeing her before him. It was like a vision of happiness in a house of sorrow to see him lying there, so happy in his sleep, so loving, so peaceful. She could make it all to last, too, if she would, and realized that with a sudden pang, the woman of whom he dreamed, whom he had loved so faithfully and sought so long, was very near him. A word from Unorna, and Beatrice could come and find him as he lay asleep, and herself opened the dear eyes. Was that sacrifice to be asked of her before she was taken away to the expiation of her sins? Fate could not be so very cruel, cool, and yet the mere idea was an added suffering. The longer she looked at him, the more the possibility grew and tortured her. After all, it was almost certain that they would meet now, and at the meeting she felt sure that all his memory would return. Why should she do anything? Why should she raise her hand to bring them to each other? It was too much to ask. 
Was it not enough that both were free, and both in the same city together, and that she had vowed neither to hurt nor hinder him? If it was their destiny to be joined together, it would so happen surely in the natural course. If not, was it her part to join them? The punishment of her sins, whatever it should be, she could not bear, but this thing she could not do. She passed her hand across her eyes as though to drive it away, and her thoughts came back to the point from which they had started. The suspense became unbearable when she realized that she did not know in what condition the wanderer would wake, nor whether, if left to nature, he would wake at all. She could not endure it any longer. She touched his sleeve lightly at first, and then more heavily. She moved his arm. It was passive in her hand and lay where she placed it. Yet she would not believe that she had made him sleep. She drew back and looked at him. Then her anxiety overcame her. Wake, she cried aloud. For God's sake, wake, I cannot bear it. His eyes opened at the sound of her voice, naturally and quietly. Then they grew wide and deep and fixed themselves in a great wonder of many seconds. Then Unorma saw no more. Strong arms lifted her suddenly from her feet and pressed her fiercely and carried her, and she hid her face. A voice she knew sounded, and she had never heard it sound, nor hoped to hear it. Beatrice, it cried, and nothing more. In the presence of that strength, in the ringing of that cry, Unorna was helpless. She had no power of thought left in her, as she felt herself borne along, body and soul, in the rush of a passion more masterful than her own. Then she was on her feet again, but his arms were round her still, and hers, whether she would or not, were clasped about his neck. Dreams, truth, faith, kept her broken, hell and heaven itself were slept away, all wrecked together in the tide of love, and through it all his voice was in her ear. Love, love, at last, from all these years you have come back, at last, at last. Broken and almost void of sense, the words came then, through the storm of his kisses and the tempest of her tears. She could no more resist him nor draw herself away than the frail ship, wind driven through crashing waves, can turn and face the blast, no more than the long dry grass can turn and quench the roaring flame, no more than the drooping willow bough can dam the torrent and force it backwards up the steep mountainside. In those short false moments, when Orna knew what happiness could mean, torn from herself, lifted high above the misery and the darkness of her real life, it was all true to her. There was no other Beatrice but herself, no other woman, whom he had ever loved. An enchantment greater than her own was upon her and held her in bonds she could neither bend nor break. She was sitting in her own chair now, and he was kneeling before her, holding her hands and looking up to her. For him the world held nothing else. For him her hair was black as night. For him the unlike eyes were dark and fathomless. For him the heavy marble hand was light, responsive, delicate. For him her face was the face of Beatrice, as he had last seen it long ago. The years had passed, indeed, and he had sought her through many lands, but she had come back to him the same, in the glory of her youth, in the strength of her love, in the divinity of her dark beauty, his always, through it all, his now, forever. For a long time he did not speak. The words rose to his lips and failed of utterance, as the first mist of early morning is drawn heavenwards to vanish in the rising sun. The long-drawn breath could have made no sound of sweeter meaning than the unspoken speech that rose in the deep gray eyes. Nature's grand organ, touched by hands divine, can yield no chord more moving than a lover's sigh. Words came at last, as after the welcome shower in summer's heat the song of birds rings through the woods, and out across the fields upon the clear earth-scented air, words fresh from their long rest within his heart, unused in years of loneliness but unforgotten and familiar still untarnished jewels from the inmost depths rich treasures from the storehouse of a deathless faith diamonds of truth rubies of passion pearls of devotion studding the golden links of the chain of love at last at last at last life of my life the day is come that is not day without you and now it will always be day for us too day without end and sun forever, and yet I have seen you always in my night, just as I see you now. As I hold your dear hands, I have held them, day by day and year by year, 
and I've smoothed that black hair of yours that I love, and kissed those dark eyes of yours many and many a thousand times. It has been so long, love, so very long, but I knew it would come some day. I knew I should find you, for you have been always with me, dear, always and everywhere. The world is all full of you, for I have wandered through it all and taken you with me and made every place yours with the thought of you and the love of you and the worship of you. For me, there is not an ocean nor a sea nor a river nor rock nor island nor broad continent of earth that has not known Beatrice and loved her name. Heart of my heart, soul of my soul, the nights and the days without you, the lands and the oceans where you were not, the endlessness of the, this little world that hid you somewhere, the littleness of the whole universe without you. How can you ever know what it has done to me? And so it is gone at last, gone as a dream of sickness in the morning of health, gone as the blackness of storm clouds and the sweep of the clear west wind, gone as the shadow of evil before the face of an angel of light. And I know it all. I see it all in your passing eyes. You knew I was true, and you knew I sought you and would find you at last, and you have waited, and there has been no other, not the thought of another, not the passing image of another between us. For I know there has not been that, and I should have known it anywhere in all these years. The chill of it would have found me, the sharpness of it would have been in my heart, no matter where, no matter how far. Yet say it, say it once, say that you have loved me too. God knows how I have loved you, how I love you now, Unorna said in a low, unsteady voice. The light that had been in his face grew brighter still as she spoke, while as she looked at him, wondering, her head thrown back against the high chair, her eyelids wet and drooping, her lips still parted, her hands in his. Small wonder if he had loved her for herself. She was so beautiful. Small wonder it would have been if she had taken Beatrice's place in his heart during those weeks of close and daily converse. But that first great love had left no fertile ground in which to plant another seed, no warmth of kindness under which the tender shoot might grow to strength, no room beneath its heaven for other branches to grow. Alone it had stood in majesty as a lordly tree, straight, tall, and evergreen, on a silent mountain top. Alone it had borne the burden of grief's heavy snows, unbent for all its loneliness. It had stood against the raging tempest, and green still, in all its giant strength of stem and branch, in all its kingly robe of unwithered foliage. Unscathed, unshaken, it yet stood. Neither storm nor lightning, wind nor rain, sun nor snow had prevailed against it to dry it up and cast it down that another might grow in its place. Yet this love was not for her to whom he spoke, and she knew it as she answered him, though she answered truly from the fullness of her heart. She had cast an enchantment over him unwittingly, and she had taken in the toils of her own magic, even as she had sworn that she would never again put forth her powers. She shuddered as she realized it all. In a few short moments she had felt his kisses and heard his words and been clasped to his heart as she had many a time madly hoped. But in those moments, too, she had known the truth of her woman's instinct when it had told her that love must be for herself and for her own sake or not be love at all. The falseness, the fathomless untruth of it would have been bad enough alone, but the truth that was so strong made it horrible. Had she but inspired him in a burning love for herself, however much against his will, it would have been very different. She would have heard her name from his lips. She would have known that all, however false, however artificial, was for herself while it might last. To know that it was real and not for her was intolerable. To see this love of his break out at last, this other love which she had dreaded, against which she had fought, which she had met with a jealousy as strong as itself, and struggled with and buried under an imposed forgetfulness, to feel its great waves surging around her and beating up against her was more than she could bear. Her face grew whiter and her hands were cold. She dreaded each moment lest he could call her Beatrice again, and say that her fair hair was black and that he loved those deep dark eyes of her. There had been one moment of happiness in that first kiss, and the first pleasure of those strong arms. The night descended. The hands that held her had not been yet unclasped. The kiss was not cold upon her cheek. The first great cry of his love had hardly died away in the softened echo, and her punishment was upon her. 
His words were lashes, his touch poison, his eyes avenging fires. As in nature's great alchemy, the diamond and the blackened coal are one. As nature with the same elements pours life and death from the same vial, with the same hand, so now the love which would have been life to Minorna was made worse than death because it was not for her. Yet the disguise was terribly perfect. The unconscious spell had done its work thoroughly. He took her for Beatrice, and her voice for Beatrice is there in the broad light, in the familiar place where he had so often talked with her for hours and known her for Unorna. But a few paces away was the very spot where she had fallen at his feet last night and wept and abused herself before him. There was the carpet on which Israel Kafka had lain throughout the long hours while they had watched together. Upon that table at her side a book lay, which they had read together but two days ago. In her own chair she sat, Unorna still, unchanged, unaltered save for him. She doubted her own senses as she heard him speak, and ever again the name of Beatrice rang in her ears. He looked at her hands, and knew them, all her black dress, and knew it for her own, and yet he poured out the eloquence of his love, kneeling, then standing, then sitting at her side, drawing her head to his shoulder and smoothing her fair hair, so black to him, with a gentle hand. She was passive through it all, as yet. There seemed to be no other way. He paused sometimes, then spoke again. Perhaps in the dream that possessed him, he heard her speak. Possibly, he was unconscious of her silence, borne along by the torrent of his own long, pent-up speech. She could not tell. She did not care to know. Of one thing alone, she thought of how to escape from it all and be alone. She feared to move, still more to rise, not knowing what he would do. As he was now, she could not tell what effect her words would have if she spoke. It might be a passing state after all. What would the awakening be? Would his forgetfulness of Beatrice and his coldness to herself return with the subsidence of his passion? Far better than to see him and hear him as he was now. And yet there were moments now and then when he pronounced no name, when he recalled no memory of the past when there was only the tenderness of love itself in his words, and then, as she listened, she could almost think it was for her. It was bitter joy, unreal and fantastic, but it was a relief. Had she loved him less, such a conflict between sense and senses would have been impossible even in imagination. But she loved him greatly, and the deep desire to be loved in turn was in her still, shaming her better thoughts, but sometimes ruling her in spite of herself and of the pain she suffered with each word self-applied. All the vast contradictions, all the measureless inconsistency, all the enormous selfishness of which human hearts are capable, had met in hers as in a battleground, fighting each other, rending what they found of herself amongst them, sometimes uniting to throw their whole weight together against the deep-rooted passion, sometimes taking side with it to drive out every other rival. It was shameful, base, despicable, and she knew it. A moment ago, she had longed to tear herself away, to silence him, to stop her ears, anything not to hear those words that cut like whips and stung like scorpions. And now again, she was listening for the next, eagerly, breathlessly, drunk with their sound and reveling almost in the unreality of their happiness they brought. More and more she despised herself as the intervals between one pang of suffering and the next grew longer, and the illusion deeper and more like reality. After all, it was he, and no other. It was the man she loved who was pouring out his own love into her ears, and smoothing her hair and pressing the hand he held. Had he not said it once, and more than once? What matter where, what matter how, provided that he loved? She had received the fulfillment of her wish, he loved her now. Under another name, in a vision, with another face and another voice, yet still she was herself. As in a storm, the thunderclaps came crashing through the air, deafening and appalling at first, then rolling swiftly into a far distance, fainter and fainter, till all is still and only the plash of the fast-falling rain is heard. So, as she listened, the tempest of her pain was passing away. Easier and easier it became to hear herself called Beatrice. Easier and easier it grew to take the other's place, to accept the kiss, the touch, the word, the pressure of the hand that were all another's due, and given to herself only for the mask she wore in his dream. And the tide of the great temptation rose and fell a little, and rose higher again each time, till it washed the fragile feet of the last good thought that lingered, taking refuge on the highest point above the waves. 
On and on it came, receding and coming back, higher and higher, surer and surer. Had she drawn back in time, it would have been so easy. Had she turned and fled when the first moment of senseless joy was over, when she could still feel all the shame and blush for all the abasement, it would have been over now, and she would have been safe. But she had learned to look upon the advancing water, and the sound of it had no more terror for her. It was very high now. Presently it would climb higher and close above her head. There were long intervals of silence now. The first rush of his speech had spent itself, for he had told her much and had heard it all, even through the mists of her changing moods. And now that he was silent, she longed to hear him speak again. She could never weary of that voice. It had been music to her in her days, when it had been full of cold indifference. Now each vibration roused high harmonies in her heart. Each note was a full chord, and all the chords made but one great progression. She longed to hear it all again, wondering greatly how it could never have been not good to hear. Then with a great temptation came the less, enclosed within it, suddenly revealed to her. There was but one thing she hated in it all. That was the name. Would he not give her another? Her own, perhaps? She trembled as she thought of speaking. Would she still have Beatrice's voice? Might not her own break down the spell and destroy all at once? Yet she had spoken once before. She had told him that she loved him, and he had not been undeceived. Beloved, she said at last, lingering on the single word and then hesitating. He looked into her face, and as he drew her near to him, with happy eyes, she might speak, then, for he would hear tones, not hers. Beloved, I'm tired of my name. Will you not call me another? She spoke very softly. By another name? He exclaimed, surprised, but smiling at what seemed a strange caprice. Yes, it is a sad name to me. It reminds me of many things, of a time that is better forgotten since it is gone. Will you do it for me? It will make it seem as though that time had never been. And yet I love your own name, he said thoughtfully. It is so much, or has been so much, in all these years, when I had nothing but your name to love. Will you not do it? It is all I ask. Indeed I will, if you would rather have it so. Do you think there is anything that I would not do if you asked it of me? They were almost the words she had spoken to him that night when they were watching together by Israel Kafka's side. She recognized them, and a strange thrill of triumph ran through her. What matter how? What matter where? The old reckless questions came to her mind again. If he loved her, and if he would but call her Unorna, what could it matter, indeed? Was she not herself? She smiled unconsciously. I see it pleases you, he said tenderly. Let it be as you wish. What name will you choose for your dear self? She hesitated. She could not tell how far he might remember what was past. And yet, if he had remembered, he would have seen where he was in the long time that had passed since his awakening. Did you ever, in your long travels, hear the name Unorna? She asked with a smile and a little hesitation. Unorna? No, I cannot remember. It is a bohemian word. It means she of February. It has a pretty sound, half familiar to me. I wonder where I have heard it. Call me Unorna, then. It will remind us that you have found me in February. End of chapter 24。Chapter 25 of The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter 25. After carefully locking and bolting the door of the sacristy, Sister Paul turned to Beatrice. She had set down her lamp upon the broad, polished shelf which ran all around the place, forming the top of a continuous series of cupboards, as in most sacristies, used for the vestments of the church. At the back of these high presses rose halfway to the spring of the vault. The nun seemed a little nervous, and her voice quavered oddly as she spoke. If she had tried to take up her lamp, her hand would have shaken. In the moment of danger, she had been brave and determined, but now that all was over, her enfeebled strength felt the reaction from the strain. She turned to Beatrice and met her flashing black eyes. The young girl's delicate nostrils quivered, and her lips curled fiercely. "'You are angry, my dear child,' said Sister Paul. "'So am I, and it seems to me that our anger is just enough. Be angry and sin not. I think we can apply that to ourselves.' "'Who is that woman?' 
Beatrice asked. She was certainly angry, as the nun had said, but she felt by no means sure that she could resist the temptation of sinning if it presented itself as the possibility of tearing Unorna to pieces. She was once with us, the nun answered. I knew her when she was a mere girl, and I loved her then, in spite of her strange ways. But she has changed. They call her a witch, and indeed I think it is the only name for her. I do not believe in witches, said Beatrice, a little scornfully. But whatever she is, she is bad. I do not know what it is that she wanted me to do in the church, upon the altar there. It was something horrible. Thank God you came in time. What could it have been, I wonder? Sister Paul shook her head sorrowfully, but said nothing. She knew no more than Beatrice of Norna's intention, but she believed in the existence of a black art, full of sacrilegious practices, and credited Unorna vaguely with the worst designs which she could think of, though in her goodness she was not able to imagine anything much worse than the saying of a pater noster backwards in a consecrated place. But she preferred to say nothing, lest she should judge Unorna unjustly. After all, she did not know. What she had seen had seemed bad enough and strange enough, but apart from the fact that Beatrice had been found upon the altar, where she certainly had no business to be, and that Unorna had acted like a guilty woman, there was little to lay hold of in way of fact. My child, she said at last, until we know more of the truth and have better advice than we can give each other, let us not speak of it to any one of the sisters. In the morning I will tell all I have seen in confession, and then I shall get advice. Perhaps you should do the same. I know nothing of what happened before you left your room. Perhaps you have something to reproach yourself with. It is not for me to ask. Think it over. I will tell you the whole truth, Beatrice answered, resting her elbow upon the polished shelf and supporting her head in her hand while she looked earnestly into Sister Paul's faded eyes. Think well, my daughter. I have no right to any confession from you. If there is anything... Sister Paul, you are a woman, and I must have a woman's help. I have learned something tonight which will change my whole life. No, do not be afraid. I have done nothing wrong. At least, I hope not. While my father lived, I submitted. I hoped, but I gave no sign. I did not even write, as I once might have done. I have often wished that I had. Was that wrong? But you have told me nothing, dear child. How can I answer you? The nun was perplexed. True, I will tell you. Sister Paul, I am five and twenty years old. I am a grown woman, and this is no mere girl's love story. Seven years ago, I was only eighteen then, I was with my father, as I have been ever since. My mother had not been dead long then. Perhaps that is the reason why I seemed to be everything to my father. But they had not been happy together, and I had loved her best. We were traveling, no matter where, and then I met the man I have loved. He was not of our country, that is, of my father's. He was of the same people as my mother. Well, I loved him. How dearly you must guess and try to understand. I could not tell you that. No one could. It began gradually, for he was often with us in those days. My father liked him for his wit, his learning, though he was young, for his strength and manliness, for a hundred reasons which were nothing to me. I would have loved him had he been a cripple, poor, ignorant, despised, instead of being what he was, the grandest, noblest man God ever made. For I did not love him for his face, nor for his courtly ways, nor for such gifts as other men might have, but for himself and for his heart. Do you understand? For his goodness, said Sister Paul, nodding in approval. I understand. No, Beatrice answered, half impatiently. Not for his goodness, either. Many men are good, and so was he. He must have been, of course. No matter. I loved him. That is enough. He loved me, too. And one day we were alone, in the broad spring sun, upon a terrace. There were lemon trees there. I can see the place. Then we told each other that we loved, but neither of us could find the words. They must be somewhere, the strong, beautiful words that could tell how we loved. We told each other. Without your father's consent? asked the nun, almost severely. Beatrice's eyes flashed. Is a woman's heart a dog that must follow at heel? She asked fiercely. We loved. That was enough. My father had the power, but not the heart, to come between. We told him then, for we were not cowards. We told him boldly that it must be. He was a thoughtful man who spoke little. 
He said that we must part at once before we loved each other better, and that we should soon forget. We looked at each other, the man I loved and I. We knew that we should love better yet, parted or together, though we could not tell how that could be. But we knew also that such love as there was between us was enough. My father gave no reasons, but I knew that he hated the name of my mother's nation. Of course we met again. I remember that I could cry in those days. My father had not learned to part us then. Perhaps he was not quite sure himself. At all events, the parting did not come so soon. We told him that we would wait, forever if it must be. He may have been touched, though little touched him at the best. Then, one day, suddenly and without warning, he took me away to another city. And what of him? I asked. He told me that there was an evil fever in the city that it had seized him, the man I loved. He is free to follow us if he pleases, said my father, but he never came. Then followed a journey, and another, and another, until I knew that my father was traveling to avoid him. When I saw that, I grew silent and never spoke his name again. Farther and farther, longer and longer, to the ends of the earth. We saw many people, many asked for my hand. Sometimes I heard of him, from men who had seen him lately. I waited patiently, for I knew that he was on our track, and sometimes I felt that he was near. Beatrice paused. It is a strange story, said Sister Paul, who had rarely heard a tale of love. The strange thing is, Beatrice answered, that woman, what is her name? Unorna? She loves him, and she knows where he is. Unorna? repeated the nun in bewilderment. Yes. She met me after Compline tonight. I could not but speak to her, and then I was deceived. I cannot tell whether she knew what I am to him, but she deceived me utterly. She told me a strange story of her own life. I was lonely. In all those years I had never spoken of what has filled me. I cannot tell how it was. I began to speak, and then I forgot that she was there, and told all. She made you tell her, by her secret arts, said Sister Paul in a low voice. No. I was lonely, and I believed that she was good, and I felt that I must speak. Then, I cannot think how I could have been so mad, but I thought that we should never meet again, and I showed her a likeness of him. She turned on me. I shall not forget her face. I heard her say that she knew him and loved him, too. When I awoke, I was lying on the altar. That is all I know. Her evil arts, her evil arts, repeated the nun, shaking her head. Come, my dear child, let us see if all is in order there, upon the altar. If these things are to be known, they must be told in the right quarter. The sacristan must not see that any one has been in the church. Sister Paul took up the lamp, but Beatrice laid a hand upon her arm. You must help me to find him, she said firmly. He is not far away. Her companion looked at her in astonishment. Help you to find him? she stammered. But, but I cannot... I do not know... I'm afraid it is not right. An affair of love? An affair of life, Sister Paul, and of death, too, perhaps. This woman lives in Prague. She is rich and must be well-known. Well-known indeed, too well-known. The witch, they call her. Then there are those who know her. Tell me the name of one person only. It is impossible that you should not remember someone who is acquainted with her, who has talked with you of her, perhaps one of the ladies who have been here in retreat. The nun was silent for a moment, gathering her recollections. There is one, at least, who knows her, she said at length. A great lady here. It is said that she, too, meddles with forbidden practices and that Unorna has often been with her, that together they have called up the spirits of the dead with strange wrappings and writings. She knows her, I'm sure, for I've talked with her, and she says it is all natural, and that there is a learned man with them sometimes who explains how all such things may happen in the course of nature. A man, let me see, let me see. It is George, I think, but not as we call it, not Girgi nor Gigor, no. It sounds harder, Kirgi, no. Kyork, Kyork Aribi, Kyork Arabian, exclaimed Beatrice. Is he here? You know him? Sister Paul looked almost suspiciously at the young girl. Indeed I do. He was with us in Egypt once. He showed us wonderful things among the tomes. A strange little man who knew everything, but very amusing. I do not know. 
but that is his name. He lives in Prague. How can I find him? I must see him at once. He will help me. The nun shook her head with disapproval. I should be sorry that you should talk with him, she said. I fear he is no better than Unorna, and perhaps worse. You need not fear, Beatrice answered with a scornful smile. I am not in the least afraid. Only tell me how I am to find him. He lives here, you say. Is there no directory in the convent? I believe the portress keeps such a book, said Sister Paul, still shaking her head uneasily. But you must wait until the morning, my dear child, if you will do this thing. Of the two, I should say that you would do better to write to the lady. Come, we must be going. It is very late. She had taken the lamp again and was moving slowly towards the door. Beatrice had no choice but to submit. It was evident that nothing more could be done at present. The two women were back into the church, and going round the high altar began to examine everything carefully. The only trace of disorder they could discover was the fallen candlestick, so massive and strong that it was not even bent or injured. They climbed the short wooden steps, and uniting their strength, set it up again, carefully and in its place, restoring the thick candle to the socket. Though broken in the middle by the fall, the heavy wax supported itself easily enough. Then they got down again, and Sister Paul took away the steps. For a few moments, both women knelt down before the altar. They left the church by the nuns' staircase, bolting the door behind them, and descended to the corridors and reached Beatrice's room. Unorna's door was open, as the nun had left it, and the yellow light streamed upon the pavement. She went in and extinguished the lamp, and then came back to Beatrice. Are you not afraid to be alone after what has happened? she asked. Afraid? Of what? No, indeed. Then she thanked her companion again and kissed Sister Paul's waxen cheek. Say a prayer, my daughter, and may all be well with you, now and ever, said the good sister as she went away through the darkness. She needed no light in the familiar way to her cell. Beatrice searched among her numerous belongings and at last brought out a writing case. Then she sat down to her table by the light of the lamp that had illuminated so many strange sights that night. She wrote the name of the convent clearly upon the paper and then wrote a plain message in the fewest possible words. Something of her strong, devoted nature showed itself in her handwriting. Beatrice Varanger begs that Keyork Arabian will meet her in the parlor of the convent as soon after receiving this as possible. The matter is very important. She had reasons of her own for believing that Keyork had not forgotten her in the five years or more since they had been in Egypt together. Apart from the fact that his memory had always been surprisingly good, he had at that time professed the most unbounded admiration for her and she remembered, with a smile, his quaint devotion, his fantastic courtesy, and his gnome-like attempts at grace. She folded the note to wait for the address which she could not ascertain until the morning. She could do nothing more. It was nearly two o'clock, and there was evidently nothing to be done but to sleep. As she laid her head upon the pillow, a few minutes later she was amazed at her own calm. Strong natures, and great tests, often surprise themselves far more than they surprise others. Others see the results, always simpler in proportion as they are greater. But the actors themselves alone know how hard the great and simple can seem. Beatrice's calmness was not only of the outward kind at the present moment. She felt that she was alone in the world, and that she had taken her life into her own hands. Fate had lent her the clue of her happiness at last, and she would hold it firmly to the end. It would be time enough to open the floodgates. It would have been unlike her to dwell long upon the thought of Unorna or to give way to any passionate outbreak of hatred. Why should Unorna not love him? The whole world loved him, in small wonder. She feared no rival. But he was near her now. Her heart leaped as she realized how very near he might well be, then sank again to its calm beating. He had been near her a score of times in the past, and yet they had not met but she had not been free then as she was now. There was more hope than before, but she could not delude herself with any belief in a certainty. So thinking, and so saying to herself, she fell asleep, and slept soundly without dreaming as most people do who are young and strong, and who are clear-headed and active when they are awake. It was light when she opened her eyes, and the broad cold light filled the room. She lost no time in thinking over the events of the night, for everything was fresh in her memory. 
Half-dressed, she wrapped about her a cloak that came down to her feet. Throwing a black veil over her hair, she went down to the portress's lodge. In five minutes, she had found Keorik's address and had dispatched one of the convent gardeners with the note. Then she leisurely returned to her room and set about completing her toilet. She naturally supposed that an hour or two must elapse before she received an answer, certainly before Keorik appeared in person, a fact which showed that she had forgotten something of the man's characteristics. Twenty minutes had scarcely passed, and she had not finished dressing when Sister Paul entered the room, evidently in a state of considerable anxiety. As has been seen, it chanced to be her turn to superintend the guest's quarters at that time, and the portress had of course informed her immediately of Keorik's coming, in order that she might tell Beatrice. "'He is there,' she said, as she came in. Beatrice was standing before the little mirror that hung upon the wall, trying, under no small difficulties, to arrange her hair. She turned her head quickly. "'Who is there? Keorik Arabian?' Sister Paul nodded, glad that she was not obliged to pronounce the name that had for her such an unchristian sound. "'Where is he? I did not think he could come so soon. Oh, Sister Paul, do help me with my hair. I cannot make it stay.' "'He is in the parlor downstairs,' answered the nun, coming to her assistance. "'Indeed, child. I do not see how I can help you.' She touched the black coils ineffectually. "'There. Is that better?' she asked in a timid way. "'I do not know how to do it.' "'No, no!' Beatrice exclaimed. "'Hold that end. So. Now turn it that way. No, the other way. It is in the glass. So. Now keep it there while I put in a pin. No, no, in the same place but the other way. Oh, Sister Paul, did you never do hair when you were a girl?' "'That was so long ago,' answered the nun meekly. "'Let me try again.' The result was passably satisfactory at last, and assuredly not wanting in the elements of novelty. "'Are you not afraid to go alone?' asked Sister Paul with evident preoccupation, as Beatrice put a few more touches to her toilet. But the young girl only laughed and made the more haste. Sister Paul walked with her to the head of the stairs, wishing that the rules would allow her to accompany Beatrice into the parlor. Then as the ladder went down, the nun stood at the top looking after her and audibly repeating prayers for her preservation. The convent parlor was a large, bare room, lighted by a high and grated window. Plain, straight, modern chairs were arranged against the wall at regular intervals. There was no table, but a square piece of green carpet lay upon the middle of the stone pavement. A richly ornamented glazed earthenware stove, in which a fire had just been lighted, occupied one corner, a remnant of former aesthetic taste and strangely out of place since the old carved furniture was gone. A crucifix of inferior workmanship and realistically painted hung opposite the door. The place was reserved for the use of ladies in retreat and was situated outside the constantly closed door which shut off the cloistered part of the convent from the small portion accessible to outsiders. Keorik Arabian was standing in the middle of the parlor, waiting for Beatrice. When she entered at last, he made two steps forward, bowing profoundly, and then smiled in a deferential manner. "'My dear lady,' he said, "'I am here. I have lost no time. It so happened that I received your note just as I was leaving my carriage after a morning drive. I had no idea you were in Bohemia.' "'Thanks. It was good of you to come so soon.' She sat down upon one of the stiff chairs and motioned to him to follow her example. "'And your dear father, how is he?' inquired Keurig with suave politeness as he took a seat. "'My father died a week ago,' said Beatrice gravely. Keurig's face assumed all the expression of which it was capable. "'I am deeply grieved,' he said, moderating his huge voice to a soft and purring sub-bass. "'He was an old and valued friend.' There was a moment's silence. Keurig, who knew many things, was well aware— that a silent feud, of which he also knew the cause, had existed between father and daughter when he had last been with them, and he rightly judged from his knowledge of their obstinate characters that it had lasted to the end. He thought, therefore, that his expression of sympathy had been sufficient and could pass muster. "'I asked you to come,' said Beatrice at last, "'because I wanted your help in a matter of importance to myself. "'I understand that you know a person who calls herself Unorna and who lives here.' Keorik's bright blue eyes scrutinized her face. He wondered how much she knew. "'Very well, indeed,' he answered, as though not at all surprised. "'You know something of her life, then. I suppose you see her very often, do you not?' "'Daily, I can almost say.' 
Have you any objection to answering one question about her? Twenty if you ask them, and if I know the answers, said Keyork, wondering what form the question would take, and preparing to meet a surprise with indifference. But will you answer me truly? My dear lady, I pledge you my sacred word of honor, Keyork answered with immense gravity, meeting her eyes and laying his hand upon his heart. Does she love that man, or not? Beatrice asked, suddenly showing him the little miniature of the wanderer, which she had taken from its case and had hitherto concealed in her hand. She watched every line on his face, for she knew something of him, and in reality put very little more faith in his word of honor than he did himself, which was not saying much. But she had counted upon surprising him, and she succeeded to a certain extent. His answer did not come as glibly as he could have wished, though his plan was soon formed. Who is it? Ah, dear me, my old friend. We call him the Wanderer. Well, Unorna certainly knew him when he was here. Then he is gone? Indeed, I am not quite sure, said Keyork, regaining all his self-possession. Of course I can find out for you, if you wish to know. But as regards to Unorna, I can tell you nothing. They were a good deal together at one time. I fancy he was consulting her. You have heard that she is a clairvoyante, I dare say. He made the last remark quite carelessly, as though he attached no importance to the fact. Then you do not know whether she loves him? Kirk indulged himself with a little discreet laughter, deep and musical. Love is a very vague word, he said presently. Is it? Beatrice asked, with some coldness. To me, at least, Kirk hastened to say, as though somewhat confused. But, of course, I can know very little about it in myself, and nothing about it in others. Not knowing how matters might turn out, he was willing to leave Beatrice with a suspicion of the truth, while denying all knowledge of it. You know him yourself, of course, Beatrice suggested. I have known him for years. Oh yes, for him I can answer. He was not in the least in love. I did not ask that question, said Beatrice rather haughtily. I knew he was not. Of course, of course, I beg your pardon. Keyork was learning more from her than she from him. It was true that she took no trouble to conceal her interest in the wanderer and his doings. "'Are you sure that he has left the city?' Beatrice asked. "'No, I am not positive. I could not say with certainty.' "'When did you see him last?' "'Within the week, I'm quite sure,' Keyork answered with alacrity. "'Do you know where he was staying?' "'I have not the least idea,' the little man replied, without the slightest hesitation. We met at first by chance in the Tain Kish one afternoon. It was a Sunday, I remember, about a month ago. A month ago. On a Sunday. Beatrice repeated thoughtfully. Yes, I think it was New Year's Day, too. Strange, she said. I was in the church that very morning, with my maid. I had been ill for several days. I remember how cold it was. Strange. The same day. Yes, said Keyork, noting the words, but appearing to take no notice of them. I was looking at Tycho Brahe's monuments. You know how it annoys me to forget anything. There was a word in the inscription which I could not recall. I turned round and saw him sitting just at the end of the pew nearest to the monument. The old red slab with a figure on it, by the last pillar? Beatrice asked eagerly. Exactly. I dare say you know the church very well. You remember that the pew runs very near to the monument so that there is hardly room to pass. I know, yes. She was thinking that it could hardly have been a mere accident which had led the wanderer to take the very seat she had occupied on the morning of that day. He must have seen her during the mass, but she could not imagine how he could have missed her. They had been very near then, and now a whole month had passed, and Keyork Arabian professed not to know whether the wanderer was still in the city or not. Then you wish to be informed of our friend's movements, as I understand, said Keyork, going back to the main point. Yes. What happened on that day? Beatrice asked, for she wished to hear more. Oh, on that day? Yes. Well, nothing happened worth mentioning. We talked a little and went out of the church and walked a little way together. I forget when we met next, but I have seen him at least a dozen times since then, I'm sure. Beatrice began to understand that Keyork had no intention of giving her any further information. She reflected that she had learned much in this interview. The wanderer had been, and perhaps still was, in Prague. Unorna loved him, and they had been frequently together. 
He had been in the Tain Kish on the same day she had last been there herself, and in all probability he had seen her, since he had chosen the very seat in which she had sat. Further, she gathered that Keorak had some interest in not speaking more frankly. She gave up the idea of examining him any further. He was a man not easily surprised, and it was only by means of a surprise that he could be induced to betray even by a passing expression what he meant to conceal. Her means of attack were exhausted for the present. She determined at least to repeat her request clearly before dismissing him, in the hope that it might suit his plans to fulfill it, but without the least trust in his sincerity. Will you be so kind as to make some inquiry, and let me know the result today? She asked. I will do everything to give you an an early answer, said Keorg, and I shall be the more anxious to obtain one without delay in order that I might have the very great pleasure of visiting you again. There is much that I would like to ask you, if you would allow me. For old friends, as I trust I may say that we are, you must admit that we have exchanged few, very few, confidences this morning. May I come again today? It would be an immense privilege to talk of old times with you, of our friends in Egypt, and of our many journeys. For you have no doubt travelled much since then. Your dear father, he lowered his voice reverentially, was a great traveller, as well as a very learned man. Ah, well, my dear lady, we must all make up our minds to undertake that great journey one of these days. But I pain you. I was very attached to your dear father. Command all my service. I will come again in the course of the day. With many sympathetic smiles and half comic inclinations of his short, broad body, the little man bowed himself out. End of chapter 25. Chapter 26 of The Witch of Prague A Fantastic Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague, a Fantastic Tale by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter 26 Unorna drew one deep breath when she first heard her name fall with a loving accent from the wanderer's lips. Surely the bitterness of despair was past, since she was loved and not called Beatrice. The sigh that came then was of relief already felt, the forerunner as she fancied too of a happiness no longer dimmed by shadows of fear and mists of rising remorse gazing into his eyes she seemed to be watching in their reflection a magic change she had been beatrice to him unorna to herself but now the transformation was at hand now it was to come for him she loved and who loved her she was unorna even to the name in her own thoughts she had taken the dark woman's face she had risked all upon the chances of one throw and she had won so long as he had called her by another's name the bitterness had been as gall mingled in the wine of love but now that too was gone she felt that it was complete at last her golden head sank peacefully upon his shoulder in the morning light you have been long in coming love she said only half consciously but you have come as i dreamed it is perfect now there is nothing wanting any more it is all full all real all perfect he answered softly and there is to be no more parting now neither here nor afterwards beloved then this is afterwards heaven has nothing more to give what is heaven the meeting of those who love as we have met i have forgotten what it was to live before you came for me there is nothing to remember between that day and this that day when you fell ill unorna said the loneliness the fear for you unorna scarcely knew that it had not been she who had parted from him so long ago yet she was playing a part and in the semi-consciousness of her deep self-illusion 
it all seemed as real as a vision in a dream so often dreamed that it has become part of the dreamer's life those who fall by slow degrees under the power of the all-destroying opium remember yesterday as being very far very long past and recall faint memories of last year as though a century had lived and perished since then seeing confusedly in their own lives the lives of others and other existences in their own until identity is almost gone in the endless transmigration of their souls from the shadow in one dream tale to the wraith of themselves that dreams the next so in that hour unorna drifted through the changing scenes that a word had power to call up scarce able and wholly unwilling to distinguish between her real and her imaginary self what matter how what matter where the very questions which at first she had asked herself came now but faintly as out of an immeasurable distance and always more faintly still they died away in her ears as when after long waiting and false starts and turnings back and anxious words exchanged the great race is at last begun the swift long limbs are gathered and stretched and strained and gathered again the thunder of flying hoofs is in the air and the rider with low hands and head inclined and eyes bent forward hears the last anxious word of parting counsel tremble and die in the rush of the wind behind she had really loved him throughout all those years she had really sought him and mourned for him and longed for a sight of his face they had really parted and had really found each other but a short hour since there was no beatrice but unorna and no unorna but beatrice for they were one and indivisible and interchangeable as the glance of a man's two eyes that look on one fair sight each sees alone the same but seeing together the sight grows doubly fair and all the sadness where is it now she asked and all the emptiness of that long time it never was my love it was yesterday we met we parted yesterday to meet to-day say it was yesterday the little word can undo seven years it seems like yesterday he answered indeed i can almost think so now for it was all night between but not quite dark as night is sometimes it was a night full of stars each star was a thought of you that burned softly and showed me where heaven was and darkest night they say means coming morning so when the stars went out i knew the sun must rise the words fell from her lips naturally to her it seemed true that she had indeed waited long and hoped and thought of him and it was not all false ever since her childhood she had been told to wait for her love would come and would come only once and so it was true and the dream grew sweeter and the illusion of the enchantment more enchanting still for it was an enchantment and a spell that bound them together there among the flowers the drooping palms the graceful tropic plants and the shadowy leaves and still the day rose higher but still the lamps burned on fed by the silent mysterious current that never tires blending a real light with an unreal one an emblem of unorna's self mixing and blending too with a self not hers and the sun is risen indeed she added presently am i the sun dear he asked foretasting the delight of listening to her simple answer you are the sun beloved and when you shine my eyes can see nothing else in heaven and what are you yourself beatrice no unorna is that the name you chose it is so hard to remember anything when i look at you beatrice unorna anything came the answer softly murmuring anything dear any name any face any voice if only i am i and you are you and we too love both neither anything do the blessed souls in paradise know their own names you are right what does it matter why should you need a name at all since i have you with me always it was well once it served me when i prayed for you and it served to tell me that my heart was gold 
while you were there as the goldsmith's mark upon his jewel stamps the pure metal that all men may know it you need no sign like that to show me what you are said she with a long glance nor i to tell me you are in my heart he answered it was a foolish speech would you have me wise now if wisdom is love yes if not she laughed softly then folly then folly madness anything so that this last as last it must or i shall die and why should it not last is there any reason in earth or heaven why we two should part if there is i will make that reason itself folly and madness and unreason dear do not speak of this not lasting die you say worse far worse as much as eternal death is worse than bodily dying last does any one know what for ever means if we do not die we must in these dying bodies of ours but part no love has burned the cruel sense out of that word and bleached its blackness white we wounded the devil parting with one kiss we killed him with the next this buries him ah love how sweet there was neither resistance nor the thought of resisting their lips met and were withdrawn only that their eyes might drink again the draught the lips had tasted long draughts of sweetness and liquid light and love unfathomable and in the interval of speech half false the truth of what was all true welled up from the clear depths and overflowed the falseness till it grew falser and more fleeting still as a thing lying deep in a bright water casts up a distorted image on refracted rays glance and kiss when two love are as body and soul supremely human and transcendently divine the look alone when the lips cannot meet is but the disembodied spirit beautiful even in its sorrow sad despairing saying ever and yet sighing never tasting and knowing all the bitterness of both the kiss without the glance the body without the soul the mortal thing without the undying thought draw down the thick veil and hide the sight lest devils sicken at it and lest man should loathe himself for what man can be truth or untruth their love was real hers as much as his she remembered only what her heart had been without it what her goal might be now that it had come she guessed even then but she would not ask was there never a martyr in old times more human than the rest who turned back for love perhaps if not for fear and said that for love's sake life still was sweet and brought a milk-white dove to aphrodite's altar or dropped a rose before demeter's feet there must have been for man is man and woman woman and if in the next month or even the next year or after many years that youth or maid took heart to bear a christian's death was there then no forgiveness no sign of holy cross upon the sandstone in the deep labyrinth of graves no crown no sainthood and no reverent memory of his name or hers among those of men and women worthier perhaps but not more suffering no one can kill self no one can be altogether another save in the passing passion of a moment's acting i in that syllable lies the whole history of each human life in that history lives the individuality in the clear and true conception of that individuality dwells such joint foreknowledge of the future as we can have such vague solution as to us is possible of that vast equation in which all quantities are unknown save that alone that i which we know as we can know nothing else bury it she said bury that parting the thing the word and the thought bury it with all others of its kind with change and old age and stealing indifference and growing coldness and all that cankers love bury them all together in one wide deep grave then build on it the house of what we are change indifference i do not know those words the wanderer said have they been in your dreams love they have never been in mine he spoke tenderly but with the faintest echo of sadness in his voice 
the mere suggestion that such thoughts could have been near her was enough to pain him she was silent and again her head lay upon his shoulder she found there still the rest and the peace knowing her own life the immensity of his faith and trust in that other woman were made clear by the simple heartfelt words if she had been indeed beatrice would he have loved her so if it had all been true the parting the seven years separation the utter loneliness the hopelessness the despair could she have been as true as he in the stillness that followed she asked herself the question which was so near a greater and a deadlier one but the answer came quickly that at least she could have done she could have been true to him even to death it must be so easy to be faithful when life was but one faith in that chord at least no note rang false change in love indifference to you she cried all at once hiding her lovely face in his breast and twining her arms about his neck no no i never meant that such things could be they are but empty words words one hears spoken lightly by lips that never spoke the truth by men and women who never had such truth to speak as you and i and as for old age he said dwelling upon her speech what is that to us let it come since come it must it is good to be young and fair and strong but would not you or i give up all that for love's sake each of us of our own free will rather than lose the other's love indeed indeed i would unorna answered then what of age what is it after all a few grey hairs a wrinkle here and there a slower step perhaps a dimmer glance that is all it is the quiet sunny channel between the sea of earthly joy and the ocean of heavenly happiness the breeze of love still fills the sails wafting us softly onward through the narrows never failing though it be softer and softer till we glide out scarce knowing it upon the broader water and are borne swiftly away from the lost land by the first breath of heaven his words brought peace and the mirage of a far-off rest that soothed again the little half-born doubt yes she said it is better to think so than we need think of no other change there is no other possible he answered gently pressing the shoulder upon which his hand was resting we have not waited and believed and trusted and loved for seven years to wake at last face to face as we are to-day and to find that we have trusted vainly and loved to shadows i yours and you mine to find at the great moment of all that we are not ourselves the selves we knew but others of like passions but of less endurance have we beloved and if we could love and trust and believe without each other each alone is it not all the more sure that we shall be unchanging together it must be so the whole is greater than its parts two loves together are greater and stronger than each could be of itself the strength of two strands close twined together is more than twice the strength of each she said nothing by merest chance he had said words that had waked the doubt again so that it grew a little and took a firmer hold in her unwilling heart to love a shadow he had said to wake and find self not self at all that was what might come would come must come sooner or later said the doubt what matter where or when or how the question came again vaguely faintly as a mere memory but confidently as though knowing its own answer had she not rested in his arms and felt his kisses and heard his voice what matter how indeed it matters greatly said the growing doubt rearing its head and finding speech at last it matters greatly it said for love lies not alone in voice and kiss and gentle touch but in things more enduring which to endure must be sound and whole and not cankered to the core by a living lie then came the old reckless reasoning again am i not i is he not he do i not love him with my whole strength does he not love this very self of mine here as it is my head upon his shoulder my hand within his hand and if he once loved another have i not her place to have and hold that i may be loved in her stead go said the doubt growing black and strong go for you are nothing to him but a figure in his dream disguised in the lines of one he really loved and loves go quickly before it is too late before that real beatrice comes and wakes him and drives you out of the kingdom you usurp but she knew it was only a doubt and had it been the truth 
and had beatrice's foot been on the threshold she would not have been driven away by fear but the fight had begun speak to me dear she said i must hear your voice it makes me know that it is all real how the minutes fly he exclaimed smoothing her hair with his hand it seems to me that i was but just speaking when you spoke it seems so long she checked herself wondering whether an hour had passed or but a second though love be swifter than the fleeting hours doubt can outrun a lifetime in one beating of the heart then how divinely long it all may seem he answered but can we not begin to think and to make plans for to-morrow and the next day and for the years before us that will make more time for us for with the present we shall have the future too no that is foolish again and yet it is so hard to say which i would have shall the moment linger because it is so sweet or shall it be gone quickly because the next is to be sweeter still love where is your father unorna started the question was suggested perhaps by his inclination to speak of what was to be done but it fell suddenly upon her ears as a peal of thunder when the sky has no clouds must she lie now or break the spell one word at least she could yet speak with truth dead dead the wanderer repeated thoughtfully and with a faint surprise is it long ago beloved he asked presently in a subdued tone as though fearing to wake some painful memory yes she answered the great doubt was taking her heart in its strong hands now and tearing it and twisting it and whose house is this in which i have found you darling was it his it is mine unorna said how long would he ask questions to which she could find true answers what question would come next there were so many he might ask and few to which she could reply so truthfully even in that narrow sense of truth which found its only meaning in a whim of chance but for a moment he asked nothing more not mine she said it is yours you cannot take me and yet call anything mine ours then what does it matter so he died long ago poor man and yet it seems but a little while since some one told me but that was a mistake of course he did not know how many years may it be dear one i see you still wear mourning for him no that was but a fancy to-day he died he died more than two years ago she bent her head it was but a poor attempt at truth a miserable lying truth to deceive herself with but it seemed better than to lie the whole truth outright and say that her father beatrice's father had been dead but just a week the blood burned in her face brave natures good and bad alike hate falsehood not for its wickedness perhaps but for its cowardice she could do things as bad far worse she could lay her hand upon the forehead of a sleeping man and inspire in him a deep unchangeable belief in something utterly untrue but now as it was she was ashamed and hid her face it is strange he said how little men know of each other's lives or deaths they told me he was alive last year but it has hurt you to speak of it forgive me dear it was thoughtless of me he tried to lift her head but she held it obstinately down have i pained you beatrice he asked forgetting to call her by the other name that was so new to him no oh no she exclaimed without looking up what is it then nothing it is nothing no i will not look at you i am ashamed that at least was true ashamed dear heart of what he had seen her face in spite of herself lie or lose all said a voice within ashamed of being glad that that i am free she stammered struggling on the very verge of the precipice you may be glad of that and yet be very sorry he is dead the wanderer said stroking her hair it was true and seemed quite simple she wondered that she had not thought of that yet she felt that the man she loved in all his nobility and honesty was playing the tempter to her though he could not know it deeper and deeper she sank yet ever more conscious that she was sinking before him she felt no longer as loving woman to loving man she was beginning to feel as a guilty prisoner before his judge he thought to turn the subject to a lighter strain by chance he glanced at his own hand do you know this ring he asked holding it before her with a smile indeed i know it she answered trembling again you gave it to me love do you remember and i gave you a likeness of myself because you asked for it though i would rather have given you something better have you it still 
she was silent something was rising in her throat then she choked it down i had it in my hand last night she said in a breaking voice true once more what is it darling are you crying this is no day for tears i little thought that i should have yourself to-day she tried to say then the tears came tears of shame big hot slow they fell upon his hands she was weeping for joy he thought what else could any man think in such a case he drew her to him and pressed her cheek with his hand as her head nestled on his shoulder when you put this ring on my finger dear so long ago she sobbed aloud no darling no dear heart he said comforting her you must not cry that long ago is over now and gone for ever do you remember that day sweetheart in the broad spring sun upon the terrace among the lemon trees no dear your tears hurt me always even when they are shed in happiness no dear no rest there let me dry your dear eyes so and so again for ever if you will while you have tears i have kisses to dry them it was so then on that very day i can remember i can see it all and you you have not changed love in all those years more than a blossom changes in one hour of a summer's day you took this ring and put it on my finger do you remember what i said i know the very words i promised you it needed no promise either that it should never leave its place until you took it back and you how well i remember your face you said that you would take it from my hand some day when all was well when you should be free to give me another in its stead and to take one in return i have kept my word beloved keep yours i have brought you back the ring take it sweetheart it is heavy with the burden of lonely years take it and give me that other which i claim she did not speak for she was fighting down the choking sobs struggling to keep back the burning drops that scalded her cheeks striving to gather strength for the weight of a greater shame lie or lose all the voice said very slowly she raised her head she knew that his hand was close to hers held there that she might fulfil beatrice's promise was she not free could she not give him what he asked no matter how she tried to say it to herself and could not she felt his breath upon her hair he was waiting if she did not act soon or speak he would wonder what held her back wonder suspicion next and then she put out her hand to touch his fingers half blinded groping as though she could not see he made it easy for her he fancied she was trembling as she was weeping with the joy of it all she felt the ring though she dares not look at it she drew it a little and felt that it would come off easily she felt the fingers she loved so well straight strong and nervous and she touched them lovingly the ring was not tight it would pass easily over the joint that alone kept it in its place take it beloved he said it has waited long enough he was beginning to wonder at her hesitation as she knew he would after wonder would come suspicion and then very slowly it was just upon the joint of his finger now should she do it what would happen he would have broken his vow unwittingly how quickly and gladly beatrice would have taken it what would she say if they lived and met why should they not meet would the spell endure that shock who would beatrice be then the woman who had given him this ring or another whom he would no longer know but she must be quick he was waiting and beatrice would not have made him wait her hand was like stone numb motionless immovable as though some unseen being had taken it in an iron grasp and held it there in mid-air just touching his yes no yes she could not move a hand was clasped upon her wrist a hand smaller than his but strong as fate fixed in its grip as an iron vice unorna felt a cold breath that was not his upon her forehead and she felt as though her heavy hair were rising of itself upon her head she knew that horror for she had been overtaken by it once before she was not afraid but she knew what it was there was a shadow too and a dark woman tall queenly with deep flashing eyes was standing beside her she knew before she looked she looked and it was there her own face was whiter than that other woman's have you come already she asked of the shadow in a low despairing tone beatrice what has happened cried the wanderer to him she seemed to be speaking to the empty air and her white face startled him yes she said staring still in the same hopeless voice it is beatrice she has come for you beatrice beloved do not speak like that for god's sake what do you see there is nothing there beatrice is there i am unorna unorna beatrice have we not said it should be all the same sweetheart look at me rest here 
shut those dear eyes of yours it is gone now whatever it was you are tired dear you must rest her eyes closed and her head sank it was gone as he said and she knew what it had been a mere vision called up by her own over-tortured brain keyork arabian had a name for it frightened by your own nerves laughed the voice when if you had not been a coward you might have faced it down and lied again and all would have been well but you shall have another chance and lying is very easy even when the nerves are overwrought you will do better the next time the voice was like keyork arabian's unstrung almost forgetting all she wondered vaguely at the sound for it was a real sound and a real voice to her was her soul his indeed and was he drawing it on slowly surely to the end had he been behind her last night had he left an hour's liberty only to come back again and take at last what was his there is time yet you have not lost him for he thinks you mad the voice spoke once more and at the same moment the strong dear arms were again around her again her head was on that restful shoulder of his again her pale face was turned up to his and kisses were raining on her tired eyes while broken words of love and tenderness made music through the tempest again the vast temptation rose how could he ever know who was to undeceive him if he was not yet undeceived who should ever make him understand the truth so long as the spell lasted why not then take what was given her and when the end came if it came then tell all boldly even then he would not understand had he understood last night when she had confessed all that she had done before he had not believed one word of it except that she loved him could she make him believe it now when he was clasping her so fiercely to his breast half mad with love for her himself so easy too she had but to forget that passing vision to put her arms about his neck to give kiss for kiss and loving word for loving word not even that she had but to lie there passive silent if she could not speak and it would be still the same no power on earth could undo what she had done unless she willed it neither man nor woman could make his clasping hands let go of her and give her up be still and wait whispered the voice you have lost nothing yet but you norna would not she had spoken and acted her last lie it was over End of chapter twenty six